so. Good. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 12 p.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the June 11th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for a closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crohn? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Um, so I'll go ahead and see if there's any members of the public who would like to address the council. Seeing nobody in our chambers, I'll take that as a no. And um, we'll go ahead and now adjourn our meeting to our courtyard conference room where we'll go into our closed session. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our 12:35 uh, p.m. session of the June 11th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. At this time, I'd like to see if our clerk could please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Before we begin, I'd like to um, maybe turn it over to our city manager to explain um, a, a recent event that took place in Virginia Beach and a shooting that took place on May 31st at a city a municipality and some lives lost and um, show our uh, condolences to that community and um, we'll have a moment of silence, but I'll go ahead and see if our city manager, Martin Bernal, wants to add to that. Great, thank you. Just wanted to just share a few uh, words. Uh, just again, in reflecting upon the, the horrific, horrific events uh, that happened in Virginia Beach, Beach at their municipal offices, uh, again, awareness of gun violence has become really particularly acute with our employees. And I just wanted to point out that uh, it's really important that we do everything we can to ensure the safety of our employees, and we certainly committed to that. And because our employees, you know, from police officers to firefighters to our service workers, do put themselves on the line of danger every day to serve our community. And I just wanted to say that, you know, we are all ever so grateful for their service, uh, uh, given what's, what's happened. Okay, thank you. thank you for that. So if, if we could maybe just take a, a brief moment of silence to honor the victims in that community. Thank you very much. So at this time, we'll go ahead and have our clerk uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, okay. Pledge of Allegiance to the We'll go ahead and see if Councilmember Matthews had addition. One, Very briefly, I know we can't take official action, but uh, I wonder if you could send a letter on behalf of the council and city to that community. I'd be, ha yeah. I'd be yeah. happy to do that. Thank you. Good suggestion. Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll go here to have uh, our introduction of new employees at this time, and I'll invite up Tony Elliott, our Parks and Recreation Director, to introduce uh, his new employee. Good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce Sarah Stevens. Uh, Sarah is a new parks maintenance worker uh, within the Parks Division in the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, Sarah will be working or is working um, in the West Zone uh, in the Parks Division. She is originally from England. 
and came uh, to California by way of Minnesota. Uh, she studied, it's a very direct route, I think. Uh, she studied political science at UCSC. Um, she was a police officer in San Jose for 12 years. Uh, and she's currently studying horticulture at Cabrillo College. Um, Sarah is self-described as a family-oriented, uh, a very family-oriented person uh, that geeks out on hiking. So she's a hiker, backpacker, loves being outdoors. Um, and so yeah, you can find her uh, in the West Zone, um, places like Neary Lagoon, uh, very frequently. So please help me in welcoming Sarah to the team. Welcome, Sarah. We'll go ahead and now invite up our Public Works direct, uh, Director, Mark Dettel, to introduce his new employees. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, and it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Saunders. Brian's a building maintenance worker, too. Um, he works under the Facilities Department. He was born in San Francisco and currently lives in Santa Cruz in the beach area. Um, he's married to his wife have four years and he has five children from his wife's previous marriage. Um, he used to work up actually as a maintenance worker up in, at Mono Valley, and, which is a, a mobile home park up in Scotts Valley, as well as a FedEx worker and recognizes a lot of people in the area in, and on the campus from his FedEx days. Uh, graduated high school in San Mateo and also did some junior college work, Santa Rosa and Cabrillo. And when he's not working, he loves spending time with his family. Um, and I, kind of a fun fact, um, my mom actually works up at Mono Valley and she said, oh, you got a good one in Brian. So <laughs> please join me and welcome Brian. Oh, welcome Brian. And then last but certainly not least, we have Rosemary Menard introducing her new employee at the water department, <clears throat> or employees, forgive me. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Um, I'm really happy to introduce two new employees for the Water Department today. We have Jamie Stallings and we have Eddie Perez. Jamie has joined us as an administrative assistant too, and she's working in our um, program management and uh, sort of construction and, and uh, project development area and supporting the program team that's working on our CIP. She's originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and she moved to Santa Cruz in 2017. After that rainy winter, I'm sort of surprised she stayed, but nevertheless, um, she's got a lot of work experience, a really diverse work experience, uh, property and um, management, project management, real estate, and in an earlier life, she and her husband owned a commercial fishing crabbing uh, boat in uh, Maryland for blue crab. So she has a lot of uh, experience in the kind of environment that we have here. She's a mom of three kids and she's a car enthusiast. Someone told me, I think Renee uh, Coletta before she left, that Jamie was uh, rebuilding her car like over the weekend. So um, <laughs> if you need anything, you know, we'll know how to, who to talk to anyway. And she plays softball. She lives in Watsonville and she has uh, two boys and a girl. So please welcome Jamie Stalling. Um, and uh, our other new employee is Eddie Perez, Edward Perez. He's a new utility maintenance tech trainee. Um, and he was born in Colorado Springs and grew up in SoCal, Ben Lomond and Boulder Creek. He's graduated from um, Cal State uh, University in Monterey Bay with a degree in communications. So I guess maybe he knows how to fix those things that are you know, making us all crazy about. They don't really work and we need somebody to fix them. <laughs> um, his first job was at the boardwalk. He worked in, as a cook, a carpenter, and more recently as a barista in a Pete's in Capitola. He, um, he is uh, married um, and he and his wife Megan have two sons um, and he lives in Apt Aptos. He uh, enjoys learning about philosophy, especially ethics of care, and he's taken Buddhist layperson vow vows. So please welcome Eddie. <laughs> welcome uh, Eddie and, and Jamie. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move along to our presentation portion of today's agenda. Um, however, the first presentation on the agenda, which was Clarity Arts, um, reached out and they were unable to uh, have their presentation uh, today, so we'll go ahead and reschedule that one. So we'll invite up the 418 Project at this time to um, talk about the future of dance education and training. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Madam Mayor. 
Members of the City Council, hello. Uh, my name is Laura Bishop, and I want to thank you for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the 418 Project on Front Street, and I'm here to talk about the arts, our community, and the future of Santa Cruz, and to request that not just the 418 Project, but the many arts and cultural organizations that enliven downtown be granted a seat at the table in planning for our future. Now, I hope it's okay if I ask you a question. So if it feels good, I invite you to take a breath and consider softening, softening your gaze and ask yourself, why do you live in Santa Cruz? And maybe notice if that lands somewhere inside you. And then I have another question for you. And that question is, why do you really live in Santa Cruz? And I don't know about you, but there's one more question that interests me. And that question is, why do you really, really live in Santa Cruz? Now, on to our talk. So, as I speak to you today, the ability of the 418 Project, as well as the nearby yoga center, and potentially others, to remain in or near our current location is uncertain because of major development projects that are or will be before you. Projects which might redefine the very essence of Santa Cruz for decades to come and potentially displace our and other community institutions. For context, I would invite you to, develop, to view the development projects and the organizations they may impact through two diverse but compatible lenses. The first is arts as an engine for creative growth or what the 2008 Arts Master Plan calls the creative economy. In its vision statement, the Arts Master Plan puts the Santa Cruz whose economic health and vibrancy are built on our finest resources, our stunning natural environment, educated populace, innovative thinkers, esteemed academic institutions, small town character, and highly respected arts community. So, in keeping with the vision, the Arts Master Plan called on the city to, one, take a leadership role in fostering the arts as a community resource, and two, leverage the arts as a key component in its overall economic development strategies. In a moment, I'll share with you how the 418 Project can help achieve those goals. The other lens, as you know, Mayor Watkins, and the council I've already prioritized is instituting the internationally recognized health and all policies in a way that works for all of Santa Cruz. Utilizing the three pillars of equity, public health, and sustainability. These three pillars embody what we at the 418 Project and the Yoga Center and our downtown arts neighbors do every day. The challenge is that there are a lot of moving parts. And as you guys know, um, the goal is identifying areas of growth while applying health, sustainable, and sustainability and equity lenses to your decision making. At the 418 Project, we have 25 years experience creating and supporting an astonishingly rich and deep community environment. And I'm gonna share a couple of ways we do this in the service of the values of equity and public health and sustainability. But first, a little more about us. Last summer, we surveyed our users and we found the following. The 418 Project's user base is comprised from people from all over Santa Cruz, but mostly from the 950 and 95060 and 95062 zip codes. We are students, mid-career professionals, and elders ranging in age about evenly from 18 to 70 plus, and including kids. In fact, one of the unusual dynamics that happens in our space is how often intergenerational transactions happen. About a third of our programming is specifically designed to cultivate this, and a lot more times, it just happens. For example, last month, we made arrangements to share our space with four high school kids, three of which were Latinx and one white, doing their first ever rap concert. A black mom teaching a series of classes on an amazing movement technique called contact improv, especially designed to bring families together. 
and a longtime SoCal resident, a Norwegian-born rolfer who's planning two evenings of dance performance and political commentary in September. <coughs> Here are a couple of programs that have been in our space continuously for over 20 years. One, Dance Church, is our by donation gathering that people of all ages, backgrounds, and faiths enjoy every Sunday morning. Afro-Brazilian and Samba with live drumming. Grateful Dead dances. <laughs> Theatrical improv and contact improv. And aerial dance, the first aerial arts in Santa Cruz was done in our space. So sort of like a healthy garden, we mix the annuals, one-time pop-up events that create the color with perennials, which are sort of like their own ecosystems, if you will, and they keep our soil vigorous and they invite a wide variety of birds and butterflies. So now, what about the creative economy? So consider this. A large percentage of our users come at least once a week often twice a week, over three quarters say they would like to come as often or more in the future. And here's my favorite number. Keep in mind the 418 Project has one main studio. Still, over a thousand people a week come through our doors weekly. We estimate that over the course of a year, about 20,000 discrete individuals cross our thresholds. Think about it, it means on any day, a couple of hundred people who live in Santa Cruz might take part in our classes, workshops, concerts, and performances, and eat at our cafe. But aside from the meeting that they're deriving from our programming, these people are going shopping, dropping their kids off, having coffee, going to meetings, and basically taking advantage of downtown's many offerings. So, how do we do this? I'd like to talk specifically about how the 418 Project addresses the values of sustainability, equity, and public health. Sustainability. The 418 Project is comprised of a community of communities. They were originally drawn to us because of need. A need of space, a need of expression, a need of connection, a need of safety, a need of accessibility. As a nonprofit arts center, we have more creativity than cash. So we've had to be creative to meet our community's needs. We don't have much of what you might consider conventional power. So in order to keep our doors open, we use what we had. And we discovered that listening, fairness, and sharing the mic, so to speak, are effective tools for creating the vibrancy that sustained us for over a quarter of a century. Equity. As we've grown in organizational capacity, we've become really aware of the widening income divide. So we've been ramping up our by donation and sliding scale offerings. About half our programming is presently either by donation or sliding scale, and we intend to take this as close to 100% as we can in the coming three years. Public health. We believe that only part of public health is physical. We believe that health is also mental, emotional, and spiritual. So we create programming where as many people as want it can come get their physical health needs met and at the same time derive emotional, spiritual, and mental benefits with practices as simple as putting down your phone, taking off your shoes, and becoming present to yourself and those around you. Now, about our concerns of displacement. As things now stand, the 418 Project's home would be demolished to make room for a mix of market rate and affordable units, and about 13,000 square feet of commercial space between 418 and 508 Front Street, the Riverfront Project. This project is actually phase two of the Pacific Front Mixed Use Project, which we call the Taco Bell Project, that has already been approved by the city and has the same developer. Early on, let's say over a year ago, the developer said he makes space for the 418 project in phase two, basically allowing us to stay where we are. No rent was confirmed, the amount of space was speculative at best, and no firm commitments were made. However, as of today, the developer has said he commit to a special study session with the 418 project. This is an important first step for us a seat at the table. A seat at the table also means working directly with city staff. 
as we explore various planning options. We ask this today because it's important that the city not lose sight of the creative, wellness, and economic importance of the downtown's thriving arts and cultural institutions like the 418 Project. We're actually part of the solution because we deal on a daily basis with the complexities of equity, public health, and sustainability. We bring the experience of how things actually work and how they can be made to work for all Santa Cruz. So in closing, I'd like to read a statement from the master plan, the arts master plan. Home to a richly diverse and talented arts community, our city's artistic reputation is vital to its residents who view our town as more than a collection of roads and buildings, but also as a concentration of cultures and ideas. Santa Cruz is the undisputed cultural heart of the region. City arts, cultural groups, patrons and volunteers have dedicated many years and countless resources to developing Santa Cruz as a hub of high quality music, dance, theater, film, and literary arts. Now, Santa Cruz can put its creative assets to work in helping to build a new sustainable economy. I'd like to add that I believe the 418 Project is the heart of Santa Cruz. I'm a little biased. <laughs> and I believe that the Arts Master Plan is even more valid now than it was approved when it was approved by your predecessors in 2008. And especially since it's now linked to the arts objective in the draft 2030 general plan. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Laura, for that um, wonderful presentation. It's wonderful to hear about the program that you and the programs, all the offerings, and I personally appreciate the health and all policies overlay. And I know that I think we could all get into a lot of conversation with you. And so I'll just encourage our council to reach out to you directly if they have any additional questions, as well as our staff in regards to moving forward with our partnership. Thank you so much, Mayor Watkins. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have one more presentation today, and that's the Woody's on the Wharf uh, 25th anniversary. And I'd like to invite up uh, Don Iglesia, Iglesias, uh, the president of the Woody's, Woody's Club, uh, to give a brief presentation about Woody's on the Wharf, Wharf and the 25 years of positive impact and contribution to tourism in Santa Cruz, as well as the do donations that have been given from the Woody's Club to our local community organizations. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, city council members. I'll make this very brief. But uh, 25th anniversary of Woody's on the Wharf is coming up. It's been 25 years. You know, we were all teenagers, believe it or not, when we started this thing. I have some of the board of directors members here I want to mention briefly. Uh, Dave Wells, Roland Baker, Prom Wave, please, back there, you guys. Uh, Kathy Stefanke. All of us Santa Cruz residents for a lot, a lot of years and uh, related to the surfing culture for starters. Gonna give you a quick 30 second flavor for Woody's on the Wharf if this works. Does it work? We'll see, here we go. Works here. Uh-oh. Always technical difficulty. In the meantime, the major thing is we want to thank all of you, city council members, city of Santa Cruz, Park and Recreation Department for 25 years of a wonderful partnership. And let's see if it goes. You have one old surfer, but here's some more. Just a quick clip on Woody's on the Wharf. It's a surf city celebration, the 25th annual of Woody's on the Wharf with over 200 stylish surf wagons. Walk through surfing's history with Bob Pearson and Pearson Aero Surfboards. Talk to artist Jimbo Phillips and score your signed 25th anniversary Woody's on the Wharf poster. Saturday, June 22nd at the Santa Cruz Wharf. So that's, that's as quick as it could be. Uh, we're anticipating record crowds this year. We typically get around 20,000 people show up for that one event, hard to believe, on the wharf. Uh, the wharf merchants tell us it's the largest, highest earning day 
of the year for them. We have about 450 people come just with the Woodies. They typically spend about $1,000 for the weekend uh, each. So lot, lots of money generated through this event. 95% of the proceeds from the raffle we do go to uh, local nonprofits as well as state charities. And uh, over the 25 years, we've brought in around $100,000 have gone to charities. So we're proud of that. And uh, most importantly, we want to invite you June 21st, it's Friday night, 530, Museum of Art and History, on the roof, the Roof Sculpture Garden. If the weather's like this, you're gonna wanna be there. <laughs> Hors d'oeuvres, love to see you there. And uh, the museum will be celebrating 25th anniversary of Woody's on the Wharf. So there'll be displays and exhibits within the museum. There'll be cars on Cooper Street. There'll be a surf band on the back patio. So it should be a lot of fun for the community. And uh, we hope that you'll be able to attend. So we'd love to see you there. And we would love to see you at Woody's on the Wharf, although I know you've got something else going, I think, that day. And uh, we just want to thank you for the partnership. And as a token of uh, our appreciation, summer wherever you are. Mm. Uh, and again, thanks to Park and Rec, Rachel Kaufman and Summer Lang and all the other people that work at Park and Rec have just been incredible to work with, so supportive, so enthusiastic, really appreciate it. But we brought you some posters. Those are done by Jimbo Phillips, well-known local artist, started with skateboards, gone from there. Uh, he has a cult following. 25 years ago, his, his father, Jimmy Phillips, who also uh, around a lot of years in the, in the surfing scene as an artist, did our first poster. So we're going round circle on that. But we have a poster for each of you, and we hope you, we see you on the 21st, 22nd. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, John, and to the board. Yeah. Congratulations on the 25 years, 100,000 over to give back to the community is something extraordinary to be proud of and to the partnership between uh, your efforts and our city, our Parks and Rec Department, it's a wonderful thing. So I will look forward to seeing you that Friday. We will be doing some strategic planning that Saturday. Maybe we can sneak over for lunch or something, but uh, we're glad to know that so many of our community can enjoy it. So thank you again. Thanks for the presentation and for the awesome posters. Take care. Very cool. All right. Okay. So I believe that will conclude our uh, presentations at this time. So um, before we move along, I will go ahead and make a few announcements and then we'll get started on our regular agenda. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website at thecityofsantacruz.com. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. And if you would like to communicate with us about an agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This will provide us with an opportunity to review the email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are to my left on the ledge, and it's my job as the mayor to keep our meeting running without distraction disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our city council chambers. <coughs> At this time, I'd like to ask if any council members have any statements of disqualification today. <coughs> council McCrone. Thank you. I do, on uh, advice of the city attorney, I uh, will be recusing myself on uh, item number 26. Okay. Thank you. Any others? And uh, city clerk. Uh, Sufficient for giving it a reason? Based on a relationship with the appellant. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, any other statements of disqualification? Okay, seeing none, I would like to ask our county, I mean our city clerk administrator to announce if there's any additions or deletions. There are not, no. Okay.
I'll just briefly make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. and members of the community are always welcome to reach out to us individually or at, at any city council, at the, at the Grand or City Council email in regards to any items of concern that are not on today's agenda as well. I'll go ahead and now ask our city attorney to report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Um, two categories of closed session discussions this afternoon. The first, real property negotiations um, the council met with and gave direction to its real property negotiator, Bonnie Lipskin, <clears throat> concerning the property at 125 Coral Street. A uh, uh, potential acquisition of that property was the topic of discussion. Uh, the second item uh, involves three pending uh, cases before the United States Supreme Court interpreting Title VII of the Federal Civil Rights Act. Um, the cases are R, G, and G, R, Harris Funeral, Funeral Homes, Inc. versus uh, EEOC. The second is Altitude Express, Inc et al. versus Melissa Zarda as executor of the estate of Donald Zarda et al. Uh, the third is Gerald Lynn Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia. Um, those are cases on appeal from the second, uh, sixth, and appell and 11th circuit, uh, Circuit's Court of Appeal. Um, at issue are uh, the interpretation of Title VII's application to claims of discrimination based on uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, this afternoon, the council by motion unanimously authorized the city attorney's office to um, join in an amicus uh, brief being prepared by uh, several other cities in support of the plaintiffs in those cases. Uh, and um, that was the uh, reportable action. Okay, thank you. Before I check to see if we have a city manager report, we'll just go ahead and give a shout out to our Golden State Warriors being the home of their D League. We want to congratulate them on that uh, squeaky win they won last night and knowing that some of the players from our D League, I think, actually contributed to it. So um, I'll go ahead now and see if our city attorney. Our no, city report manager, today. no report today. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to consent agenda. Before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and ask our city clerk to um, orient us around a. Uh, addition we have here in uh, in regards to the minutes. I right, so uh, item four, I believe, the minutes from the May 28th meeting, there was a change from what was put in the packet. You have the red line in front of you. It's item one at the 7.30 session. There was just a couple of budget items added. Thank you. All right. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on then to our consent agenda items. Those are items four through 25 on today's agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion, motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. I did hear from a member of the community who would like to have uh, item number seven um, pulled, so we'll go ahead and pull that. Are there any other additional items that uh, council members would like to pull? poll at this time. Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. I'd like to pull item 15 for discussion. Mm. Oh, items 19 and 21. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, items 9, 12, 13, and 18. Okay. Councilmember Myers. And I just will make a comment on item t uh, I lost it. Just on item 12, I'll just make a brief comment. Okay. Okay. So that's already been pulled. Councilmember Cohn. Just a comment on um, number four, the minutes. Okay. Any other items to be pulled at this time? So I have items 7, 9, 12, 13, 15, 18, 19, and 21 pulled. And we'll go ahead and have uh, comments on item four since they have not been pulled at this time. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. The only thing I want to say is I, I to continue to find, I, I, I hope we can make our way forward on minutes because they're, they're really um, not as useful as they could be. Um, you know, this council member or that council member spoke uh, or this member of the public or that member of the public spoke is not really helpful. And um, 
Uh, for the record, I'd, I'd just like to say these, these minutes are not very useful. They do not even mention what members of the public and the co council members actually said. We really need to explore a different system of minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the community who wanted to address the council on items um, on between 4 and 25, not including item 7, 9, 12, 13, 15, 18, 19, and 21. Any member of the community who would like to speak on the, please come forward, you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, this is in uh, reference to item number six, the Public Banking Act. I oppose the Public Banking Act because it, is too, it has too much potential to become another leftist act of destruction of America. It concentrates more power wealth and increases through leverage of borrowing power of government to be misappropriated by political pressures. In our state, leftist political pressures, the worst kind. The advocates talk the usual leftism of their version of social justice, environmental protection, divest fossil fuel and pipeline investing, blah, blah, blah. Yes. They want total control, government control, and ownership of everything. It is the leftist version of socialism. They will tell citizen and probably illegal alien borrowers what they can borrow on, and it won't be evaluated by credit worthiness. It is the government owning a financial business in direct competition with private ownership of similar for-profit businesses. Profit generates new net wealth, something the public bank will not do if it bows to a leftist political agenda in loaning money to riskier debtors whose loans will go bad. Making loans more affordable does not improve the credit worthiness of borrowers much, something we found out in 2008. Profit, if any, does not really accrue to the public as owners of publicly traded private sector banks do, but to the government, which is a poor proxy. Socialism is a known historically defective economic system. Just ask Venezuela. This is one big step toward that. If elected officials were not corrupt and actually cared, criminal mega banks can be uh, reined in by breaking them up into smaller companies, reenacting Glass-Steagall regulations voided by Clinton and responsible for the financial crisis, and jailing bankers who break the law instead of the government taking their mafia-style cut with wrist-stop fines such as Obama did. Instead of this, you should pass a resolution to that effect and send to Mark Stone instead. This is another in a litany of leftist ideas. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other members of the community who would like to address our council on any of our consent agenda items um, without uh, considering the ones that have been pulled? Okay. Yeah, I'm Brett Garrett. I wanna thank you very much for including item six, um, supporting the Public Banking Act, AB 857. Um, I believe there were a couple of typos. I think those are being addressed. Um, Changes okay. have been received. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, I just wanna emphasize that it's, we call it an enabling bill. It doesn't force any city to create a public bank. It doesn't create public banks. It just creates a licensing process where cities, counties, regions um, can form their own public bank. Um, it gives an option that enables cities to to have a different option other than the major commercial banks. And um, yeah, we do, I, cities need options. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I'll just keep it very short. I really appreciate you having this on the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other public comment at this time, we'll go ahead and return back to council for action. Um, Councilmember Matthews. I'll move approval of consent with the exception of the items pulled. Okay. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So item number seven was asked by a member of the community to be pulled and spoke to. Before we invite up community members to speak to the item, I'll allow those who brought the item forward on our council provide any context if they'd like to at this time. I think I'd like to hear from the public first. Thanks. Nope. So we'll go ahead and ask up, uh, okay, Mr. Escalante to come forward. And um, I think, if, I don't remember if you requested extra time. Apologize for that. No. So you have up to two minutes. Thank you. I'll try and get through the one page that I have. Thank you for the time. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Honorable Council. Uh, Rudy Escalante, I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Janice of Santa Cruz. 
resolution before you today is extremely concerning because of the factual inaccuracies and the potential for contract interference. Our process is bound by the National Labor Relations Board with oversight by a federal mediator. This ensures that good faith bargaining exists through the entire process and no self-dealing occurs. Any other involvement would be disruptive to this process. What I will be asking for you today is to amend your proposed resolution to the following. Number one, correct the inaccuracies accuracies that exist in the current version, to amend the resolution to include $250,000 of unrestricted general fund monies on an annual basis to Janice of Santa Cruz, to support wage increases to the entire agency, to purchase a portable restroom at the sobering center so that the clients and staff no longer have to share one, and so the city of Santa Cruz pays its fair share for the services it receives at the sobering center. And three, to advocate to our state representatives for higher reimbursement rates for drug medical client services. Our contract with the county sheriff to operate the sobering center is $634,000 annually. In 2018, the Santa Cruz Police Department accounted for 35% of all the services we provide at the sobering center. That percentage equates to approximately $222,000. Currently, the city of Santa Cruz contributes $0 directly to the services provided at the sobering center. Over the last four years, Janus provided performance increases ranging from three to 4%. During that same time period, over $90,000 in benefit increases were covered by the employer and not passed on to the agency employees. The employee plan pays for $50 a month for their contribution to their medical benefits, while here at the city of Santa Cruz, service employees have $107 a monthly contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any members of the community who would like to address the council on this item? Okay, please come to my left and you'll have up to two minutes. This is item number seven on our uh, consent agenda. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Matthew Van Eyes. I'm an IOS counselor at Janus of Santa Cruz. Uh, I worked there because I myself was out in the community uh, in active addiction for a long time. I've got coming up on eight years clean and sober, and uh, it's my way of giving back. Um, uh, we're on the front line of the opioid epidemic, um, but outcomes are tied to therapeutic alliance. I have clients personally who come back into my IOS group because of me, not because of Janus, but because they know me me and they trust me. It's hard to have that therapeutic alliance when you have 40% plus turnover rate with the employees. Um, it's hard to give quality care when you're broke and stressed out. I have an eight month old baby boy who is the light of my life, the first child in my universe. I've never had a kid before. And right now he is in a sweltering hot RV because we're homeless, okay? He is, we don't have money to get a place. I'm homeless with my gal and my eight month old boy who right now is in an RV cooking his little butt off. and that breaks my heart. Um, you know, it breaks my heart that I can't give the quality care to uh, my clients that I should be able to give because I'm distracted by these issues because I don't make enough money. Now, I understand that Janice is a nonprofit and I understand that they have funding issues. That's why we track down $500,000 in federal funding through Leopold's office, which is available to them. And as far as we know, they have applied for it. Um, you know, a 2% raise, uh, you know, it's that doesn't even cover the cost of inflation for bread, basically, uh, around here. Um, I think Rudy's a good man, personally. I like him, personally, and uh, I want to invite him to return to the uh, the bargaining table in good faith. The other thing I want to say about health care uh, is that I have a, we have a $7,500 deductible. I had to have a simple sonogram and some blood work last year. I just got done paying off the $1,200 that it cost me just to do that. God forbid I found any kind of actual health consequences and how that would impact my family. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any members of the community who would like to address us on item number seven of our consent agenda? Is there any other additional members of the community who'd like to address us? on this item? Okay, I think you'll be our last one. You have up to two minutes. Okay, yeah, hello. My name's Anthony Hong. I'm a, a psychotherapist at Janus. Um, yeah, there's been made mention of raises. Um, they've ranged from zero to 4%. And like Matt mentioned, our deductible is $7,500, which was increased by $500 this year. Uh, I personally pay over 60% of my salary to rent. Um, it has not felt like there's been good faith bargaining um, on management's part. And yeah, the, uh, the ability to focus at work and be, uh, 
balanced and centered and not stressed is challenging. Um, I've had to move away to commute and my rent is still high. Um, and also, I mean, just the uh, clinical cohesion at Janus has been concerning. Um, there's no mandatory supervision for people with face-to-face -face clinical contact. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of incidents that happen because of understaffing and undertraining. Uh, the trainings that we do get are largely didactic, which means like lecture-based. There's not really any practice. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of concerns besides the financial. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more speaker. Is there any other speakers who would like to address us on this item? This is item number seven of our consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll go ahead and have you be as our last speaker, so you'll have up to two minutes. Um, I, I uh, support uh, Janice and the, the workers, and I really want you to, um, you've probably thought about this a lot, but that idea of turnover of staff and how that relates to outcomes of clients and how clients do, uh, that kind of thing for the, all of the nonprofits because the nonprofits are an exemption from the living wage, but that is part of a lot of the issues that Santa Cruz is having for the homeless. The, m people say there should be more mental health, there should be more substance use programs, but if everybody is turning over, then the outcomes are gonna be lower because they're not getting that experience. So, thanks. So, go to Project Connect next Wednesday if you wanna volunteer, it's an all day thing, or you can just come visit, thanks. Okay. Okay, seeing no other members of the community wanting to address us on this item, we'll go ahead and return back to council at this time. Oh, we have one more? Yes. Okay, so I, if I could just before you get started, is there any other member of the community who wants to address us on the item? Item number seven. Okay, so we have, okay, so you'll be, is there anybody else? <laughs> just checking. Okay, so you'll be the last in, um, in the jean jacket there. You'll have up to two minutes. Sure, I don't think I'll need two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Edgar Fuerte. I've been working for the Janice Sobering Center on Water Street, 265 Water Street, for over four years since the day it opened. Uh, yeah, it would be really great if, you know, we can get the city of Santa Cruz behind us and supporting us on raising some funds. Uh, I've been there this entire time. I haven't had any decent increase on salary. I haven't left. That's not the same story for many people and over the time I've been working there. Many people quit, many people are, um, I don't know, whatever reasons they quit or they are fired and the high turnover rate is increasing all the time. Uh, nobody can stay there, nobody stays at our workplace because of finding better jobs, uh, more, more salary, better raises. I'm only there because I have another job that helps me out. So I work as security at the Catalyst, which helps me out a lot. If I only had this this job, I don't know how, I'd, I'd probably be in an RV just like Matt. Uh, I'd probably be asking him if I can move in. Uh, the pay that they give us for dealing with arrestees slash patients at the serving center is not anything close to the detention officers across the parking lot, the sheriffs. Uh, that's fine, right? But. We deal with pretty much people that are not voluntarily really wanting to go into treatment, which is fine. I knew what I signed up for. That doesn't really worry me too much, but a little bit more pay would help out for having a better staff. Uh, today's my day off. I was asked this morning while I was still sleeping, hey, can you come into work? I know it's your day off, but we don't have anyone. I said I couldn't. I have another commitment on Tuesdays that uh, I need to take care of. He said, all right, that's okay. Uh, that's been for the past four years. We've never had a proper staffing at the Sobering Center. Uh, we're always either trying to come in and work extra hours or having to say we don't have medical staff to the officers that show up. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Maisie. I work at the <clears throat> Residential Treatment Center <clears throat> as a Treatment tech, and I just wanted to reiterate the uh, understaffing and the um, the o overturn. Is that the word? Turnover. Yeah, turnover. Um, yeah. In November, December, there were at least eight people just from my department alone that quit, many of which um, decided to move on to jobs that paid better. Uh, they went over the hill, and we were very understaffed in our department. Um, and I just think that we could provide a lot better client care if we had a consistent staff. Uh, we have a lot of clients that come through that have been there multiple times and they say, oh, it's so nice to see this 
person because they've been here. And I know a lot of the people I work with, um, a lot of the treatment techs or the med techs, the, besides uh, one of the coworkers who's been there for around eight or nine years, the next person that's been there the longest has been there for a year and a half. And so we're just having a lot of problems with consistency and I feel like if wages were increased, then we could get people to keep staying, especially because I know people quit because of the pay. And that's all I have, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return it back at this time then to um, the council. I'll go ahead and see if any, if the council members who brought this item forward want to sort of pr provide context for it and then maybe see if there's any questions or action and deliberation. Councilmember Brown. Um, well, thank you to those of you who uh, came out to speak to us about this item as one of the council members who uh, brought this to our agenda. I just wanted to make a comment. I mean, I think that the, the text of the resolution kind of speaks to um, the reasons why we um, opted to bring this before the entire council. Um, as we know, um, the opioid epidemic and uh, challenges with uh, access to treatment um, and treatment funding for treatment facilities are a major problem in our community, major challenge to addressing one of our most pressing needs. And I believe that uh, the workers of Janus provide one of these critical services that um, we absolutely need and we, and we need qualified and committed workers. We know, having talked with many of these workers, I know they are committed and um, that you know, the organization and the community relies on the fact that they will do this work for limited pay because they really care about um, their clients and they care about this community. So I believe that, um, you know, having, having explored and in talked with many of the workers, having um, educated myself about what was going on and, and um, really putting time into um, the contents of this resolution, I'm um, not convinced that there are um, there's anything that isn't factual here. I, I believe that it's a matter of perspective. I would welcome um, Mr. Escalante to come up and tell us what the factual inaccuracies are, um, and we can talk about that, um, but otherwise I'm prepared to, to move ahead with um, support. Okay, Councilmember Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings. And yeah, then I guess my comment is, yeah, I, I think that Janice and the city need to have a very strong partnership because um, we, we need to not only have success um, with the services they provide and um, the people who work at Janice, but more, more directly, we need to continue to and broaden that success um, because we do have a, a growing um, need in our community. And um, I, I'm glad that you've invited um, Mr. Escalante back up. I, I, I'm very interested in making sure that we do this collaboratively and um, I don't wanna be on, on the other side of Janice. So I'm hoping that we can get some clarification and, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be hopefully uh, hearing that we can potentially work through this even if it means uh, a little more time on this action. Um, Councilmember Glover, maybe before we do, I'll just sort of remind and reorient us. This is one of many items that have been pulled on our consent agenda, which is anticipated to be acted on in one uh, motion. And so um, for the interest of time for further clarification, if it would uh, make sense to those that brought the item forward to maybe move to table it until the next meeting um, after a conversation with Mr. Escalante could take place for clarification and um, congruence of language um, and then and then clarified at that time as opposed to having this uh, conversation within the consent agenda item section. And I'll go ahead and sort of put that out there to maybe think about it and then I'll go ahead and see if Councilmember Glover wants to speak and then we can go forward. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd uh, be interested, I think the, the public as well as maybe the Janus workers as well would be very interested to hear uh, Mr. Escalante's claims as to what is inaccurate in the resolution. And then once we have that uh, out and about, I'm ready to move the move the item, so. Okay, Vice Mayor coming. I'm sorry, Council Member Brown or? Okay. Council Brown? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with uh, Mr. Escalante and Janice management about the situation. Um, and if that is 
acceptable. I mean, I, but I also am want to be clear that I am very much in support of the workers, and I believe that um, they they deserve our support. So um, I'm happy to have that conversation and bring this back at uh, the June 25th meeting if Mr. Escalante is amenable and available to meeting. Would that be appropriate, Mr. Mr. Escalante? Yes, I am amenable to that. Uh, I've never been contacted by anybody to get our side of what's going on, and so I'm glad to hear that you've had conversations with the staff, um, but I would like to have some conversation too. It'd be nice to at least to be engaged in that. I think a collaborative process should include us, so having that moving forward, I'd like for that to happen. Okay, so it sounds like there's a agreement that it would be great to have that conversation take place before the council takes um, uh, any type of formal action, but overall I'd say are hopeful that there will be some sort of resolution in support of your organization. Um, council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Myers. I just want to say that um, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this forward as well uh, is the fact that I've also heard a lot from the Janus workers and knowing how unaffordable Santa Cruz is and how difficult it is uh, to live here, that you know having a living wage is important. In addition to that, I understand how important these services are to the community. Um, a lot of what I just wanna, I can echo what Sandy said so I don't um, go into too much detail, but just the idea that we really need to be on top of um, the opioid crisis and providing treatment and, and services to um, the members of our community um, additionally, uh, one of the things that I was really wanting to see happen and encouraging through this resolution is, um, you know, having both management and workers work together to try to come up with a fair contract in a way that um, can support the workers and that management can be comfortable with. So really trying to bring folks together to, to have a meaningful conversation. And if the city can now be a part of, you know, um, working through these relations, I think that it's a great start because we really very much value Janice in our community and we want to do as much as we can to help make sure that Janice is successful and that the workers are supported. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Glover. So I'm prepared, if my colleagues are, are amenable, I'd like to make a motion to go ahead and, um, and move this to the to our end of the, our, what is it, June 28th, our next meeting? June 25th. So basically, um, and encourage uh, uh, communication between uh, individuals here at the city, including city council members with the leadership of Janice. Uh, and so uh, that's my motion to extend that. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion by Council Member Myers and a seconded by Council Member Matthews. Mr. Escalante. Before the vote, I check in my calendar. I am taking my son to a college university for a tour uh, on that day. Uh, so I'm going to be out of state. Okay. On, on that, on, on, that on the 25th, day. we fly to Washington State for a college tour. But you'll be likely available to have a conversation Absolutely. with the council members before Absolutely. then. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Well, and congratulations yeah. to your son then. Okay. Any further discussion, Councilmember Glover? Yeah, I'm still unclear on what the controversial part of this is. Uh, the <coughs> resolution itself states statistics and data, and then it just, in the end, resolves that Santa Cruz City calls on Janice to bargain in good faith with its workers. So I really am still unclear, because it has yet to be submitted to us what the inaccuracies are, and I understand, Mayor, your interest in wanting to move quickly through the consent agenda, but uh, I don't, I mean, uh, I just still don't understand what the conflict is. So maybe if it could be explained and then we could make a comprehensive under, uh, vote as to why we should uh, delay it until the next meeting, I, I would really appreciate that. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, one of the um, issues is simply the long list of items that we have to deal with, um, but the other I think is uh, all, each of us getting a fuller picture of what the issues are on both sides. And I second um, Councilmember Meyer's desire that we come up with something that um, does reflect, and and I think also Cummings' uh, suggestion that we come up with a, um, to the extent possible, a collaborative uh, uh, approach to this issue, because certainly um, the workers' issues are significant, as are the need for services. So with that, I am gonna move that we call the question on this. So we have a motion to call the question, and... Asking for the information. Just we'll need a second for that to call the question, or does that go immediately go to it vote? Just, it, it, it just happens. I call the question. Yeah. Okay. You need a vote to call the question. A vote to call the question. You need a second. Second to call the question. Yeah. Second to so Councilmember. Second. Member. Okay, seconded by Councilmember uh, Myers. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. 
Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Myers, Brown, uh, Matthews, Vice Mayor, Mayor, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting in support of calling the question. All those in favor of the motion before us then at this time, be without further discussion is my understanding. That's right. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, and that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, and myself uh, moving to uh, have the item come back before us after some of the uh, questions of clarification came up. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move right along, uh, Mr. Banal and then Mr. Glover. Just one quick comment. The, the meeting should happen well before the 25th, just so that uh, you have enough time to prepare an item for the 25th. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll encourage uh, the council members to reach out to uh, Mr. Escalante uh, as sooner than rather than later. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close item number seven, Councilmember Glover. I just have a question of process. I asked multiple times for information from Mr. Escalante and it was never provided and then we made a vote without understanding the context of the controversy or the misinformation. So I'm confused as to why that request went unresponded to multiple times and then we just moved into a vote. I'm, I'm happy to provide what I interpret the kind of the the flow of that if going. there's a motion to call the question then all discussion is supposed to cease at that point it was just i made that request before the call to question though multiple times so i'm just wondering no i understand yeah. yeah however when a motion to call the question is it, it is intended to interrupt the discussion right um, so your question was left dangling that's but but it happened that the motion to call the question was made while that while the question uh, while your questions had still yet to be answered so just for clarity, if I pose a question and it's not acted on by the chair and it just sits there, then someone can call the question and that question just totally goes out the window. That's correct. Well, it doesn't seem very fair. And essentially what the um, sort of the approach was to have this just to be held uh, sort of offline at this point to get further clarification on the details given the constraints of the amount of items that we have on consent. And so that was sort of the majority of the council's decision at this point. Out of the eyes of the public. I just have a okay. For clarity. Sure, well, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead and. Are we going to have a chance also to respond to I, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, those that brought the item forward would be happy to hear your, your input as well. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move right along then uh, to our next agenda item that was pulled, which is item number nine, and I believe that was pulled by, I don't remember, Glover. Mm. Councilmember Glover. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see here, item nine. Yeah, which is a couple questions with regards to the consultant uh, work, work plan workflow. So the questions were, uh, it doesn't specify who the consultant is, so have those bids been put out yet? Uh, also, it mentions that there will be a 17-person task force or advisory committee formed. How is that process going to take place? And then how will the community meetings be posted and promoted? It only says that they will be posted and promoted in English and Spanish, but unfortunately, from past experiences from community members, that has been less than ample in getting the information out. So those are the questions. So we have uh, Tiffany Wise West, Dr. West here to help answer any of these questions. Yes, Welcome. thank you. Thank you for the question. Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. For these projects, um, the LCP update project was specifically written with Central Coast uh, Wetlands Group, and so that project was uh, sole source to them, and they are already under contract. For the Westcliff Drive project, we put out a request for proposals at the beginning of the year. We received three proposals, um, evaluated them, and Revel Coastal, who is a local geomorphologist, is leading a team of local consultants and we did award that bid and brought it to council in probably March of this year. So that answers, I believe, your first question. Yes, thank you. Uh, number two, you asked about the technical advisory committee. That technical advisory committee was formed in April. Um, it has representatives from very diverse uh, sectors of our community. And that how we selected them actually ties into um, your third question on promotion. So you may or may not be aware that the city city staff were trained recently in um, a new way to conduct proactive uh, outreach with the community. And as such, we developed as our first step, what is the possible universe of stakeholders, or as we call it in this, in this kind of model, uh, potentially infect, affected interests that could be potentially interested and affected in these projects. We came up with a list of 76 different stakeholder groups 
groups that, um, again, range environmental, uh, underrepresented groups, business groups, and so on and so on. Um, from there, we picked represented, in, we invited 20 folks, 17 committed, so we do have a wide range, and I'm happy to provide that to you again if you'd like it. I think it uh, might have came on a previous agenda, but um, you can see who's involved in that, including underrepresented groups. So that also brings us into how are we con conducting the outreach. So going through this um, model of developing, systematically developing informed consent, we go through a very systematic process of identifying how, how are we able to um, best ensure that all voices are represented, that we are conveying that we are the legitimate uh, authority to do these projects, and that we are ensuring trust and transparency. Through that systematic process, we identified several different outreach modalities um, that again, as you stated, will be both in Spanish and English, with some events being exclusively in Spanish. Those range from focus groups, which were starting in July, nine focus groups, six of which are with, um, say, business members will all be together, underrepresented communities will be all together, and then we'll have three heterogeneous focus groups where everyone from those first sets of focus groups will be mixed so that they can share knowledge. We wanted to have kind of the homogeneous ones to ensure that folks feel, felt um, that they were in their own community of practice in order to speak up and, and share their input. So the focus groups start in July. We will then have an open house in late August, early September, as well as an open house in the Beach Flats area that is will all be entirely in Spanish. Um, and then we have a number of other modalities throughout the end of 2020, including a charrette, which will be looking at community, uh, at solutions and alternatives, another set of focus groups, another open house, and then a number of other kind of more creative outreach uh, techniques. For example, the virtual reality mobile phone app that will be promoted at the library that you just approved funding to pursue for a grant for. Um, we intend to have uh, walking tours, biking tours, and a number of other things. We have game playing nights at pubs and so forth. So it is a very comprehensive outreach uh, campaign that we've developed, um, and I hope that answers your question. Questions. Thank you. Yeah, that was, um, I, I was aware of some of the different outreach that we're doing, but there were community members that were curious about it, so I wanted to make sure that they had that information as well and heard it straight from the source, which is wonderful. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to make the motion to approve and support a phased approach to completing local coastal program parks and recreation policy 1.76 and address sea level rise in the local coastal program update through the resilient coast Santa Cruz initiative. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Before we go ahead and take the vote on that, we'll go ahead and open it up to the community. This is item number nine on our consent agenda to ensure that you have an opportunity to address the council if you wish. Okay, so seeing uh, no community members uh, here interested in addressing us on this item, we'll go ahead and return to council for um, action without further conversation. We'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. The next um, consent agenda item was item number 12, and I, Councilmember Glover? Okay. Thank you. This um, was a question that I came up uh, came upon, and then also uh, another, some other community members were also interested in knowing, um, just with regards to some of the language that's incorporated in the item, specifically um, the use of some of the monies with the Riverwalk and focusing on the communities that it serves and which area of the Riverwalk in question uh, that this will be applied to, and then also the uh, community vetting and idea generation of targeted communities. So if someone could just talk a little bit in more detail about that. Okay. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, really just wanna tee this up for Dave McCormick and ED and really provide some context. Um, this is within the Proposition 68 uh, grant, statewide parks and community revitalization grant. Within the city, we've got a variety of different expertise and experiences. Uh, so in particular, between Parks and Recreation, Public Works, and ED, we've kind of assembled a team uh, to work on Prop 68. So with that, I wanna introduce uh, David, who can kind of speak to these questions most specifically, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. David McCormick with Economic Development. Uh, and I apologize, my voice is a little raspy today, so if I have to repeat anything or uh, tee it off to Claire, let me know. Um, so again, your, your questions regarding? Thank you, yeah, the question was, um, it mentions that uh, that the grant uh, or the monies are specifically usually designed for uh, serving or supporting critically underserved communities. So the question is, is it for the entire Riverwalk? Is it for a portion? And if so, which portion of it and how does that get um, termed as an underserved portion that's of the Riverwalk? Uh, yeah, and that's correct. The, uh, the Riverwalk has needs throughout its, its uh, length um, and the, the structure of the grant is such that you have to identify the target population as your outreach point. Right. Um, and you kind of go for the most competitive uh, demographic you can find along the, the, within the boundaries or that overlaps the boundaries of your park project, right? Uh, so as mentioned in the memo, the, the Riverwalk is most competitive in an area that covers parts of downtown, the beach flats, uh, lower ocean. Um, and so that's where the bulk of our outreach is targeted. Mm -hmm. uh, but there may be improvements all along uh, the Riverwalk, and that's sort of our goal to give it an overall refresh if the budget can stretch. Um, but there will be definitely uh, recreational improvements um, and touch-ups and things that will be targeted at serving those disadvantaged communities, and that will be reflective of the out or the the input we receive from them. And so we're really trying to get you know their breadth of ideas to make it speak to them. Okay, great. Because um, I noticed down <clears throat> towards the Riverwalk end by the Boardwalk, as it curves to get to the trestle, there's very little yeah. down there with regards to amenities and recreation. But if you get up closer to say uh, River Street or the Gateway Shopping Center or those other places uh, that tend to be a little bit more affluent potentially, they have amenities like exercise equipment and all this other kind of stuff. So I'm I'm just a little hesitant uh, because you say that you're going to try and sprinkle it if it works throughout the entire Riverwalk when the monies are specifically focused on underserved communities. So a little bit un uncomfortable with that uh, reality. Uh, the other question was uh, how, what, like what kind of community vetting and idea generation, what does that look like? Yeah, so the uh, the grant asks uh, basically for maximum scoring, you have to have a minimum of five outreach events. Uh, and you have to have th at least three different uh, methods of outreach. So not your typical mail a poster and hope people show up, but getting out to where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, the first two we've done already. Uh, so we had an outreach up at the uh, Ebb and Flow Festival at the Tannery last week, um, on Friday, uh, together with the Coastal Watershed Council and the Arts Council. They helped kind of get the feedback from artists, because there's going to be a lot of art that'll probably work into the, the design. Um, and it's also an affordable uh, housing development, so we're getting those sort of disadvantaged communities there. Uh, but it was just a great opportunity to get a lot of people talking about the river at a really <laughs> central place. Mm -hmm. uh, and then yesterday we met with a group from Nueva Vista, a, a part of their summer fun program, a bunch of kids from <laughs> six to 10 years old, and we had sort of a, a charrette with them where we got together, they sketched out ideas, they you know dumped what they liked, what they didn't like about the river walk, how we can make it better for them. Um, and so we'll be taking all that feedback, meshing it together, looking at the feasible sites, you know, what, where we have some real estate to work on, where things just need a refresh. And, and yes, our goal is really to, to get into that highest need neighborhood mm -hmm. and, and get what we can deliver there. Um, but, you know, there'll be projects throughout. And those plans are slated once they get all the ideas are generated and the things are yeah, mixed I mean, together, have, then it'll come back for approval. Exactly, we have a tight window. You know, the application is August 5th. Uh, so we have up until about maybe the 15th of July to get the outreach done. And then we have to condense and see what could be delivered within a two years time span and, and put that scope of work forward. So, but that's, that's the, uh, the concept level there will be additional potential outreach at the design level uh -huh. if we're awarded the grant. And so just to clarify, mm -hmm. the it's due on the 4th of August, we, 5th of August, we are on break throughout July, so how are we going to see or approve any conceptual plans before it gets submitted? Um, that's sort of the, the delegation of authority to the city manager um, to, to apply for that grant. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Council Member Myers. Um, I just mostly want to compliment the staff team that's been put together. Um, it's been many, many years when we've had very rare park funds come and go out of our reach here in the city of Santa Cruz for the river. And so I'm really pleased to see the initiative. I appreciate um, our new parks director really 
really being an advocate for the river and the river as a park and a space for all neighborhoods in Santa Cruz and uh, as well as its value as a transportation corridor now with our completed bridges. Um, we've seen a lot of park, and park bonds come and go over the last 20 years and I really feel like we're teed up right now to really um, bring the river walk uh, up to a, a better standard to provide more neighborhoods with more access. So I'm excited um, and just wanna thank the team that's put together. These are not easy grants I know to put together. They're uh, extensive and take a lot of time and thought. Uh, a couple of things on all the, the documents that we have, our adopted urban river plan. Um, there was a very great intent to um, try to balance the need of nature with the na need of recreation and use of the river as an urban river. So I really hope you will <laughs> dust that off and look at those things, um, specifically ways that people can enjoy the river. Um, I know we put bird blinds in there. We did some th creative thinking around how to make the river a quiet space for people as well as a place for people to ride their bikes. So please take a look at those objectives because um, we had a, a long, uh, year-long process of our community that helped develop those objectives. So please dust that off and take a look. And um, I just wanted to basically say thanks and uh, I'm glad to see the initiative moving ahead. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, is there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? This is item number 12 on our consent agenda. Uh, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. And if you, okay. For those that are interested, you're welcome to line up to my left and you're welcome to start with, you'll have up to two minutes. This is to address part one. I know there are lots of people who want to address part two. So this you can go ahead and, if you want, one. you can go ahead and pause the time. So this is for item number 12 on our consent agenda. Um. Uh, item number 12 on our consent agenda, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your reference, but this is uh, in regards to the uh, statewide park development and community revitalization program grant application for improvements. That's not until later. Oh, oh, oh. If, if, if no, you're in the grants, or for, there's two grants. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying, grant. Two, two places that the grants would I see, yes. So this is in regards to the two places that the grants will be used, yes. So that does have a reference to the rail trail. Did you want to address us on this item? About the first part, yeah. Okay. You can go ahead and restart the time, and if you could, please uh, speak into the microphone. Oh, over here. You're welcome um, to adjust it. My name's Barbara Riverwoman, and um, I was going to raise the issue around the critically underserved communities, and I'm still, con I'm still a little uncomfortable with the vagueness of where the underserved community is along this river walk. I, mean, I would be happier if it were presented to you as a specific area that's underserved, either in terms of the income level or the park um, ratio to the, to the acreage. So that makes me uncomfortable that we're not getting something more specific. And I don't understand what happens now and what happens after they get the money. Um, um, and then also I read the um, requirements of the grant and it said that they must address challenges facing the targeted underserved communities and I haven't seen anything mentioned um, so far by either of the speakers from the staff that talks about what are the ch so-called challenges that are being addressed by this grant proposal. So I would like that to be clarified. Um, also, um, this is being proposed by three departments. One is Parks and Rec, one is Public Works, and one is ED, and I noticed that the person who was chosen to speak is the person not from Parks and Rec, but from Economic Development. Um, and at first I was wondering why would Economic Development be uh, part of this proposal project, and then I thought, oh, it's about the art. So I would like a question answered is what percentage of this grant proposal will go to art and what to economic, ec environmental, sustainability and what to actual recreational equipment or things. So um, I always feel like the environmental sustainability gets shortchanged in these projects. So I would like a really clear answer to that. Um, and then why are, yeah, why are these kinds of details not included in the packet presented to the council in the first place? I feel like the council isn't getting the information in the packets that it would make it really possible for them to come up with an informed decision. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. 
Mayor Watkins, Council, Gillian Greenside. I have no questions um, of the first section of this, the River Walk, but to echo Council Member Meyer's comments and thanks. The second part of it, though, I don't feel has um, had much scrutiny. And uh, when I read the details in your agenda packet, it's quite specific of what sorts of things are going to be put in this area of segment seven phase two of the rail trail. Then when I looked at the stakeholder groups that had already met, I didn't see anything that involved any way the neighbours who would be impacted by anything that gets put in here, the lower west side neighbours. And it seems that the grant is being applied for before that groundwork of sharing with neighbours, this is what we're thinking, what do you think, well, let's change it and apply for a grant. And what I'm concerned about is going to all the trouble, applying for a grant, good luck that the grant is awarded, and then it's already fixed what staff has in mind, which will then be, the neighbours will be told is going to happen. And that's what happened on Westcliff Drive. And so then the neighbours, when they saw the exercise equipment going in on Westcliff Drive, then they opposed it. So to avoid unnecessary um, uh, conflict like that, it would seem to me that some outreach should have been done and possibly could still be done, although the grant timeline is small, to the neighbours, the neighbourhoods that will be affected, and I'm only talking about the rail travel segment seven phase Two. And if we're thinking of Barunka Park, etc., it would be nice if that came to the Parks Commission before any decision was made, because we haven't heard about that segment. Um, we did hear an FYI on the first part of it, but not on the second part of it. So I'll just leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next speaker. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council Member. My name is Greg Pepping, the Executive Director of the Coastal Watershed Council. And in short, I just want to support the resolution from staff that you um, approve the, re uh, the recommendation from staff, that you approve the recommendation and advise staff to work on this grant. Um, the, you have a SLURP, which is a funny acronym, S-L-U-R-P, which your staff report um, pointed out to you. It's a 2003 document, the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan, and you have a 2007 document activating the riverway. It's, and then in 2014, City Council renamed the riverway the Santa Cruz Riverwalk. So you have those two plans that are guiding documents for what the community wants to see at the San Lorenzo River. And uh, too often these grant opportunities come and go. Um, often staff are very busy and don't have the bandwidth to pursue them. Often there's a matching grant requirement where you've got to put local money in to get that. There is no matching requirement on this. And it's an $8.5 million max, so, and you're pursuing two of them, as the staff report said. So $17 million. Um, we've, the Coast Watershed Council has worked with the community we realize that not everybody wakes up thinking about the river. So we've gone to the neighborhoods nearest the river. Ocean's 11, which is east of the river between Highway 1 and, and Ocean and Water. That's Ocean's 11. Um, Beach Flats and Lower Ocean. We've done a lot of work in those communities to hear what are most important issues to them. Trash and safety and access are, to the river are, are things that come up. And so we've done projects with those communities. We did one this weekend um, with City Arts, uh, Storm Drain Art, and we've done river cleanups and neighborhood cleanups. So we have done outreach, and actually this grant proposal allows you to count some prior outreach since June of last year. So we've provided that information to staff, and we're gonna do help in other ways to get additional outreach. Um, share, uh, help with additional outreach. I'm about out of time other than, uh, so I'll just finish by saying we support it and um, we'll help with the pursuit of the funds. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other members of the community who want to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if staff wanted to uh, come back up and further clarify in any way. You're welcome to, if, or if there's any additional questions, then we have Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Did you have any statements or? Yeah, sure, we can all weigh in, uh, certainly on this from Public Works and ED and Parks and Rec. Um, uh, I'm trying to go from the very top here. The first question we got was critically underserved. What does that mean? Um, I don't know if we can pull up the map necessarily. Dave, do you know where that is potentially? Yeah, I can, if it's on the end. Can't go to it here. Nope. 
Okay, I'll, I'll just sort of explain it. There are two, two main um, definitions of critically underserved as part of the grant. Uh, the first one um, is park acreage per capita, so per thousand residents. So areas in the city uh, where there are three acres uh, per thousand um, is, is, or fewer is critically underserved. We have very little of that within the city. We're very fortunate to have a a very robust park system. Um, really in kind of the, the upper east side, if you will, is kind of the only area um, based on um, census tracts where we have that less than three acres per thousand. The other aspect um, of, um, of uh, sort of critically underserved is in terms of poverty. And so that's 80% of the state median income. And that area really, as David kind of alluded to, is more geared toward downtown. Uh, beach flats, uh, lower ocean, some of those areas. Um, in terms of the grant, so here's here's a great example here. So this actually is the Prop 68 uh, statewide fact finder tool. And as part of the grant application, this is uh, specifically uh, directed to our team applying to use this tool that's kind of driven by census tract data um, to tell us what, you know, essentially these different metrics in these different areas. So what we did is we combined all of this data, we put together maps internally to show overlays of, of these critically underserved areas. So you don't have that map, but um, what I want to explain is that we don't have any areas in the city where we have both of those, both a lack of parkland and, um, and that, that sort of poverty line, if you will. So what we did is we tried to find what is going to be most appropriate and, ter and most um, competitive in terms of the grant application. And so a lot of those areas really, there, there were just a few, um, the primary ones being geared toward the Riverwalk and toward the rail trail uh, that we've talked about. So I want to have Dave come back up um, or, or Claire come up and kind of talk about uh, maybe some of the specifics on the rail trail and, uh, and what that means, the public outreach and so forth but wanted to provide some context in terms of what are the critically underserved areas and how are we sort of assessing these to put uh, forth our best application um, and ultimately best serve these areas of the community. Um, uh, but again, it, it's been tricky because we don't overlap perfectly in two areas. So it's, it's finding the, the best combination of house, uh, household median income and, uh, and park deserts, if you will. So. Hi, Claire Fleisler, Transportation Planner, rounding out the trifecta of planning, uh, or parks, public works, and economic development working together on this. Um, in terms of outreach, one of the elements that uh, one of the members of the public brought up was concerns about not doing uh, outreach specific to rail trail segment seven, phase two. Um, as you guys know, you have an item before you later this afternoon, and that's actually one of the projects that since we adopted the master plan in 2012, we have done a ton of outreach on, and much of that outreach has been the formal type of outreach that you would anticipate, planning commission, parks commission, city council, formal public meetings. Uh, the interesting thing about this grant is that in addition to all that work that's been done, in addition to our award-winning master plan that we have there and everything we've gone through on that project, this grant specifically asks that we do outreach since the adoption of this bond, which was June 5th of 2018, um, and that we target that outreach in ways that are not the uh, come to this room and speak at you. It's go to places where people are. So one of the really neat things that we have been doing and will continue to do is go to places where um, these groups that are not your frequent flyers are probably not people that you've ever seen in this room are going. Um, yesterday was a great example of going to the elementary school summer camp program of Nueva Vista and asking these little kids who probably have never been asked these questions before, can you draw me what you wanna see in a park? Do you ever go to these places with your family? What makes it feel safe or not safe for you to walk and ride your bike? How do you get to school? You go to Bayview Elementary School and Galt Elementary School and you're traveling there from the beach flats. That means that Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 2 and the Riverwalk are going to be primary off-street transportation corridors for you to safely get to school. Um, and so in terms of doing outreach, we are open and encouraged to do a ton more outreach, however much we can find and we can fit into this schedule because it's really adding a lot of value to it. But our goal right now is to do that non-traditional outreach um, that supplements the more traditional outreach that we've done to date. Thank you, Claire. Okay, I believe we had a question or a comment from Councilmember Myers, Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, in that order. I guess I was um, gonna go ahead and make a motion to approve the, um, to. Uh, to approve the submittal of the of the grant to the statewide park 
Development Community Revitalization Program, the grant application for both the Riverwalk and the Rail Trail Segment 7. I would add to that though, um, in your team approach to this, can you also please add the uh, Beach Flats um, liaison, Peter, into your process so that he can do that additional outreach needed? I know in some parts of our community where um, you know language may be a barrier, et cetera. So I know he's well networked down there as well as Edgar. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and make the motion. Okay, I'll go ahead and second that. Did you have additional comments that you'd like to add at this point? No. Okay, available for questions sure. if need. Thank you very much. Okay, Council Member uh, Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, thank you for providing the report and the additional information and all the work that you do to try to get us competitive grant funding to supplement the limited resources we have. Um, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely in support of moving forward with these and I don't wanna delay, but I do um, have some concerns um, expressed by Council Member Glover and I think we've talked, some council members have asked in the past if we could, and I know in this case you may not have drafts of the, the grants yet and, and the time is short, um, but to at least have some e summary of you know what the goals are you know what you're what you're telling um, the funders we're going to do we're going to do with the money I think that that um, would really help us feel more comfortable in making these decisions um, and if we can't make that happen this time it would be really helpful to so if I could add um, direct staff to report back to us once the um, grant applications have been completed with a summary of the goals and objectives. Um, and kind of the key elements of the proposals. Yeah, um, that's fine. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Great. Yeah, no, um, thanks for all the work on this and moving ahead with uh, these grant proposals. I was just gonna ask that when the funds, um, if the grant were to be accepted and we were to be awarded those funds, if we can just get a report back on um, how those funds are gonna be utilized. But it sounds like that can be captured within the summary of the reports that go out. So um, that's just the only thing that I was gonna ask the city manager, so. Okay, Councilman. Great. Okay, Councilmember Glover, did you have anything? Thanks. Yeah, just really quick. I know um, some issues in the past with surveying parks has come up because they count the beach as a park. Are y'all counting the beach as a park in your analysis? Uh, because I would be inclined to say that a park or is not the same as a beach and vice versa because of the, you know, so is that included in your analysis? Um, it's currently not in the state's fact finder tool. Actually, what you can see up there, everything in green is considered a park. They do expect that we're gonna have some reconciliation process over the next month to, to take out and add what should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have to clarify a few things about Neary Lagoon. We don't believe the, the treatment plant should be included. Uh, the rail corridor really shouldn't be included at this point. It should be an expansion. Um, and, then, uh, and then the beach, you know, the majority of the beach is not city ownership uh, in fee title. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of had some discussions with them preliminarily that it shouldn't be counted. Right. Um, but ultimately they'll be the arbiter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Very quickly, I'm really thrilled that we can move forward. This is a rare opportunity that has been mentioned uh, and we're on a tight timeline. It's grounded on uh, well over a decade of um, city uh, community involvement, concern, plans, interest. Um, so it's, it's great that we have an opportunity to move forward. I think it's important to say that at this point, um, uh, there's a general idea of how we will approach in the kinds of facilities, but it's, it's not a park plan in and of itself. And so the specifics will come, that's where we get out to the community planning and outreach. Um, and I think it's fair to say, um, if we do receive this grant, a lot of the um, specific planning will run through the Parks Commission and that's where you get the input and the feedback. And we see heads nodding over here. Um, so I think it's important that the council not micromanage from the very top, but let, let's get the funding with a, a broad sense of where we wanna go and then let our parks commission do the work and, and bring forward a plan that has a lot of community input. So we'll go ahead and say we have a motion by Councilmember Meyer, seconded by myself, um, in addition with, by Councilmember Brown to have some report back at a future time in regards to the goals um, associated with the grant application. Thank you for being here to answer the questions. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. So we are on now item number 5 I'm sorry, item number 13 of our... Uh, consent agenda and that item was pulled by 
Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Try to make it uh, short. There um, has just been questions raised by a lot of people, and it's just not in clearly done in the agenda report, but if we could just have the police chief maybe come up and uh, explain why this is happening, which, in, and for people that may not know what the agenda item is specifically, it is moving the ranger program from Parks and Rec underneath the police department. Please. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. This is, I'm Andy Mills, and uh, Chief of Police. The reason it's, uh, it's a continuation of a process that started uh, well over a year ago, to bring the enforcement arm of Park and Recs under the Police Department so that we can have better management and control over the activities that take place mm -hmm. so that there's greater accountability, uh, as well as uh, training for those that would uh, be part of our enforcement process. As you know, just recently, recently we outfitted all the rangers with body-worn cameras as part of that accountability process. And uh, it also has to do a great deal with how we conduct investigations internally and to make sure that there's a high standard uh, in the with the rangers in terms of enforcement. And then coordinating that with other police activities from around the city, making sure that the parks have a good strategy so that we can deal with the problems that arise in each of those areas of the city. Thank you, and can you just uh, explain some of the additional training that the rangers will receive that they weren't previously receiving on Parks and Rec? Sure, um, in addition to body-worn cameras, as, as I've just stated, because that does take training to save those videos and upload them into the cloud. Uh, we also gave constitutional law training so that they understand the constitutional rights of people they're dealing with. Uh, we also gave them training on defensive tactics and de-escalation and uh, as well as uh, uh, many other things I can't go off the top of my head, oh, neighborhood policing and how to problem solve and some of those types of um, techniques. Great. Um, and will they receive, uh, I know you said you couldn't remember all of them, but you know, things like human trafficking and uh, make sure to be able to identify that and with the interactions that they're having. And because I'm not sure, I know that um, there have been conversations just around with regards to the difference of training that takes place between rangers and police and making sure that if they're out there on the front lines doing the work, like you're saying, uh, to be able to make sure to identify those different things as well as interact as appropriately and um, effectively as possible with different members of our community. So that's great. Um, and with that, then I'll just make the motion to move the item. Okay, Council Member Cohen. Um, yeah, I, I'll second it, but I just had a couple questions. Um, what? What do you see as we move forward? We've got the uh, community service officers, we've got the ranger program, and we've got sworn officers. Do you see that continuing in that direction, or is there going to be any any balancing or phasing out or moving more this way or that way? And um, my main thing with the ranger program has always been that a lot of times folks, uh, you know, they see a ranger, a park ranger and they want to know maybe what a bird species is or a, a particular plant or um, you know directions a lot of times. Um, but with the rangers now, it's a little bit more of a, a, of a, of a hardened, I don't know, lack of a better word, you know, uh, tougher urban group. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how, how we're going to move forward. So it is still very important for us to have rangers that are trained and understand the biology of our community as well as the, the nature uh, of our parks and to give that information when asked uh, when they're in those parks. I think Parks and Recs and uh, Tony might be able to address this portion of it a little bit better than I. Um, I do not, at least at this point, see a reduction in one of the group, CSOs, rangers, or police officers, and merging those into different areas. I can tell you this, it's been a wonderful um, uh, cross-pollinization of, of things and training between the rangers and the rest of the staff and the uh, rest of the staff at the Rangers. So when Council Member Glover brought up the, I, the issue of human trafficking, we certainly don't want them doing human trafficking investigations, but the awareness of these kind of things is very important. And, uh, and so uh, all, all three are very distinct positions that have a great deal of benefit for the citizens of our community. And uh, so we wanna make sure that uh, we're able to use those positions as currently uh, funded. 
I look, I look forward to hearing from you about where we might increase various of those areas in, in what's what's working and what's not working. But you know, in economically, you know, what, what would be the best bang for the buck? But understood. We, thanks. I'll take increases in all three. <laughs> is there any member of the community who wanted to address us on this item? This is item number 13 of our consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for action. We have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, next up is item number 15. And that was me. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Hi, um, thank you for uh, being here, Ms. Fleisler, to try to answer some of the questions I have. Actually, it's, just, it's really one question, and it's, um, you know, I've been on the council and participated in conversations about the proposed changes to our parking program. So, you know, I, I feel like I followed along every step of the way. But what I'm still not clear about is, and I, and I actually, under, I do understand the benefits of, of making these changes, in particular to affordable housing, which as I think everybody knows is a major commitment of mine. Um, but I'm still a little unclear because we haven't really received a financial analysis. There are a lot of numbers in these reports, but it's been hard for me to figure out under the different scenarios how what we're currently bringing in versus what we might bring in how it is re how it would be restricted i mean i just i don't feel like i have a really good clear picture of that so if you could try to walk us through that it would be really helpful for me absolutely um so before you today is our phase two update to the downtown parking resolution, which updates our parking in Luffy. And I'll, I'll get to your question, I'm just gonna orient everyone to where we are. Um, the parking in Luffy is an optional tool that new development or development downtown that intensifies it exist, its existing use has the option, and that's the key point there, the option to utilize uh, paying into our shared parking model, our shared system, public supply downtown, rather than build parking on site. Um, so rather than have single use parking, say you build a new office building and it has its own parking or a new residential building and it has its own parking, rather than Luffy offers an opportunity to buy into the public parking system so we use our existing supply more efficiently rather than have single use parking. Um, the in Luffy, as we have it before you, is updated for the first time since pre-earthquake. And now getting into your question about the finances of this. At your um, September 11th, I'm gonna pull out my phone because I have all the dates written down in here. At one. your September 11th council meeting, you approved our updated parking rate strategy, and this had a couple components to it. It increased the user fees, so that the money that you put in the meter, or one of the loop machines, or um, use Park Mobile, at our lots and structures, so our hourly rates went up as well as our daily rates. At the same time, we put a five-year plan to increase our monthly parking permits in place to increase $10 per month over a five-year period to top out at $75 a month in order to bring the price of a monthly parking permit in line with the cost of a monthly transit pass. So people are making a financial decision about how they choose to come downtown. The third prong of this was that over that same five year period, we are sunsetting the parking deficiency fee, which is a fee that's been paid by businesses. It's $425 per space per year for spaces that you don't provide as part of your parking requirement. Um, what that amounts to is businesses subsidizing the cost of parking and in line with best practices, um, on September 11th, we voted to move to a user fee based model. So the whole um, long term parking rate strategy and financial plan came to you on that day and those were the elements part of it. The in lieu fee that's before you today has, uh, to our collective knowledge in public works, never been used. And the biggest reason for that that we've heard is that the in lieu fee is a one-time upfront cost that is paid by the developer at the time of building permit. In the past, we had the option to utilize the parking deficiency fee, which rather than be paid upfront and by the developer or the owner, was passed through to the building tenant. So um, the small businesses that we have downtown, our retail and our office spaces, are, were paying for that parking rather than having the building developer pay for it. Um, so the in lieu fee is not built into our financial projections, and without the in lieu fee being used, we have a sustainable parking fund moving forward with the uh, change 
changes that you made on September 11th. As we see how this is utilized, we can come back to you with some analysis of the fund balance, but we did not count on a single dollar coming in from this for, for the financial sustainability of the district, if that helps. So I, if I, I could just, it, it kind of sounds like um, the, what we do with um, in lieu fees for affordable housing, but in this case, we just don't know because it hasn't been used. Correct, yeah, so we didn't want to make any assumptions there. Great, thanks. Right, thank you, Claire. Is there any member of the community who wants to address us on this item, item number 15 of our consent agenda? Please step forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Tim Willoughby speaking for affordable housing now. Um, we support this change uh, for two obvious reasons. One is that it decouples parking uh, in these projects, uh, which enables developers to actually lower the cost of what they're building for units. Uh, and the second part of it is that it incentivizes very low and low income uh, units, which is what you are most efficient of in terms of meeting your housing element. Um, so this is, to us, it's a no-brainer. It's a great idea. It's a useful tool to getting more affordable housing. So thank you. Thank you. Please, next speaker. Pat Farrell, I'm the vice chair of the Downtown Commission. I just wanted to uh, second the staff uh, sentiment that the goal of this recommendation is to try and increase incentives and make more feasible the develop of uh, affordable units downtown. And secondly, to make sure that the pricing of the market rate fees is set in a way that doesn't uh, create a burden on the district in terms of future public supply responsibilities. So um, I sincerely hope you all adopt this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing uh, no other uh, uh, interest in public comment on this item, we'll go ahead and return it back for action. And this is item number uh, 15 on our consent agenda. Councilmember Matthews. Um, well, I want to thank the staff for their um, additional information. Um, I think it's, this is a really important policy that uh, reflects directly a, a history of interest in um, Support, using our parking policy to support development of affordable housing. Um, so I want to reemphasize it's been supported consistently, a, a lengthy process um, originating in the downtown parking district, the downtown commission, and then uh, over time uh, supported by council. And so this is a graduated um, uh, in lieu fee that supports deepening affordability. Um, no financial risk to the district, um, and uh, specifically, um, I think we'll uh, set, set a policy direction, and it's based on recommend a whole series of recommendations from our housing blueprint committee um, during the 2018 year, which I think you were on that, weren't you? Yeah, brought forth a number of recommendations, uh, none of which is a silver bullet, but which collectively help get us where we wanna go. And so this is one of those policies that can support, uh, provide an incentive for deepening uh, um, uh, development of affordable housing. So for all of those reasons, I'm going to move approval of this motion. Yeah. I'll go ahead and second that. So, uh, motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself. Councilmember Crone? Just a question. I was just wondering um, from staff if there's ever been a, or maybe, maybe it's in our city budget and you could point out the, uh, the pages, um, any kind of financial uh, analysis of, of parking district revenues and expenditures. I'm gonna let Jim take that. In, in your um, budget, proposed budget, uh, the fund balance page looks at the district as a whole. Sorry, Jim Burr, Public Works. Okay. <coughs> and if there are specific questions on that fund balance analysis, I may seek Marcus and Mattel. But as uh, the finance department prepares that. But you would say that there has been a, that analysis done of parking, of revenues and expenditures. Every year. Yeah, we do it every year. Um, also on June 19th, 19th, 
we brought to you a rate, a five-year rate strategy that uh, right. Claire talked about. Um, and that looked at all new revenues, potential new revenues for over the next five years. And so we, we looked at every piece that we thought might change in the district in the coming five years and brought that all to you and explained it all to you. And um, that was uh, adopted finally on September 11th. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by myself. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number 18 on our consent agenda. And I'm not sure who pulled this item. Councilmember Glover. Yeah, it was just uh, looking at it. Let me just pull it up right now. 18 um, was that it was only suggesting a $5 increase on uh, residential parking permits. I remember that we had had conversations about it, but I don't remember us landing on $5. Um, maybe that was... I, I remember we talked about tier scaling. I remember we talked about uh, implementing it so that students could be exempt from the increases. We talked about uh, making it so that parking permits were uh, associated with the individual. So if they have more than a single car, then they'll be paying additional uh, costs for those additional vehicles. So I'm just curious as to how all, all of that got distilled into a $5 increase. Jim Burr, Public Works again. Um, so what what we proposed and what I heard consensus on was the $5 base rate increase. Uh, as we looked at those other questions, all of which you just mentioned, we first uh, went to the parking office, the staff who actually run this program. What we found is um, there's the way we currently collect and operate the permit program, there's no way to even project what, what these different pieces might mean to the revenue picture. And at the same time, we were able to backtrack on one of our biggest programs, which is the West Side program um, that's rolled out in uh, late August and the mailers for which are mailed out in July. So we felt we needed to get at least the $5 rate, which we heard consensus on um, to you before we went dark for the July recess. Okay, thank you. Is there any member of the community who wants to address us on this item, item number 18 of our consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for action and deliberation. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Well, I, I um, move the item, but I do have one other, one follow-up question. Second. Okay. Uh, just in terms of um, reporting back, can you give us a sense of when we might the kind of discussion about some of the other items and or um, additional increases might come back to us um, in I your would, plan, in, in terms think, of the planning you've done. I would think right after the first of the year would be the best time. Um, that way it would give us plenty of lead time for next year rolling, uh, raising, potentially raising the west side, starting with that west side permit again. Um, I'm not super optimistic we'll be able to get to a bunch of those pieces, but at least we'll come up, we'll come back and explain it. Okay. The, the problems or and or issues with you at that point. Great, thank you. So I would just add, include that in my motion that um, a direct staff to um, report back to us at one of our January meetings with an update. That's okay with Accepted. the second. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Do you, would you like me to repeat the language? Okay. Okay, let's see, we're getting there. This is item number 19 on our uh, consent agenda. Um, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here today. Um, I had a question uh, that came to me from some folks in the community around um, when this program is going to be set up, um, what kind of tracking or what's going to be the mechanism for making for tracking who the passes go to um, if for example those people become they, they no longer work downtown will there be you know what what's the process for making sure that the people who um, have the passes are people who are working downtown is there an application um, and just wondering if you could speak to that at all yeah, for rollout, we're going to be working through employers, and part of what we're going to be collecting when people, um, co when we distribute these passes, is contact information and getting people enrolled in our commute management platform. That will give us a list of people of who they are, an email address, a contact phone number, and where they work. And on a regular basis, probably quarterly, we can check in with those employers. 
and um, C. This differs from some other programs where businesses pay into the program and they have a vested interest in making sure that they're only paying for those employees that are actually working there. This um, being all city funded via the parking district, there is admittedly a lot more opportunity for fraud here. So it's gonna be one of the things that we have to manage. And are these passes, are these, for example, like funded monthly where they scan the pass and that gets deducted or is it just a pass where they show it to the bus driver and then they just... So the way that you guys voted on it um, was to have a flat rate for the year. So it's $311,000 and change for the year and we're billed monthly at one twelfth of that, regardless of the number of people who use it. So it's not based on any actual utilization rate, it's just a flat fee. Um, which ties into your first question. It means that we're not billed more if there's a higher level of fraud and we're not billed less if there's a lower level of use. Thanks. Any additional questions from council? Okay, is there any member of the community who'd like to address us on this item? Item number 19 of our consent agenda. Seeing none, Councilmember Matthews? Yeah. Um, I will go ahead and move the item before us with one ad addition, and that is that the council receive a, a report on the uh, use and operation of this program at the six month time. I think that's really important because it is a pilot. There are a whole lot of unknowns, and it will be important that we get a sense of how it's going as we enter into budget discussions for the coming year. So we'll get a report in springtime, and that, that will be helpful to us. So that's my motion. Second. Motion by uh, Councilmember Ma Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Further discussion, Councilmember Crone? Um, I, I assume maybe the, they're coming back to us on the sort of marketing plan in place for this, so how to get the word out to, uh, to downtown employees, like how they're gonna know about the bus program, because I would lo I'd very, be very interested in that, because I think it speaks to um, what Councilmember mm -hmm. Matthews wants, because I do also would like to see it come back. Yeah, at your February meeting, we approved a, you approved a package of TDM options, and one of those options was a, a budget for marketing. So we're going to be putting out an RFP for marketing services for all modes of transportation, and in voting on, this was option four that was presented to you. As part of this option, because it added $285,000 to the overall proposed budget, we did include, include an increased marketing budget there, specifically to target transit, because we figured if we were investing this larger dollar amount in transit, we wanted to make sure that we put our best foot forward to be successful. So that will be um, a separate item there. Thanks. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, with further direction to have a report back in the uh, six month mark in terms of mm -hmm. progress. Is that a uh, captured? Included in the motion. Included yeah. in the motion. Okay, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So the last item on our consent agenda polled was item number 21. And I'm not sure who pulled that item. That okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I said a question regarding this item. There was a member of the community who um, sent an email to this, the city council and um, was concerned about whether or not this contract went out for a competitive bid. And so I was just wondering if somebody from Public Works might be able to answer that question. Mike Hopper, Public Works. Uh, the California legislature uh, recognizes the urgency of energy projects, and so they passed, um, and apologies in advance to Mr. Condotti, Government Code 4217, which gives local jurisdictions uh, the discretion to solicit and evaluate proposals on something other than price. Uh, and so that's the belt. The suspenders in this case is that our energy staff has been working over the last year and a half to prepare a list of these solar projects. Um, they contact, they posted the project at the corporation yard on a site called Energy Sage, and we received responses from uh, several companies, local companies, one of which was uh, Mr. Biddle, who's here today, uh, and who I had a conversation with this morning um, to look at these projects and we got uh, preliminary uh, prices in terms of what uh, dollars per kilowatt hour from these companies uh, but also looked at the whole package that they presented um, 
my my duty is to provide the best value to the city, not just the best price. And so uh, based on the conversations that our staff had, uh, we decided that Sandbar was a company that we wanted to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions here? Okay. I'm sorry, did I miss a hand? No, I'm sorry, okay. Is there any member of the community who wanted to address this on this item? Item number 21 of our consent agenda. Okay, you're welcome to come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Is there any other member of the community who wants to address this on this item? Okay, go ahead. All right, my name is Clint Biddle. I work for Solar Technologies. We're a local solar contractor uh, for 20 years here in the city of Santa Cruz. Our office is across the street from Shoppers Corner in the Buttery. And although I did bid the project uh, yesterday, I just became aware of it yes uh, over the weekend. So um, there are two reasons that were cited for rushing this project uh, and not having a competitive bid process. Uh, the first one was that the PG&E inter interconnection application is going to expire. You can keep that running by just sending PG&E an email saying that you're working on the project within the first year, and then you just have to do that every six months to keep the application alive. There's, so there's actually no urgency there. The second was that the 30% federal tax credit is stepping down to 26% at the end of this year, which could affect the financing. That's true. However, we finance our PPAs in-house, and as long as you sign our contract this year, our tax equity partners lock in the 30% federal tax credit rate. So there's actually no urgency there either, and as long as you sign a contract within this calendar year. So no real sense of urgency there. And after reviewing Sandbar's proposal over the weekend, when I first became aware of it, um, we can say that it, uh, their PPA terms and rates are, are well above current market rates. And we do not really see how in good faith the uh, council members in the city of Santa Cruz can move forward with proposal uh, without getting, um, I, I guess I didn't realize it was on an, on an energy stage and there were other bids submitted, but our PPA rate starts 7% lower than Sandbar's and it is five years shorter. So it's 20 years instead of 25 years. So five years less payments for the city. So when you have a competitive bid that would over 25 years save you an extra $370,000 if you stick with the full term or if you buy it out in year five, which um, Mike has told me you're interested in, you would still save an additional $154,000 with our proposal. So again, um, if there's any doubt that this isn't the best value for the city, then we believe you have a duty and responsibility to Thank you. see other proposals. Okay. Is there any other member of the community wants to address this on this item? Okay, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Hi there, council members, Mayor Watkins. How are you today? My name is Kale Garamendi. I'm the gentleman from, uh, well, the gentleman, I guess I mean the gentleman, <laughs> the gentleman from uh, Sandbar Solar who put together the proposal, been working with Public Works Department here for quite some time, and just wanted to make mention of a couple of things with regard to the market value, because I think that's what, if I were in your seat, would pull at my heartstrings the most and my responsibility to the community. Um, there's far more than price that goes into a P there's far more than price in a PPA price. There's a lot of levers that can be pulled. And based on some requests that were made, based on some um, past experiences with the, the city of Santa Cruz had with PPAs, we made sure we put a comprehensive operation and maintenance program, module cleaning, 20-year um, inverter warranty extension, or 20-year total inverter warranty, that which required us to budget for a warranty extension. This is far outside of the normal mode of operation, and it, 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 uh, it ticks up that PPA price. Um, if we were to just go in with a default, I can tell you right now, our, our, our PPA price would be right in the same ballpark. In fact, I looked back in the archives before I specifically requested this, the, the PPA pricing or the O&M adders, module cleaning and so on, we're at a, at a landfill and, and that's obviously cleaning is important. And the pricing was, was a little bit higher than, than that number, but by about a quarter of a cent higher. And uh, we're right in line. This, what, this is, um, what this is is a, uh, a comprehensive approach that meets the Public Works Department and City of Santa Cruz needs. And so it's very, very much a competitive market rate. And um, I think that's, that's the important message to share. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll go ahead at this time then and return back to uh, Council for uh, Action and Deliberation. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Matthew. I just had one more question for uh, Public Works, which was just um, what was the timeline um, around trying to find a sole source vendor to provide the service? Well, the urgency that we feel is that uh, we have no solar capacity at the Corporation Yard and, or DeMayo Lane, and so uh, we're getting beat over the head with electric bills. That's, that's our main urgency. Our other urgency is we want to give you something that can be plugged into the budget that has some firmness to it, that doesn't have a bunch of slushy costs. Um, Sandbar's proposal was attractive because it included a annual budget for maintenance and cleaning, uh, a budget that rolls over year to year. So if they don't use the full amount, it, it accumulates. Uh, if you fold that into the cumulative cash flow that is in the packet, uh, it makes their proposal even more attractive. They also had an extended warranty on the inverters that uh, wasn't offered elsewhere. So um, as I said, I think this is really the best value for us and it gets these projects off the ground. We'll have other projects that are gonna be uh, put forward so um, other companies will have the opportunity to participate. Matthews. Yeah, I appreciate the additional information and given that I'm going to go ahead and move the recommendation before us. Um, just saying that um, it's clear that the staff has put a great deal of detailed um, effort into uh, setting the parameters for this. I think it, it's um, uh, to be noted that this reflects um, they're being proactive both for energy savings, environmental reasons, and also the financial um, and operational uh, fu future of this. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, support the fact that it does include a comprehensive warranty. So um, therefore moving the recommendation. I'll second it. And I'll just say that um, hopefully in the future, you know, SunPower and some other companies can be um, notified about different um, city um, projects and contracts that are going out so they can be taken into consideration as well. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Further discussion, mm -hmm. Councilmember Glover. Just a quick question, since the conversation of incorporating other businesses uh, is coming up, what was the outreach process for this project in particular? Besides, I mean, you said you posted it somewhere on, on a, and I'm not familiar with that outlet that you mentioned before. Is that like a place where all the in, in, uh, energy people go <clears throat> looking for RFPs? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you, but our energy coordinators uh, work off that side quite a bit to keep up with current technology and to find out who the players are. Mm -hmm. So just we post stuff on there and then whoever sees it then applies for it. Correct. Uh, we don't, uh, so there's not like a blanket outreach to all of the solar companies in Santa Cruz saying like, hey, the city is proposing this project. We just yeah, correct. It. It's useful to keep in mind that at the time we started doing research on this project, we didn't know if we were going to buy this system or if we were going to go with a PPA or uh, the least attractive mm -hmm. option is leasing. Uh, and it became apparent that uh, because of our capital restrictions, the PPA was the way to go. Uh, so it changes it a little bit from a traditional construction project. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if uh, those that have made and seconded the motion would want to include language around just ensuring a robust outreach process for the for future solar projects, as it seems like there may have been missed opportunities for competition and conversation. It's totally fine with me. So I'll include uh, that we um, support ongoing robust outreach and also clarity on our criteria for awarding contracts. Thank you. Okay. Were you able to capture that, uh, clerk? <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor uh, Cummings seconded the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So before we jump right into item number 26, we're gonna go ahead and take a short break, um, maybe about five minutes for the council to uh, take a break before this this item. I'll just remind the community that uh, those of you who were not here earlier, council member Crone uh, will uh, recuse himself from participating in this, uh, in this uh, agenda item. So uh, at this time would be a nice opportunity for him to also um, uh, step away from the dais. Okay, so we'll return in about five minutes. Just back to session here, if I could um, get your attention, we're going to go ahead and uh, come back to our regular council meeting agenda. We're on item number tw 26 of our agenda, and we're going to go ahead and bring our council meeting back to session.
Oh, there's, there she is. Okay. So we have, um, before us is a public hearing, and before we jump into that, and I explain the process of the public hearing, I'll go ahead and ask uh, Councilmember Crone if he has any additional comments in terms of his recusal. Yeah, I just want to let people know that on the advice of our city attorney that I'm uh, going to recuse myself on this, on this item, item number 26. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go into the item. At this time, uh, this is an item which is a, which is an appeal, and it, the process will be as follows. Staff will have an opportunity to present their report. The appellants, um, Jillian Greensight and Rachel O'Malley, will have 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of the appeal. Opponents or responding applicant, Leo Mena, uh, environmental planner will have 15 minutes to speak and present any additional evidence. Uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to the community for any public comment at that time. Um, we have a couple of members of the community who reached out in advance for additional time on behalf of their organization. We'll have a public comment option of one minute for those that want to briefly address us and then we'll have the uh, community organizations have their four minutes and then we'll go ahead into the two minute time frame. After that, we'll have a, a five minute opportunity for a rebuttal on behalf of the appellants, and then we will return to our council for action and deliberation. So many steps, but we'll go ahead and start right now with the staff presentation and report. Uh, good afternoon, um, Ms. Mayor, uh, council members, <clears throat> Mike Ferry with the planning department. So to further complicate this, I'm going to do a portion of the presentation and I'm going to pass it off to Chris Schneider and he's going to kind of cover the more technical aspects of the trail. And then we're going to pass it off to Leo Mena and he's with ICF Consulting who did the environmental work and he's part of the presentation. <clears throat> and then I'll summarize it. Okay. So I'll start off. <clears throat> So the um, Coast Rail Trail plan is about a 32 mile uh, plan. It goes from Davenport to Watsonville. It's considered the primary alignment of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. The RTC prepared the uh, trail network master plan to establish a continuous alignment, design guidelines and regulations uh, for the associated network. They approved the master plan in 2013 after multiple years of study and public input. Um, a part of that approval was to design the trail in such a way that uh, a, a rail wouldn't be precluded from the overall project. Uh, the RTC recently completed a unified corridor study and that again emphasized the protection of the rail right away for transit, high capacity public transit, uh, freight, and a bike and pedestrian trail. So segment uh, seven of the rail trail is about 3.1 miles long. Uh, phase one of that was approved by the Planning Commission in September of 2017. Uh, phase two was approved by the Planning Commission on April 18th. The um, phase two goes from California to the Ralph, uh, the Wharf Roundabout, and that's behind the uh, sewer treatment plant. Um, at that meeting, uh, we had uh, got some late um, comments from the Sierra Club and the Planning Commission directed us to respond to that letter if this project was appealed. Both the letter from the Sierra Club that stated April 13th and our response is attached to your staff report. So the Planning Commission's approval was appealed by Jillian Greensight and Dr. Rachel O'Malley. The appeal letter is attached to your staff report as well. Um, a summary of the appeal is that um, they're stating that an EIR is required when substantial evidence is provided in light of the whole record, that a project could have significant impact on the environment. They further state that uh, the project will eliminate a riparian forest wetland habitat, among other outstanding significant impacts. And the letter also states that, it, that the uh, project does not sufficiently protect vegetation, natural habitats, and natural resources consistent with the coastal permit findings. So the CEQA guidelines that the city uh, uses um, uh, were created or approved by the city council in 1990. I think you guys got a late copy of that. That was at a request of uh, the appellant that they see a copy of that. They were sent that this morning. Um, the 
pertinent criteria that that document has us use is does the project substantially affect a rare or endangered species of animal, plant, or habitat, or will it interfere substantially? So that was that's the um, calculus that's used when the initial study and the mitigated negative deck was completed. Um, the city's response letter is dated April 29th, um, and that was attached to your uh, staff report, so I hope you had a chance to read that. Um, part of what we've heard from the Sierra Club and other members of the public is that there wasn't a uh, alternatives analysis completed. That's not required as part of the initial study process, but I've itemized the uh, different uh, alternatives that we've looked at um, that finally came up with the proposal that's in front of you today. So the, the very first alternative was the path was going to go on the north side of the rails adjacent to Neri Lagoon. So as you can imagine, the riparian impacts would have been much greater. The potential for erosion, um, stormwater runoff would have been greater. We would have had to have a much more robust stormwater system to protect the Neri Lagoon. Also, any of the retaining walls would not only have to hold up the path, but they would have to hold up the weight of a live freight train. So moving it to the south side kind of eliminated all those potential impacts on the lagoon. Uh, we also considered um, a route that went through La Barranca Park. So that would have been um, introducing a bicycle element that the park wasn't designed for, first of all. It also would have included uh, or required a very large uh, uh, structure to take the elevation of the trail. You'd have to cut halfway through the park and start descending down to the rail bed, and that's about 35 feet lower. So it would be a substantial structure, probably a visual impact. It would be very expensive. And uh, the alternative was brought to the Parks Commission, and they weren't in favor of, of the path going through La Barranca Park. Let's see, the um, Bay Street to the intersection of Bay and West Cliff and then on down to the roundabout was also looked at as well as the California Street from the intersection of California and Bay down to Laurel and then to Pacific Avenue. And both of those would have been on-site paths on the street, not on-site, but on street paths. Um, neither of them meet the uh, ADA because of a hill and I'll show you, I've got some slides coming up. Uh, there's a hill on both of those that wouldn't uh, meet the ADA standards for a trail. Um, the project, the, the purpose of the project is to maximize safety of trail users, encourage new riders onto uh, bicycle trails, and th those existing roadways already have high bicycle and pedestrian collisions. And again, that slope with the ADA was problematic. Uh, during the original design, uh, one of the requests was from the City Emergency Services, from Ecology Action and Bike Santa Cruz to create a 16-foot wide path. That was looked at and the um, number of trees that would have had to been removed, this would be on the south side of the tracks up against La Barranca Park, and it would have had to been widened to such an extent that it would have started impacting the park. So the trail was ultimately designed at 12 feet uh, in width. It's primarily about 10 feet away from the center line of the rail, except for the uh, north and south ends. And I think Chris will talk about that. There's a little minor variation. So as part of this uh, whole process, the uh, arts master plan kind of uh, zeroed in on some potential uh, sites. And I've got some slides for you on that. Um, they've got, um, they had some public um, um, meetings and pop-up meetings, I think, was included in that. They had a pretty robust public outreach project and uh, got a quite a few ideas for some locations along this phase two for public art. So overall, the um, project is going to remove 16 heritage trees. Uh, that will require a replacement of 32 trees. Um, the location will be reviewed and approved by the city arborist. 
Um, the project plans also include tree protection for 13 trees and 11 of those are heritage trees. And on page two of the plans, you can see the netting, uh, the, uh, the rules and regulations that the contractor will have to follow to protect those trees and they'll be fenced off. So Public Works uh, walked the alignment of the path adjacent to the trestle last fall with uh, Sierra Club members and other members of the public. In response to the uh, comments that they received, they redesigned that portion of the path and where six heritage eucalyptus trees were gonna be removed, they've now reduced that to five um, being maintained, one potentially being reviewed and we have a condition of approval again during construction if uh, the tree roots can be pruned instead of removing the tree, then they'll work with the city arbors to try to do that. So I'll show you some pictures. So that's a rail trail. <laughs> so a little background on this, this whole uh, plan is uh, all the way back to the 80s. Sam Farr was a champion that uh, fostered appreciation and access for the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail system. And with the help of Sam, the RTC purchased the 32 mile rail line in 2020, $14.2 million, 2012. Go ahead. In 2013, the uh, master plan was adopted by all the surrounding agencies, and they broke the 32-mile segment into, um, or the 32-mile trail into 20 different segments. So today's package is, we further broke segment seven down to phase one and two. They both have a logical start and end point that connects with city streets, uh, and the environmental was going to be, um, well, uh, not more difficult. It was just going to, to take longer to do the design and the environmental work for phase two, which is in front of us today. Uh, in 2015, the city hired RRM Design Group to uh, do the design and the environmental section, and RRM is the same group that did Arana Gulch for us, and uh, they've done really good work for us, and we've worked well with them in the past. In 2016, the Transportation and Public Works Commission approved the final schematic plans. In 2017, um, segment seven was separated into those two phases that I talked about, and we're currently expecting, um, this has to be updated, the completion of phase one by 2020. So I'm not gonna read all of these, but these are all general plan policies that support maintaining the rail with the trail. Um, these are in the 2030 general plan. These are in the land use uh, sections of the plan, and it's all aimed at maintaining the rail along with any kind of pedestrian trail. So this is a picture of the whole segment seven it goes from the roundabout over to natural bridges. Phase one is the previously approved phase we've discussed. This is the phase two alignment, that short section right there. These are existing bikeways that uh, intersect with those two phases. It's another shot of a typical rail trail program. This one's down in San Clemente and they have um, a really active rail line there that has passenger service that seems to come by at least once an hour and it, it's kind of neat. This is a shot of our existing path that goes over to the depot. And this is an uh, illustration of what the path would look like uh, adjacent to the uh, sewer treatment plant. And I've got a couple slides on the uh, art uh, project and I included those uh, specific pages in your, or in the Planning Commission's packet which is attached to your staff report. Um, but they had a lot of outreach. Uh, they had a lot of uh, interesting ideas. Pictures are better. So this is an illustration of some of the stuff that could occur um, on some of the retaining walls. They also have uh, art objects that could go. I guess this is a, um, a speed pillow type of a setup. Uh, they got a location on the trestle where they can uh, have some art. And then of course there could be murals along the uh, entire uh, alignment. 
So one of the things that I think everybody's kind of anxious about is getting more eyes on that area. Currently, we've heard from a lot of people that um, they wouldn't want to walk that stretch of railroad track. And we took this shot at about 11 o'clock on a weekday morning. Um, the police have a lot of trouble with uh, illegal campers uh, down here. They leave a lot of debris, um, uh, open up the fencing and go down into Neary Lagoon. This is Neary in this uh, side of the slide, and that's La Barranca Park up there. So this was a campsite that was just below La Barranca Park, so upslope from the uh, rail trail, a lot of debris down along the ground. And we can expect the same kind of um, impact as we experienced when the Arana Gulch path went in. We got a lot less um, um, problems as soon as there was more public eyes on it. So at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris Schneider. He's gonna talk about some of the details. And if you just click that, the pictures will switch for you. So the current um, trail, just turn off. The, the current trail is uh, 8 tenths of a mile approximately, 12 feet wide and uh, 10 foot um, offset from, oh, excuse me. 10 foot offset uh, from the edge, uh, from the center line of the track and um, where the exist, where an existing fence uh, will go with the project. Uh, there's one crossing at the wharf intersection with a cross bike, uh, there's new storm drain, there are new wood lag retaining walls that Mike had shown you as part of the art uh, project. Um, specifically that type of wall was chosen for a variety of reasons. It's harder to graffiti, uh, it reflects a railroad theme. Uh, those type of walls require less excavation because they drill footings rather than um, dig out for a spread footing. So there's less disruption of the area. Uh, the walls are anywhere from three and a half to 19 and a half feet tall. There's uh, dark sky compliant lighting and security cameras proposed. There's wayfinding directional and safety signage. The, this piece of the alignment for the environmental review was uh, uh, cut into uh, segments, several segments. Segment F is from Bay in California uh, to uh, essentially the edge of the treatment plant. Um, there is, uh, this is the beginning of the trail or to the side. This is what it looks like um, once it would be constructed emergency access at the middle there where it says vehicles only authorized, the trail accessing directly to the uh, Bay California Street intersection, um, and the stop sign that's currently at um, uh, Bay and California Avenue is moved to Bay and California Street. So there's a stop crossing for pedestrian and bicyclists to make the move across the street um, and ties into uh, phase one of uh, segment seven. And you can see the green striping on the bottom right, and that's what's called the uh, cross bike crossing. And there's one at the other end at the wharf intersection. And that was planned for during the uh, design of the roundabout. Um, this is a typical detail in that area where you have the path that's 12 foot wide. The, um, right in here, the two foot clearance minimums between each side for, um, you know, bike pedals and handlebars. This is the retaining wall. In this very section, there's no storm drain system. It starts further down. There's a V ditch behind the retaining wall at the top, which has been eliminated with the project to reduce, uh, you know, further excavation and um, work on the hillside. You can see that there's street lights and cameras up at that level. The distance down here at the bottom between the center line of the track and the edge of the fence is 10 feet. And that's the typical standard. There are times that we can get closer to the center line of the track and get to eight and a half feet. Um, in most of this case where it's curved track, 10 is the minimum. But at the very end, uh, down by the sanctuary center, it is gonna be eight and a half feet. This is a typical wood lagging wall, um, but the, the supports or the columns are a lot closer than what's proposed in this project. Um, oh. This is uh, segment uh, G, 
And segment, segment G um, has uh, one feature that's a bit unique from what I've described so far, and that's a turnout in this area here, uh, which is uh, informally called Railroad Bobs. And that is a, f a flatter area with um, no trees, and that provides a turnout for emergency vehicles or maintenance vehicles so they're not blocking the path. Uh, this is again the same uh, typical section in this area. The retaining walls are taller um, as they're further into the slope. Um, there's anchors at the very top where the wall is higher. You can see this sort of this line, dashed line here. That's the existing slope that's cut back into for the trail. There's storm drain in this, uh, in this part of the project. Now, currently there's no drainage facilities there for this part and, you know, there's and that can be noted by standing water and the, and the draining, drainage ditches that haven't been maintained. Um, this will eliminate those, uh, the inlets, the catch basins that um, tie into the storm drain will have inserts that prevent sediment and trash from getting into the storm drain. The storm, storm drain is ultimately tied into the Neary Lagoon pump station and that during the dry weather season isn't open to Cal Beach, it's closed off it backs into the uh, wastewater treatment plant and is actually treated by the wastewater treatment plant. During the um, wet weather season before, um, usually it's about October 15th before the winter starts, the whole piping system is cleaned. That water is taken to the treatment plant before it's open to Cal Beach. So actually the, the storm drain system is gonna operate better than the current drainage system or lack of drainage system out there right now. Um, during, um, in this section, you know, I forgot to men mention in the previous section, uh, there are the removal of 12 heritage trees and part of the mitigation measures is uh, root pruning and uh, tree mitigation efforts that, with the uh, ability to try to save uh, more trees as well as protection measures that Mike had mentioned. In uh, segment G, there are three heritage trees that are removed. This is a, a cross section where that um, turnout area is, which is base rock. And uh, this allows for, you know, areas for vehicles to get out of the way that are gonna have to maintain the path, as well as emergency services. Uh, um, this segment, uh, or this piece uh, is H, and that's from essentially the Neary Lagoon pump station out to the wharf intersection. Um, this is the area, the eucalyptus grove that was mentioned, where when we redesigned the project, the wall in this area, uh, we were able to um, uh, save five of the six trees that we intended originally to take out, heritage eucalyptus, and um, the one that's remaining, we will try to save it, but won't know until uh, construction, once we're able to expose the vegetation and the roots. All that work is done under the guidance of the urban for city's urban forester. The section, um, again, this, so again, it's 10 foot from the center line. This, this is where the new wall is located. This is the storm drain system that comes from Neary Lagoon and the pump station. The smaller one next to it is the storm drain system for the trail itself. path again is 12 feet wide. Um, in this section, which is uh, the sanctuary scenic centers on the left of the, the photo, our left, and the cars parking, that's the little parking lot across from the sanctuary center. In this case here, we are eight and a half feet from the center line of track uh, to the edge of the path. And again, the path is still 12 feet wide. Um, the uh, trees are replaced, being replaced at two to one, the heritage trees. Uh, the willows that are being removed are replaced at three to one, and they will be planted at uh, Antonelli's Pond. Um, some of the tree replacements that are occurring for this, uh, this segment will be, um, for this phase, will be planted in phase one. Uh, so they'll be planted in advance of the construction of this project. Um, when Mike had noted, um, one of the alternatives, we went from a 16 foot wide trail to a 12 foot 
wide trail, we did actually look at the tree count and there were 18 fewer trees um, removed with the narrower trail. Now one of the things that um, often comes up is uh, why can't we remove the track? Well, in this case, we really do have an active rail. <coughs> and, and so I have a short video after the environmental presentation just to show what Warren Camp really does, does out there in order to give people a sense of really how things operate um, for the railroad. So with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Leo Mena with ICF who did the environmental review for the city. Hi hey everyone. Um, so I'll give you an overview of what we did for our environmental documentation for the phase two of the Santa Cruz Rail Trail project. So the initial study was uh, initial study mitigated neg negative declaration or ISMND uh, was published on July 13th, 2018 um, and was available for review for um, a total of 30 days from July 13th to August 13th, 2018. Um, the analysis that we did in this document was prepared um, using the CEQA thresholds as well as the uh, 1990 guidelines that uh, um, that Mike mentioned. Um, and so when determining our, our whether, a pro whether our project would result in a potentially significant impact, we considered those thresholds. So I'll give you an example for biological resources. We have to look at whether a project would result in a substantially adverse effect on special status species or habitat, for example. So that's the question that we were answering in our document. So our analysis included, um, we identified potentially significant impacts that would be mitigated to a less than significant level for um, aesthetics, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, noise and transportation. Um, and right now, I think I'll just focus on one of the key issues um, of this project, which is biological resources. Uh, since trees are gonna be removed and vegetation would be permanently affected by the installation of the project. So the, projects, the project does include several pre-construction me measures in order to minimize impacts to special status species um, to a less than significant level. And these species include uh, the California red-legged frog, uh, Western pond turtle, special status birds, special status bats, the San Francisco dusky footed wood rat, and monarch butterfly. The ISMND also includes mitigation measures requiring the replanting of willow trees at a three to one ratio. So for all the willow trees that are gonna be removed, three will be planted in kind at, um, no, sorry, not in kind, but will be planted at Antonelli Pond. Um, the loss due to this project represents um, approximately 2.5% of the total riparian cover in the Neary Lagoon area. So that is what we considered when determining our, our, um, our impact. Based on the site features um, and the habitat relative to the, to, relative to the area as a whole, and, and considering that we would be mitigating at a three to one ratio, it was concluded that the impact could be reduced to a less than significant level and it wouldn't exceed that threshold of substantially adversely affecting riparian habitat. Um, and I would also like to note here that Antonelli Pond um, was chosen as a site for restoration because it is known, a documented area for um, California red-legged frog, which is a federally listed species. So this project is actually gonna result in the creation of habitat for that, would, that could be used by this federally listed species. Um, and in our, um, we also prepared a natural environment study for Caltrans in that that document um, identified that Neary Lagoon due to the presence of predator species and due to its um, location close to development sites has a lower potential um, to uh, support California red-legged frogs. So this project is uh, creating habitat for this federally listed species. Um, um, and on that, I just did wanna note that this project did go uh, under NEPA review. So we prepared an, a natural environment study um, with Caltrans and that, that, um, that document had the same information that was included in our ISMND. And that document was approved by Caltrans. We received a CE and Caltrans did do consultation with the US Department of Fish and Wildlife Service. So that's actually how we came up with the mitigation measure of planting um, willow trees at Antonelli Pond. Um, they consulted with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service said, well, you know, there's, um, 
to mitigate for the impact to California red-legged frog and riparian cover, you can uh, plant, plant at Antonelli Pond, which is a place that is known to have California red-legged frog. So during our review period, we did receive several comments. Um, including from the Coastal Commission, the Monterey Bay Air Resource District, the Sierra Club, and from individuals, uh, 96 individuals in support and 10 in opposition. Um, we reviewed all those letters and responded to the Coastal Commission, Monterey Bay Air Resource District, and the Sierra Club with letters addressing their concerns on October 31st. Um, and we, the city concluded that uh, the comments raised in the letter did not rise to a level of significance. Um, however, we did identify that there was one comment about the monarch butterfly um, that warranted a recirculation of the ISMND um, to address the potential impacts on that species um, from the removal of the one eucalyptus tree in the grove. So based on that comment, um, we did do a recirculation of the ISMND, um, and we took it as, as an opportunity to also update the ISMND with um, some analysis that we did for air quality impacts, as well as um, updating the project to reflect the uh, realignment that reduced the number of trees to be removed. Um, so we uh, published that recirculated ISMND on January 7th, 2019, and it was circulated until February 6, 2019. So that document um, did have an additional analysis for monarch butterfly. So we included a, um, an analysis that identified that construction impacts could be mitigated to a less than significant level through uh, pre-construction measures. So we added another mitigation measure that said, before construction happens, you'll look at the site and identify if there's any monarch butterflies there. And if there are and if they're not, you will do these, these measures accordingly. Um, and we also concluded in there that the loss of the one tree would not rise to that threshold of significance of substantially adversely affecting a species. So we, the way that we came up with that conclusion was by looking at background information um, and I, um, site visits that identified that the site was not a significant overwint overwintering population, there weren't nectar sources, um, that there would be a loss of one, trees, one tree compared to the more than 40 trees that are there, which represents a 5% loss of the total grove size. So taking all that into account, we concluded a less than significant impact um, on this species from the removal of that one tree. So that's how we came up with that conclusion. Um, so during that second review period of that recirculated ISMND, we did receive further comments from the Monterey Bay Air Resource District, the Sierra Club, and from individuals, 36 in support and three in opposition. Um, and the comments that were received were predominantly focused on aesthetics, biological resources, including monarch butterfly habitat, hydrological resources, climate change and alternatives. And based on the review of the comments, again, we identified that uh, these impacts did not rise to a level of significance. And um, that, that was all documented in our correspondence. So in summary, um, I would just say that the ISMND was prepared taking into consideration the CEQA thresholds of substantially adversely affecting um, a resource. And conclusions were made based on uh, the evidence that we, that we were able to obtain. And that's all documented in our, in our document as well as in our correspondence, which you've had the time to review. And I'd also just like to reiterate that this project would result in better beneficial environmental impacts, including that which I mentioned about California red -legged frog, as well as um, uh, greenhouse gas reductions, which was also documented in the ISMND. So um, that's it for me. If you have further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. So in the Planning Commission staff report on page nine of that report, I've listed 57 general plan goals, policies, or actions that support the development of the rail trail. There's also three specific LCP, local coastal plan policies that support the trail. And although the, this is outside of the Neary Lagoon management agents, uh, management uh, plan <coughs> boundaries, um, there are three objectives and policies in the Neary Lagoon management plan that support um, this project. So again, those are on page nine. I didn't want to list them all in your staff report, but we attached the Planning Commission staff report and you can see those on page nine. <clears throat> so um, in summary, the, um, this phase two of segment seven would be the third uh, leg of the whole Western sides uh, trail. That would be a, a off street bicycle trail. 
The project will reduce transportation related to energy use, greenhouse gas generation, and it'll pri provide an equitable and sustainable alternative to coastal access for pedestrians, bicyclists, and the disabled. And that last slide is our recommendation. So the recommendation uh, to the city council is to deny the appeal and adopt the mitigated negative declaration, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and approve the coastal design slope modification variance and the heritage tree removals based on the findings that are listed in your draft resolution. So that concludes our presentation. Chris wants to show his um, video and then we're available for any questions. is used specifically to turn the train around. And uh, currently, Roaring Camp has tractor rights 1,000 feet up into towards Neary Lagoon, past Neary Lagoon, and up to essentially the area where um, the treatment plant starts. And if you were to look up on, um, you know, Bay Street, it's about where Liberty Street uh, comes in. Better fast forward a little bit here. Um, as the, the train goes past the Y, you can see over here this, um, this green roof. That's essentially Railroad Bob area where the, uh, where the uh, turnout will be for uh, vehicles that maintain the path or uh, for emergency services. Um, just recently, I think it was yesterday, the day before, there was actually a fire in the Neary Lagoon section adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, which was a uh, you know issue issue started with illegal camping, um, and did have it have you know it's where a lot of the main power source comes in for the treatment plant. So it's another reason the more eyes that we have on the path, the more public use, the better uh, things work. So as you can see, it backed all the way up in order to do the train to uh, for the train. This is not the longest train that they have. They have. Um, busier season, they have um, also uh, uh, trains that are for corporate events, et cetera. It has to get past the switch in order to make, um, to flip it and turn it. Um, the CEO with uh, Roaring Camp was uh, going to attend but had an emergency and could not. Uh, she wanted to make sure that she noted that uh, they were supportive of the trail and that this has been uh, active use, an active line for them for uh, many years. Back through uh, the roundabout to the, um, to the boardwalk. Um, the last piece of the report is the fiscal impact, and currently there's $2 million dedicated as a local match for a future grant. The grant from Prop 68 that you heard about today doesn't require a local match, and if we're successful then this local match, which is a million from the city's Measure D and a million from the Regional Transportation Commission's Measure D uh, can be dedicated to um, other portions of the rail trail. Um, we also have another opportunity in the, in the near future uh, to apply for another grant um, for this project. And one of the things that's uh, really important to have these days for um, a grant application is the matching money um, and the approved permits and environmental, uh, certified environmental document. And uh, without those, it's very difficult to get grants. Um, one question came up about what if the city were required to do an EIR. The EIR is estimated to cost about 200,000 and in the staff report says six to 12 months to prepare and the public process. I've been told uh, by a number of people that I'm overly optimistic and that it would actually take uh, quite a bit longer. Right, Mike? Yeah. 
Um, anyway, so that concludes my, uh, our presentation. Uh, Guy Preston with the Regional Transportation Commission, uh, which has uh, prepared the master plan and is an important funding partner in this, would like to say uh, something before we uh, get into this. Hi, uh, thank you for the profession, uh, professional courtesy uh, by your city manager to allow me to come and address the city council and thank you for uh, listening to me today. The RTC started um, dedicating funds to the Segment 7 project in 2013, a month after the RTC completed and adopted a master plan for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network. The Coastal Rail Trail forms the spine of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. Segment 7 is one of the highest priority projects of the 20 segments identified in the plan. RTC also completed and certified a programmatic EIR on the master plan to help streamline implementation and environmental clearance of future projects. RTC is pleased with the partnership of the City of Santa Cruz and the great care that the City of Santa Cruz took in improving the project beyond its description in the master plan. The segment seven phase two environmental document shows impacts as being less than significant with mitigations offered for potential impacts. I wanna echo what, what Chris and your environmental team has said with respect to the quality of mitigation. The quality of mitigation that you see in this project is far superior to the impacts that you have in an area which is much degraded. Additionally, the city of Santa Cruz adopted the RTC's master plan in March 2015. RTC appreciates the city's commitment to deliver the city's portion of the coastal rail trail as a bicycle and pedestrian path within or adjacent to the rail right of way that is separated from motor vehicle traffic. I also recently attended one of our um, elderly and disabled committee meetings and they emphasized the importance of this segment of the trail because the alternative right now is to go up West Cliff, which has a serious grade and a lot of them cannot maneuver um, going up West Cliff. I also ride my bike over to West Side quite a bit and it's very congested and this segment of the trail would provide significant relief and, and an alternative for bicyclists that would be much safer off of the street network and um, um, at, at a grade that is more um, uh, favorable for elderly and disabled people. I also want to um, emphasize something that your city manager mentioned and that's grant funding. The RTC is working with the city to obtain grants and one of the first questions always asked is does the project have environmental clearance? There is going to be significant competition for grant funding and I would like to see some of those state and, and federal funds brought to Santa Cruz County so we can complete the coastal rail trail. Thank you for allowing me to address the commission and let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so that, that concludes, I believe the staff uh, portion of the uh, appeal here, public hearing here today, is that I had, I had tallied the uh, comments that we got since uh, yesterday and it looks like approximately we got 87 emails that were basically in favor. One of those emails had a petition that was signed by 520 people in favor of the project and we had 15 emails that were concerned with the project or against it. Okay. That concludes our presentation. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before we uh, have an opportunity to hear from our appellants, I'll go ahead and see if there's any uh, clarifying uh, questions that the council may have at this time, um, knowing that you could also ask them at a future time. Question. Question, Councilmember Myers. Uh, just a question for the environmental consultant. You mentioned that the Coastal Commission had uh, submitted a comment letter, I think, on the first version of the ISMND. That's Do correct. you? I, I've been looking through the hundreds of pages of material, but I could you could you just summarize what what that letter uh, included, please? Um, I I would have to take a look at that one again. Okay. Yeah, I know that that. Um, some of the comments didn't have anything to do with the initial study. They also uh, were interested in seeing uh, different alternatives sort of brought forward in the staff report, even though that, that wasn't a requirement. Um, and they were also interested in making sure that we looked through the Neary Lagoon plan to make sure that uh, some of the policies in that plan didn't conflict with this project. 
And that's sort of what we highlighted in the staff report. I don't remember if there I was- I think they also had some questions, clarifications about um, visual renderings of the retaining walls and how those look like. Um, so we sent those, mostly clarifying questions um, and similar questions concerning biological resource impacts and uh, because the coastal permit does have requirements having to do with uh, tree um, tree plantings. I believe that's that as well. I can try to find that for you. I don't have that printed with me because as you said, there's, a, there's you. a lot, yeah. Any additional clarifying questions for staff at this time? Okay, Vice Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation um, from all folks who presented today. I was just curious, um, what was the initial rationale for um, moving forward with a mitigated ne negative deck um, as opposed to an EIR? Well, um, I, I can try answering that because I wasn't, I'm, what I am aware of is that because no impacts were found to rise to a level of significance, that all impacts could be mitigated to a less than significant level, then that's, that. And, and since an ISMND allows that, that that's what was moved forward with. Yeah. Okay, seeing no additional questions at this time, thank you. We'll go ahead and um, allow for our appellants to address the council at this time. And uh, you will have a total of 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of your appeal. I also um, will uh, note that you will have a opportunity after public comment um, to provide a five minute rebuttal, at which time you will not um, be allowed to introduce any new uh, information. And um, would you like the time broken up for in between or how how would you like to share the time between the two of you thanks for asking um we i'm going to speak and then uh, jillian will speak and so if you would maybe stop the clock as we shift that would be very helpful okay so the clock will be uh set for 15 minutes and then when there's that transition time we'll go ahead and pause the time as you shift your presentation okay Thank you very much. I think I know many of you, but for those who don't know me, I'm Rachel O'Malley. I'm here because we agree. We agree on a lot of things. We agree that we're in a climate crisis, and we also agree we're in a biodiversity crisis. We agree that we need to get out of our cars. We support Vision Zero. We support the rail. We support the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Signet Trail. But even good projects require trade-offs. We all agree that everything we do affects our natural environment. We always have to consider the climate, and we have to also consider biodiversity. We are in a biodiversity crisis. How do we do that? Here in Santa Cruz, it's through our environmental review process. We evaluate impacts, and we avoid or mitigate the ones that we can. That's what our code says. We also have the Environmental Quality Act you've heard about right now, and the coastal permit requirements. The Environmental Quality Act is interesting because it's about disclosure to the public and public participation. It is also about minimizing damage to the environment and disclosing effects and also disclosing what the decision makers are doing, right? So it's about democracy. The coastal permit, fortunately, also protects vegetation and natural habitats and natural resources. So that's a second layer that we get to go through. We all agree, again, on those values. This is what we all believe in, everyone sitting here. Quickly, CEQA requirements, the initial study, you've heard a little bit about, that's to decide. Are we doing a negative declaration if there's no potential impacts, or an EIR if there are potentially significant impacts? Okay, that's the, the standard of the law. If it's potentially significant, do an EIR. EIR also analyzes alternatives that avoid impacts, which a mitigated, mitigated NIGDEC, as you just heard, does not. A project can't be considered until the final environmental documents are complete. So this project, sorry, I'm going so fast, I have five, seven minutes. The proposed project, you've heard about it already. This is essentially replacing the repair, this riparian corridor with that wall you just saw. We all agree that building it in the natural areas will have some impacts. The question is, are they significant? Your staff says no. I believe we've shown yes. What's the difference? The thresholds of significance. Your staff has told you about the first one. It, the effect on a species that's sensitive or candidate or special status and their mitigations protect them from construction but not from permanent loss of habitat. That's what I'm talking about. There are other thresholds that CEQA requires us to look at, not just the sensitive species. The first one, which would be biological resources B, is riparian habitat that has been delineated like near a lagoon, big lagoon, our best freshwater wetland, right? I believe, based on my professional experience, that the proposed mitigations are inadequate and do not sufficiently describe the impacts on near a lagoon. 
More important, there are two other areas of biological resources that CEQA requires us to look at. The first one is the unnamed creeks, right? The ones that we found here when we were looking at our site for the first time. And this was new to me as well. I hadn't been there until I went. We all agree, including your staff, that the project will eliminate just under an acre of wetland. Oops, I can't go back. That's okay, but it's degraded. There are no wetlands left in California that are pristine. So even destruction of a human influence wetland should be considered significant. In fact, the EIR for the whole rail trail included that, that even if it's not mapped, an artifact of the construction of the railroad corridor, they're still under the jurisdiction of the Coastal Commission and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. That's from the EIR we did not use. The EIR we did not use from the master plan said that impacts include loss of habitat and habitat degradation and erosion of, from erosion of those dis, uh, disturbed beds. So the actions that we did use in our document, which was not that document, we specifically did not tear off it, are about frogs and pond turtles, individuals, and about avoiding them when we see them. What I'm talking about is restoring the habitat we're paving over and also restoring hydrologic function, not just specific individual species. So there are two other, there's, there's one other important threshold that CEQA requires us to look at, which is movement of resident and migratory species. That's not your special status named, listed, blah, blah, blah. This is actually part of the threshold. Again, the mitigations are focused on special status species and they talk about construction and they talk about, but they don't cover loss of the habitat. Now, you've heard that the photo of a gray fox is not substantive evidence that there are corridors here. As a biologist, I'm sorry, it's hard to get a photo of a gray fox. Similarly, it's all disturbed and, and you know, non-natives. You just saw poison oak and willow thickets, lots of small, live oak canopy, we actually have a fair amount of natives supporting interesting native birds, very important native birds, and even some of the invasives. We've been told, well, the ivy, which is generally awful, isn't supporting monarchs because it's not fruiting. Well, I actually took this photo in the corridor. It is flowering. It is supporting monarchs. We haven't measured it. Sorry. The last thing, mandatory findings, the very last category of the secret checklist. Cumulative impacts. This document should have tiered off of the master plan document. Instead, it used the city plan, which doesn't cover the whole project. So we should have done an EIR. We should do an EIR. It could have significant impacts on the environment. I have 30 years of experience doing this. I can tell you this should have had an EIR. So what do we do now? At this point, it, the fastest thing to do would just be to do the EIR. It's the right thing to do. We all care about the environment. If we defend the inadequate NEGDEC, it can go all the way into 2020. The California Coastal Commission will hear appeals on this. It's appealable to the Coastal Commission. They care a lot about wetlands. They want us to avoid it. They want us to look at alternatives. You've heard we've looked at the alternatives, but remember the disclosure part. Remember the public part. That's what the EIR is about. We actually have to look at the alternatives systematically in an organized way. We do have alternatives. We agree. We're in a climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, and in Santa Cruz, we're also in a biological hotspot. Look at the United States in that picture. We are it. We need to work together. Measure twice, cut once. We only have one planet. Please request an EIR before you make your final decision. You? Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready to proceed. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mayor Watkins, City Council members, Gillian Greenside. We are here today to appeal to you to reject the mitigated negative declaration for the project before you and direct staff to prepare an environmental impact report for the pros proposed project, segment seven, phase two of the rail trail, or as the birds, butterflies and the gray fox call it, home. This project has the potential to impact the natural environment significantly. 
California law requires that significant impacts be disclosed to decision makers and the public before you make a decision about the project. The document before you, an MND, is used only for projects that could not significantly impact the environment. An EIR is needed to fully assess and prevent or minimize damage to the environment <coughs> by means of project alternatives, mitigation measures, and mitigation monitoring. Additional mitigation and alternatives to lessen the impacts outlined have not been considered. Defending the MND and approving this project as proposed would expose the city to legal risk, bureaucratic delays, and additional cost. An EIR can be far shorter and cheaper than is suggested in the agenda report. At the last Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, the director estimated that the EIR for the entire parks master plan could be completed in a six month time frame at a cost of $40,000. The project before you today is less than a mile in length and some environmental work has already been done. The Regional Transportation Commission's EIR for the entire rail trail contains mitigations that the city could use for this segment, although they decline to tear it off that. Preparing an EIR will get the project up and running most quickly. Defending this flawed MND will result at least in an appeal to the California Coastal Commission. The CCC has an urgent interest in protecting remaining wetlands and riparian habitat and is likely to accept an appeal. We support the rail trail. We thank Mayor Watkins for representing the city at the upcoming climate meeting. We all support getting folks out of our cars. We also need to acknowledge when we are sacrificing the natural environment to achieve this end and fully mitigate what we can. We must achieve the goals of the project while simultaneously protecting this habitat area. We all agree, as people who care about the environment, that environmental review must be consistent for all projects, the ones we do support as well as the ones we don't. To point out a few inadequacies in the MND before you, the conclusion that this is a low quality riparian habitat by the city's biologist is directly contradicted by the evidence we submitted. The MND uses regional databases rather than on-site observation. We provided a 110 page submission of evidence by biologist Dr. Rachel O'Malley, PhD, documenting that this project has significant impacts on the environment. On request, the city said none of its biologist's reports was available. CEQA requires that an EIR be completed when experts have differing opinions and there is public controversy which applies here. An EIR is necessary for a proper traffic circulation study to assess safety and VMT, vehicle miles traveled reduction, associated with the project. The impact of great numbers of bicyclists on the wharf roundabout, an already impacted intersection, should be studied. Moving the wharf kiosks would only speed cars up, not good for bicyclists or pedestrians. Alignment of bike trails is important. However, this alignment does not connect to Westcliff Drive, nor allow easy access from the lower west side streets that butt into Bay Street and the Bay Street bike paths. An EIR would allow a thorough examination of alternatives, alternatives which exist and avoid both La Barranca Park and the steep Dream Hill Hill, Dream Inn Hill, but they have not been carefully evaluated. The conclusion from our staff and consultants is that, quote, the project would not significantly change the conditions relative to existing conditions. This is hard to fathom. Consider that this three quarter mile project involves the removal of 42 trees, 16 of them heritage trees, the removal of thousands of cubic yards of soil, 
the removal of all undergrowth and brush habitat, all nectar sources for the myriad of butterflies observed on the trail, covering the soil with a 12 foot wide, three quarter of a mile long impervious service trail, erecting a 54 inch wire fence on one side and a three to 19 feet high retaining wall on the other. Introducing lights, security cameras, and hundreds of humans into this habitat. And the conclusion is no significant change. This is a change from a sylvan oasis into an urban corridor, complete with mechanical light-operated monarchs, as is proposed in the Arts Master Plan. In conclusion, we ask that you vote to reject the mitigated negative declaration for this project and direct your staff to begin, begin preparation of an EIR as quickly as possible to lay the groundwork for a rail trail project <coughs> that meets both human and habitat needs, which in the long run are all connected. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our responding applicant, which I have here as Leo Mena, uh, and you'll have uh, 15 minutes to speak and present any evidence at this time, and or staff, I believe. Okay, so um, you'll have up to 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna try to respond to everything that was mentioned. And I will just say that most of the answers that, um, or most of what I'm going to be discussing is already in the record as a part of our correspondence. So um, I'll begin with um, the question around tiering. Um, why did we not tier from the, um, from the uh, EIR for the master plan? And I'll just say that there is no requirement for a lead agency to tier from from this, the city has the ultimate discretion to make that decision. And in this case, they decided to make um, the decision to do a complete analysis of the project in an ISMND, um, use, re, re, uh, and doing, doing so by um, analyzing all potential impacts according to the CEQA guidelines. Okay, so I hope that clarifies that. Um, and I'll just read to you exactly what, we, what, what our response says. The letter correctly identifies that the recirculated ISMND does not include the mitigation measures from the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Plan fi Final EIR. The city is, as a lead agency, uses discretion to not tier from this final EIR. The city crafted mitigation for habitat loss based on site-specific considerations. Specifically, mitigation for the impacts on the disturbed riparian habitat was crafted based on consultation with Caltrans during the NEPA process, who in turn consulted with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and determined that the proposed mitigation of planting willows around Antonelli Pond was sufficient to mitigate the impact. And that's from the letter dated April 29, 2019. Um, the next thing that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss is the question around wetlands and site observations. We did do site observations that's documented in our, um, in our ISMND as well as in our correspondence where we did go to the site um, as recently as, um, I'll have to look at my notes, but you know, uh, before our correspondence in, in, in April to see the site where the um, monarch butterfly habitat was going to be, be lost in 2019. So um, our conclusions are based on not just what the what records, but also <coughs> field, re, field reviews, and that's all documented in the ISMND as well as our, our NES, uh, the Natural Environment Study. In terms of wetlands, um, a site assessment was done um, to identify whether any wetlands would be affected by this proce project. What was what was identified was that the area south of the south of the um, site, due to uh, the vegetation there and the ordinary high water mark. Um, that area was classified as a riparian land cover. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about impacts of the 0.93 acres that would be affected by this project, which is classified as riparian land cover and which we have qualified as low quality due to its separation from the railroad track, the presence of uh, non-native vegetation, and um, again, it's, uh, it's the location of the ornate high water mark. Um, the next thing that I will, um, 
address to you is the question around the loss of the riparian land cover. Um, Again, our conclusion was based on whether this project would result in a substantial adverse effect um, on riparian habitat, but as well as as well as special set of species, and that's documented in our correspondence as well. We looked at the quality of the site, the whole site, Neri Lagoon. We looked at the 0 0.93 acres located on the south side of the railroad between, well, there's a, between the lagoon and south of that is La Barranca Park, so considering all that, this narrow strip of vegetation that is that we calculated to be a total of 2.2 acres, that which we then identified we would um, affect 0 0.93 acres. Considering that we did include mitigation for the restoration of habitat off-site, the reason we, we, we did, haven't done it on-site is because there's not there's no space. So we're looking off-site to mitigate that that rate, that that impact at a three to one ratio, not a one to one ratio, not a two to one ratio, but three times um, the effect. I will um, <coughs> continue with talking about. Um, Um, I'll just I'll I'll add about the question about um, VMT and greenhouse gases. We did receive a comment that that we didn't account for the project's impact on greenhouse gases, and um, in our correspondence, we've documented that not this project will. Uh, mitigate trees at a one to one, two to one, and three to one ratio, which would offset the impact from any kind of carbon loss due to the removal of trees, as well as the um, overall reduction in uh, vehicle trips, as well as the fact that this project is um, supported in the uh, climate action plan. Um, there, was a, there was a question about, or there was a, there was a comment about lights and the effect of lights on species. That's again something that was included in the document and included as an anal analysis in the document as well as in our correspondence. We've identified mitigation measure and our aesthetics impacts that would require the screening of lights so that it's located on the rail and not um, disseminating um, far from it. So again, that is something that we have considered and that we've documented in our uh, document. Um, the, the, the question about the, to converting this into an urban corridor. This, this area is already in an urban area. It's in the middle of city, the, the city of Santa Cruz next to a wastewater treatment plant, next to an active railroad, and next to a uh, park, and next to homes as well. So um, I'd, I'd just like to say that this place is already in an urban area, and our 0 0.93 loss of riparian habitat, considering everything that I've mentioned, um, would not exceed that threshold of significance. Um, I think that's that's it. Is there? Um, and that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Just um, one response to something about moving the kiosk at the wharf. That's not in this plan. Okay. All we are is tying into the existing roundabout, and that the the crossing of pedestrians and bike was already contemplated, and known about when the design of the roundabout was done. So it's taken into consideration. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, we um, will go ahead and have our opportunity for a public comment to occur. What that will look like is we'll go ahead and start, since there's two uh, approved uh, extra time organizations speaking, they'll go ahead and go first for the four minutes. Then we'll go ahead and open it up to individuals who would like to address the council, even just briefly in one minute, and then those that would like to address the council within the two minute time frame. So we'll start with Gina Cole, who is the new executive director of Bike Santa Cruz County, and Gina, you'll have up to four minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you for honoring the request. Mayor Watkins, uh, city council members, city manager and staff. Uh, my name is Gina Cole, and I thank you. I am the new executive director at Bike Santa Cruz County. Uh, this is my sixth day on the job, and I feel as though the past week has been a crash course in all things Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, I kind of feel like I'm back in college again. I'm here today representing our group. We are here to encourage you to deny the appeal of the Planning Commission's decision to move forward with Segment 7, Phase 2. The mission of Bike Santa Cruz County is to promote bicycling. How can we best accomplish this? by supporting the actions and the projects that make it safer and easier for people to ride their bikes. 
The Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail will do just this, providing sanctuary for folks who are intimidated by riding on streets that were created for cars, to have a relatively level surface to get from point A to point B, to entice folks, especially youth and families, outside, away from their phones and their computers, um, to access nature that is close to their home, to their work, and to their school to reduce the barriers of steep hills and heavy traffic that may leave people unwilling to even try to ride their bike or walk as a means of transportation. In doing this, we reduce the human impact on the environment. We increase community health and well-being, and most importantly, we increase the health and the well-being of our youth. As a Watsonville native, I am impressed with the walkability of Santa Cruz. From my office, I was easily able to walk here today. What was not super easy was riding my bike to Santa Cruz from my home this morning. I found myself seeking some solace from the commuting madness that is Freedom Boulevard and SoCal Avenue. I veered off the heavily trafficked roadway, pedaled through Capitola, and up um, the bike bypass, the bike and pedestrian bypass there by Knob Hill. I ran up Clare Street and I wove through the neighborhoods in Live Oak via a um, bike and pedestrian friendly passageways over to Bromer that has a really great bike lane through the calm of Arana Gulch. Only joining the fray again at Branza 40 and being able to just slide back down into my office. The moments where I could relax a little bit on my bike not to be on heightened alert the entire time, watching for cars, watching for trucks and for buses. Those moments were the sweet spots in my commute this morning. All neighborhoods, all residents deserve access to those sweet spots on their commute from work, to and from work, to and from school, to and from shopping or play. Segment seven, phase two, is a little more than a half mile of sweetness. It has the ability to link the residents of Beach Flats with easier access to their school, to their work, to shopping, and to play. To enjoy the area that they live in a little bit more. To help people start thinking about how they can navigate the city without getting into a car every single time to create a new mindset for our youth. It's reshaping the norm. We believe that the city has done its due diligence in studying the information. Thank you. Is that four? That's four, and you're welcome to leave the, any comments you like and we can review okay. them also. Thank okay. you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for having me today. Sure. We'll go ahead and now invite up Erica Stranovich. Excuse me if I, sorry, Stranovic? No worries, it's Stanovic. Oh, well, okay, there you go. Thank you very much from the Sierra Club. And you'll have also four minutes. Thank you so much. So my name is Erica Stanovic and I represent the Sierra Club um, and I'm conservation committee chair, which is why I'm doing so. And I really wanna emphasize that the Sierra Club really loves the idea of reducing vehicle miles traveled. We want the rail trail to succeed because we completely agree with Bike Santa Cruz County that it's hard to ride your bikes out there. However, we are not talking about a segment that actually addresses Highway 1 traffic. We're talking about Section 7, Segment 2, which is nowhere near the Highway 1 traffic impacts that we're attempting to address. This will actually pretty much be an excursion train piece of the, of the um, ride. So, um, and we really wanna make sure that this is the best possible project. Um, we aren't looking for a mediocre project. We wanna make sure that this project succeeds fully so it actually reduces traffic the whole length of the trail. Um, and because of that, we really cannot ignore the fact that this is riparian habitat. This is, um, 
and cumulative riparian habitat throughout the rail trail project needs to be addressed. The environmental documents do not address the cumulative impact of all the riparian habitat that will be lost along the rail trail. And the section here really does not do an adequate job addressing the riparian habitat loss. The other thing is that this is a wildlife corridor and that must also be addressed. I am really bothered by the argument that because this area is not completely pristine, that therefore it's okay to further degrade the habitat. And excuse the metaphor, but to me it seems like having somebody who's been abused their whole life and say, hey, you know, it's okay, you've been abused before, let me keep abusing you. And, and that's just really how it occurs to me. So I really hope that we get away from this idea that just because land is not pristine, that it doesn't deserve our protection and the hope that it will be increased in biodiversity. All of our land needs to be healed. The protections that have been mentioned in the do environmental documents are not sufficient and mostly only address construction impacts. They do not address long-term impacts. For example, there's some replacement habitat mentioned and there's some token reference to three to one riparian habitat reference. However, I really wanna be, I'm concerned about that because there are many projects which are slated to have riparian habitat be mitigated and addressed and replaced. However, the mitigations do not necessarily actually happen. Jesse Street Marsh in our backyard is one of those, um, one such project that is very much associated with the replacement of the Neary Lagoon, um, the yeah, the Neary Lagoon Park and Jesse Street Marsh was never restored as the city had promised to do. And furthermore, the three to one, as staff mentioned, yes, the, there's a three to one standard for habitat replacement that is because immature wetlands is not equal to mature wetlands. So that is of course needed. However, I think we need to make sure it actually happens. And the reality is that there may be other return alternatives that are cost effective and produce a better project. And those need, those options need to be evaluated. The expensive retaining wall, which will damage the ability for wildlife to migrate through there, may not be necessary. The wall will also affect drainage patterns, which will further degrade the riparian habitat. There's ample room on Bay and La Barranca Park, and if a route up along that street was used, that would lead to better connectivity for residents. Your time is up, but you're welcome to leave your comments, um, but that is concludes for four minutes. Okay, thank you. So at this point, we'll open up to any individuals who want to address the council on this item. What I'll do is ask if anybody briefly wants to address us, uh, please uh, line up to my left and you'll have an opportunity to do so in one minute. And if you'd like to uh, address us in the two minutes, you're welcome to do so. We'll go ahead and have you do that after the one minute timeline. So if anybody just wants to briefly address the council, I know that many of you have been here uh, waiting, uh, please do so. You'll have one minute and if, if there's nobody who wants the one minute, then we'll go ahead and open it up to the two minutes. So, interest in the one minute here, okay. Good afternoon, I'll, I'll do my best to do one minute. My name is Bob Morgan, and as a representative of the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation, we urge you to move uh, forward with um, the advocacy for a um, mitigate, or rather a declaration of a non-EIR uh, review. We walked the corridor, this segment seven, with uh, Rachel O'Malley, and um, we had a very healthy discussion after walking both that corridor as well as the Bay and um, West Cliff Drive proposed parallel project. We felt that that project was not satisfactory. We do believe that this segment seven project will indeed enhance um, the uh, potential for bike riders and pedestrians, and we urge you to act quickly and efficiently and um, approve this negative declaration. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else within one minute? Please, okay. Mayor Watkins, uh, council members. My name is Saladin Sale. My wife uh, and I live on Western Drive and we're 50 plus year county residents. We're also longtime Sierra Club members. 
I speak today to urge your denial of the appeal of the Planning Commission's unanimous approval of Phase 2, Section 7 of the Coastal Trail. At this time, the city faces a number of very serious challenges, <coughs> budget, housing, homelessness among them. The rail trail is a singular bright spot where a civic improvement project has been unanimously approved and results are already becoming apparent. We love the new bike and pedestrian crossing of the San Lorenzo River on the uh, train trestle. Approval of phase two of section seven will complete the last critical link between the east side, west side, and Wilder Ranch and the parklands beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for the one minute time frame? Uh, my name is Tom Fredericks. I um, have attended RTC meetings in the development of the rail trail project. I attended uh, the city's planning meeting um, in, 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 uh, in advance of this meeting. And um, I, I'm basically an observer. And uh, what I take away from what I've seen so far is that this could be the biggest public works project in the county. It's a protected transportation corridor that goes from one end to the other. And I really got that when I went to the opening of the trestle bridge. I really got that this is away from traffic. It's safe and it has a multitude, multitude of uses. <coughs> and those uses are, uh, the, tra the trail and the rail benefit the least expensive modes of transportation. Thank you. Okay. And if there's no one else who wants to address us in the one minute, okay, please step forward. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Matt Farrell. I live uh, on the east side of Santa Cruz, and I urge you to deny the appeal and approve segment section of the rail corridor uh, based on the experience of what Arana Gulch has done for our community on the east side, I think this will be a similar benefit to the west side of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Okay. I don't believe I see anybody else who wants to address us briefly within the one minute timeline. So we'll go ahead and open it up now for up to two minutes. Hi. Thank you for having us here. I am Kersha Durham and I'm a longtime veteran environmentalist and, and I'm an active transportation expert. Even sold my car and have biked around the county for 14 years. But I'm coming here just having have served as the chair of the Santa Cruz Transportation Commission when you had a, a city transportation commission and from my many years serving on the Climate Action Task Force and that is my goal. I agree with my colleagues, Erica, Rachel, Jillian, but I do not agree with the strategy because we have this urgency, this overarching urgency of the climate crisis and I think we need to act like yesterday um, we are experiencing, you just have to step outside. The last month, I've been pelted with, um, on my bicycle, winter cold, rock-sized hail pieces on my back. In late May, thunderstorms, all right, extreme heat. I think I'm talking to people who agree that climate change is now, it's happening. It threatens a larger area, our beautiful redwood forests that rely on fog, are not getting the fog they need to survive. Um, we need to change our behavior now. Listen to people like Greta from Sweden, specifically car driving. I know about transportation in the city of Santa Cruz and the county. That's the biggest and largest contributor to climate crisis is car driving. And we need extreme measures to get people to convince them to change this behavior and get out of their cars. So how do we do that? I sat where you're sitting before and I listened to hours and hours and years of testimony, people saying, I don't feel safe to get out of my car. I need an off-road path. Studies support this. People need an off-road path. I think I applaud the staff for listening to my colleagues' concerns. The one thing I would add is maybe they could meet with them one more time and just address specific refinements to better the design. But don't delay this. I myself have waited 26 years, waited 30 for Rana Gulch, and similar, this is so similar to Rana Gulch where we were divided. So please, don't delay it. Thank Move you. it forward. Okay, next speaker.
Hi, I'm uh, Eleanor Mendoza. I just graduated high school. I'm also an intern at Bike Santa Cruz County. I'm not here representing Bike Santa Cruz County, though I'm here representing the uh, high schoolers and middle schoolers who I just left behind. I, yeah, as a young person in Santa Cruz and as a person with a lot of little cousins and a little sister, there's a really huge need for uh, bike lanes and better bike facilities in Santa Cruz. I see this most urgently with my younger sister who is at home right now with all of her friends playing pickup sticks in my living room because they can't get farther than the boardwalk on their bikes. They don't feel safe riding on Seabright or Broadway or Mission or Bay or SoCal. Um, that's, that's about it. So this is not just, um, this. Is, this is urgent. This is not something that can really be delayed any longer. Thank you. Hello, hello, good afternoon. My name is Mary Odegaard. And I agree with Eleanor, because um, uh, I work with children and it is really, I, when I work with children, I walk and bike everywhere with them. I also bike everywhere I possibly can. But especially when I'm with the children, it's so much better to be uh, safely away from the automobile. And this is an opportunity to see this happen in our county. This segment's really important. Another aspect of the segment that you've heard, but I'll reiterate it, is that there's a 3% grade that the railroad lines have used to put in. Wherever they are, they don't, deviate much from that. And so that makes it good for people that are ADA and needs. Um, it's it's uh, really important. And I, um, I um, want to thank the city and the staff and all the people that have put in efforts to address a lot of the concerns that have been brought towards up to mitigate the environmental degradation. But I also know that as a railroad line, they spray, 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 spray to kill everything along there. This is gonna be an improvement. There's gonna be more life along that line. I also know that um, in that neighborhood on a Sunday morning about a month ago, I saw a gray fox crossing California Avenue. The creatures are out there with more people walking and riding and out of the automobile, which this is gonna encourage the creatures are gonna have a safer time and they're gonna be out there with us. And it's so sweet. So I really recommend that you deny the appeal and move forward. And I also am a Sierra Club member for a long time and I really wanna see this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mike Posner, Sierra Club member. Um, first, I just wanna say that I do respect the appellants. I really appreciate how much they care about wetlands. We have a large degraded wetland at the Jesse Street March, which could be an active habitat, and I urge the council at another meeting to work better on, on recovering that. Um, but I don't like that they say they support the rail trail because the rail trail is a specific thing. The rail trail is a trail along the rail line. And we've been working for that for 15 years to identify that, to gather support for it, to map it. So if you, don't, if you want the trail somewhere else, you might care about bikes and the environment, but you don't support the rail trail. And, and most people do. I mean, notice that you got a, about 1,000 comments and you got about 20 against. I mean, this is a 98% approval rating for the staff, for the city. Like, that never happens, right, Cynthia? You don't have 98% of people come and say, we support you, we want you to do this. That's, that's unheard of. And that's the history of the rail trail. The appellants, um, talk about EIRs in the sense that we should do an EIR for every change to a degraded habitat, but I don't think that's the intent of environmental law. Under that logic, you'd have to do an EIR when you added a bedroom to your house or when you replaced a sewer line. I mean, this is a gravel-filled, creosote-filled railroad corridor with a road embankment on one side and a sewer treatment plan on the other. Will it change? Yes. Is it, a, is it anywhere near pristine habitat? No. People have said this is similar to Rana Gulch, but it's not. Rana Gulch was a much nicer habitat and Rana Gulch had significant opposition. This is 2% opposition. So just to start to read some of the people that don't usually come out to support city <coughs> projects who are on record for this, um, Foster from Ride a Wave, Edgar from the Beach Flats Community Center, Ann Simonton, Roland Sayer, Peter Scott, Chris Connerly, Matilda Rand. The CSFT letter was signed by Rick Longinotti and Bruce 
Van Allen, Jeffrey Smedberg, Ron Pomerantz, Micah Posner. These are people that are dubious of city projects, but in this particular case, we want you to go and we want you to go yesterday and build this thing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Tina Andrietta, and I have lived in Santa Cruz County since 1984. I am a Sierra Club member, and I disagree with this appeal. Um, and I am one of the many volunteers of Friends of the Rail Trail who have been tabling all over the county to share news about the rail trail in general. Our volunteers have been doing community outreach at farmer's markets and special events like Earth Day, Bike to Work Day, Open Streets, the Trestle Ribbon Coveting, and other community fairs and events. At these events, we talk to people about the rail trail and the most common comment we get is, what's taking so long? Um, this is a popular project and people are eager to make their, verses, their voices heard. And I just noticed, here's a lot of our, our, our postcards that, we, that get signed. For the, uh, for the planning commission, I just got another person that just signed one. We have delivered approximately 650 postcards in favor of segment seven, phase two, along the tracks. Since the vote in April, we have collected over 800 more postcards in favor of this project. Most of the 800 cards are from the city of Santa Cruz residents, including many from the Beach Flats residents. These are just some of the copies from the Beach Flats residents that are in favor of this. Um, and let's see, about 30% are from county residents who recognize that this segment is a part of a larger regional project. If we don't build our segments as planned, it damages the viability of the whole project. Thank you. Here's another card. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Ryan Sarnataro. Uh, I lived in Santa Cruz for quite a while. I uh, use my bicycle as my main mode of transportation here in, uh, in town. And I wanna speak in terms of the strategic vision that's involved in this decision here. And basically you're being asked to uh, pay a lot of money, create a lot of environmental destruction in the very slim hope that there will be a commuter train that runs from the Santa Cruz boardwalk to Davenport, that the voters of this county or the voters of the United States will come up with the funds to be able to make something like that happen. If you leave the tracks in place, you're forced to make these devil's choices of uh, where you end up with problematic, uh, a problematic construction. The, the vision of active transportation is one where you have a really proper divided trail where you can have slow people and you can have relatively fast people on their bicycles or their e-bikes. Uh, you have the Santa Cruz Greenway with 10,000 signatures and I'll bet half of those people also sign these green cards because the distinction between rail and trail and a rail trail, which in the United States means take out the rails and put in a trail, is not clear in people's minds. As leaders, you get the opportunity to take this higher view and look at the long run. And if you put in a narrow trail that doesn't have, like around a gulch, where you end up having people walking around each other, where people go slowly, where it becomes more dangerous, you're, what you're doing is condemning Santa Cruz County to a limited vision based on a belief that is simply not going to happen. Uh, and so I urge you, to do whatever it takes to change the discussion so that we actually get a rail trail here in Santa Cruz County that provides active transportation. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Bill Cook, I live in Santa Cruz on the west side. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the tracks are the problem. It's, uh, the presence of the tracks leave us uh, quarreling over, over the scraps, what's left behind. Uh, dimethylphenol, anisole, benzoquinone are listed as acutely toxic by the National Center for Biotechnology. They are produced by natural processes acting on coal tar creosote, itself a banned carcinogen. 
Fully 50% of our rail corridors covered in creosote treated wood in the form of railroad ties and wooden bridges spanning marsh and aquatic habitat throughout our county. Exposures by inhalation, touch, and leaching into water. These materials persist, bioaccumulate, and continue to be produced every day. To my knowledge, there is no assessment, remediation, or accountability by way of EIR, CEQA, or EPA due to the legal status of freight lines broadly known as preemption. On that basis alone, good stewardship by our local leaders would indicate the removal and remediation of what may be the greatest biohazard in our county. The plan thus far insisted upon by the RTC would increase exposure by, of thousands of people per year, proximity and exposure being determined simply by the minimum distance allowed to a moving train. Rail banking was created by the SDB to separate rail operators from the financial liability of lines that no longer pay while retaining all the legal status of preemption. PAS are allowed in the interim and is typical of how PAS are created across our nation. Over 300 miles of trail have been returned to rail service since 1993. The authority of the STB under preemption is complete and its decisions perfunctory. The existing rails are of no use for any future modern passenger rail. And you're welcome to leave your comments if you like. Hi, my, my name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos. Uh, I'm uh, co-chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail and an advocate for transit and for trails. Um, I, I come today with uh, to drop off 520 signatures, 96 comments, online uh, 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 change.org device, uh, and uh, it says, please uphold the Planning Commission's unanimous decision in support of the West Side Trail and stand by the pledges you made during your campaign. This phase, along with the just completed San Lorenzo Trail expansion, will connect all the Santa Cruz from the East Side to the Wilder Ranch. Not only that, it'll allow me to take a, to take a bike uh, to these meetings from my home in Aptos. And thousands, millions, I don't know of other people who do the same. But more importantly to me, and I've been passionate about transportation and transit forever, is those tracks are important. Anyone that tells you it's just an excursion train or that we only really want a trail is missing very important data. The tracks are there for our future for transportation. The RTC unanimously voted to pursue high capacity transit of some form uh, on that corridor. And we're building the trail now. Any attempts to get the tracks out is in my opinion misguided and can only cause delays. With respect to the, the appellant's uh, passionate work to improve the plan, I applaud them. I think the system works. I think what we've learned, if you look, and I've read the documents, uh, 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 Nathan uh, Nguyen's responses to the, to the letters uh, and the details, and I can see that a lot of work has been done to make this a, a stronger plan, a better design. And I think at the end, we end up with environmental features that leave us in better shape than we are today if we do nothing. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I'm David Van Brink, a Santa Cruz resident of uh, 31 years as of last Thursday, and a member of the uh, board of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. This is not a question of should we do an environmental review or should we not. The city and its consultants have done more than a year of environmental review. They've published environmental documents, taken input from the public, delayed the project in order to modify the project in response to those public comments, especially from the Sierra Club. Uh, expanded the scope of the review, published the expanded review of the project and its environment. Uh, this is what environmental review and public engagement looks like. The city has done exactly what it should have done. We now have another new list of concerns, another excited list of binomial species designations presented after all the others have been addressed. Uh, we can always list some more. To delay now with more review will not reveal new information. No new trade-offs will be considered or will be uh, available to consider. It would be only that, more delay on a fundamentally pro-environmental project. Their planning commission gave extensive consideration and discussion to this issue. They voted unanimously to approve the city staff's position that the lengthy environmental process conducted to date uh, should be finalized and the project should move forward. 
The city has been responsive to concerns. The project is overwhelmingly pro-environmental uh, and the public is uh, overwhelmingly supportive and eager. Um, please deny the appeal and move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Watkins, council members, uh, my name is Bruce Sawhill. I'm a Santa Cruz resident and board member of Friends of the Rail and Trail. I have three points to make quickly. Um, one is about public health and safety. This trail is not for the determined cyclists who are abundantly represented here today. It's for the cyclists to be that aren't here. The trail is to be a consistent and safe experience of refuge, free of challenges and gotchas. Detouring onto streets is like driving on the freeway and coming suddenly to a T intersection with a stop sign. Bay and Westcliff is the only place I've had a bike accident in the last 30 years. I've ridden through there hundreds of times on my way to go swim in the ocean. I would like to have an alternative. About time and money. Not only is time equivalent to money, but it is also equivalent to avoidable emissions of CO2 and other environmental impacts. If one segment of the rail trail is delayed or forced to adopt a more expensive alternative, less money is available to complete other portions of the rail trail in a timely fashion or remediate environmental impact. One isolated segment of the rail trail is like the first fax machine, remember those? It doesn't have, to ha it doesn't have a profound impact until it connects with others. Uh, segment 7B connects to the first completed segment, the brilliantly engineered cantilevered trail bridge over the San Lorenzo River. It's important. On alternatives, Descartes famously said, a difference that makes no difference is no difference. He probably said it in French. The alternatives put forth, such as using some combination of Bay Street, La Barranca, and the Dream Inn intersection have been considered and rejected on numerous grounds, too steep for ADA, too expensive, too unsafe, etc. Um, the unacceptability of these alternatives will not change with an EIR. In summary, let us seize the day and move forward with 7B. It's been seven years since we acquired the rail corridor. Deny the appeal. Time to ride. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Shellhammer. A recent article in the New York Times began with this sentence. Climate change is the greatest challenge humanity has collectively faced. The real question before you today is, are we in Santa Cruz serious about doing our part on climate change? <coughs> doing our part means, above all else, reducing carbon emissions in transportation. Because in our community, transportation is the sector that generates more carbon emissions than all others combined. The most achievable way to do that is to convert a portion of around town car trips to non-carbon alternatives like biking and walking, exactly what the trail in the rail corridor would do. Climate change calls for urgency, and we are failing the urgency test. The RTC adopted the trail master plan and environmental document five and a half years ago. A supermajority of voters approved additional funding for trail construction two and a half years ago. And so far, only a couple hundred yards of trail has even gotten as far as breaking ground. Today, you are being asked to further delay a key piece of the trail in a heavily populated area where it would do the most good in converting around town car trips. We have already had years of environmental study of this project. The city began an environmental review and hired an environmental consultant four years ago. The city has Caught. The city has sought public comment, has listened, has modified the plan to, <clears throat> excuse me, to deal with concerns, only to have the new concern, only to have new concerns raised, and the city has fully responded to those. The city has done everything it should have. The fact is, the greatest threat to biodiversity by far is climate change. I urge you to approve the resolution rejecting the appeal. No more delays. Hello, I'm Sean Shrum, advocate for special needs, adaptive and uh, disabled communities in Santa Cruz in favor of the approved route. The proposed alternative is not ADA compliant. Beach Street Hill is too steep for those with a mobility impairment. Street travel is also a much longer route. The alternative will discourage trail use by those with disabilities because uh, Bay Westcliff intersection is very challenging for bicyclists and pedestrians, especially on summer weekends. Pedestrians must find it or leave it 
because of a requirement to use the regular roads, and blind people cannot read signage. Children may not read signage. Uh, creating a frustrating experience may dissuade people from using the trail. If a small group can change this route by threatening a lawsuit, think about another group who would threaten a lawsuit because the city has proposed an inaccessible trail. Diversity is here. Disability and, uh, I mean, disabled and adaptive people with or without mobility equipment are here. If you build your city without adaptive people in mind, that's a choice. We can't wish these things into, ex into existence. Um, I'm building ramps, walkways, and boat launches on Cal's Beach July 13th for the disabled community because the city and the county won't. We all have a choice, and today the choice is yours. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephen Slade. I'm the executive director of the Land Trust, a uh, resident of the city for 20-some years. I urge you to support the staff recommendation and proceed. Just a few points, I mean, one, this is one part of a multi-segment system. And every single segment is gonna have people coming up and arguing for delays. Fortunately, you won't have many more of those, but everybody else in the county will. And so we could have the whole trail in 10 years, or we could have it in 20 or 25 years. We could have a whole trail, but oh, you've gotta climb up past the dream in. And uh, it's just sort of, I don't know, people are waiting for perfect. I think we're pretty close to perfect with what we have. Uh, the second point I wanna remain say is, this is one acre of affected habitat in a county that has 250,000 acres. So, you know, the future of the planet is not gonna rise and fall, fall with this one acre. Of course, the land trust is providing space at Antonelli Pond to plant all the willow trees you want. They grow really well. And in fact, if the city would like to own the pond, we are always ready to give it to you. <laughs> right now, today, I could give it to you. Uh, or not. Um, and the final thing I wanna say is, I have to admit I'm confused when I hear, we support the rail trail, but we're worried about lighting. We're worried about impervious services. We're worried about cutting down trees. You can't build the rail trail without these things. So I don't know how to support the rail trail and be against its construction. Um, we urge you to move ahead with this project. I think the, the positive response you saw about the San Lorenzo Bridge, well, this is gonna be 10 times that. And I would think you would wanna be a part of it. Thank you. Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, of course, we support a trail now, with who we are. But I think what we're here to talk more about is the elephant in the room, and I, I couldn't have used a better example than the video that Chris showed about the Roaring Camp train going by there. The current plan is 60 trains a day, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. It's really not realistic. So you're developing your plans. You're spending a lot of money. I mean, you're spending $20 million a mile to build this trail all to accommodate a future passenger train. But in reality, that's not happening. The California Transportation Ash Commission, I was there in March, they're asking for a response from the RTC on their business plan of how they're going to fund this train. It's irresponsible for our community to spend additional millions of dollars. We need those millions of dollars for other things. 22 heritage trestles, hidden beach trestle. What are we going to do with that with 60 trains a day? The Capitola, you're gonna to have to tear it down and build a concrete trestle, trail, train, tr bridge. It's really not gonna happen. And I think that's the main thing we need to think about. So I would agree, slow this down, do the appeal process, and hopefully you start to send the message that the elephant in the room is that we're trying to build a trail to accommodate a future train will never happen. How are we going to get 60 trains a day going from the west side through the boardwalk through? It's realistically. And so we're hopeful that you take that moment in time to think of where, how are we gonna spend our money to make our community better? Thank you. Karina McFarlane, Live Oak. 
Um, I'd say I stepped into this whole subject. First meeting I went to was Capitola City Council when Sierra Club Mark Massetti Miller presented and then Bud Colligan of Greenway presented and then everyone got their two minutes. And, um, and right at the end, one of the councillors says, well, that's democracy, folks. And I went home really keyed up, like, that didn't feel like democracy. It felt, it felt full of things not being said. And I was so keyed up that I got in touch with Jim Ruff of Center for Wise Democracy, whose work I'd been following for many years. One of the things that happened with his work, the Wisdom Council process, which is supposed to give a we the people a true participatory democracy role, was in Austria with Syrian refugees pouring over the border and the Wisdom Council process into the electorate was so phenomenally successful that they made a constitutional amendment. So they have Wisdom Council process twice a year and more if a citizen says, you know, we need to talk about this issue and gets a thousand signatures, they'll have more than two. So um, that's my input. We've had um, Jim Ruff come down and train some of us, and he's coming down again in July to train more. And we've had one Wisdom Council in January that was about the coastal trail, randomly selected citizens, and they came up with take the rails out rail bank. And they were pulled from all the zip codes throughout the county, random citizen for one and a half days, going through all of this. So that's, um, there'll be another Wisdom Council, there'll be another training. Thank you. Peoplewisdom.org. Hello, my name is Virginia Wright, and I am hoping that you deny the appeal and build the train. I have, I'm responsible for bunch of other people. Uh, people really want this to happen. Um, I also am the person who was the first person who wrote the public art plan for the city of Santa Cruz. And so I've been around a lot, doing a lot of work for the city. And I know what vision can do. I know what taking action can do. And I just urge you to take a step and take that next place. I read the packet for the today's meeting, I've read the plans, I've gone through the entire thing, and there's been an incredible amount of really excellent work. Your staff, your consultants, they are very, uh, this is not bad, this is really good work, well done, caring, thoughtful. And then there is a couple of people who have brought forth some challenge and appeal, and I just feel like the weight of all of the research 20 years, 20, however many years is, this has been going on, outlives these, this one challenge, this one appeal. I'm also a, currently a grant writer and a fundraiser, and I know that when local mid money is committed to a project, that brings in money from outside, like the city and the RTC has said. So once it's committed locally, once the environmental review is approved, um, or the I don't know the language of environment, but once you appeal this negative declaration <laughs> and you get the, and it's approved and it goes forward, it will bring in more money and we can complete the trail. So thank you. Before we begin, I'll just see how many folks still want to address the council on this item. Okay, so in addition to the two, you'll be our last speaker. Hi, I'm Jane Mio. And you kind of remind me of having to be a parent who has two totally different children with different needs. So the question is not really, I would like to block that out, <laughs> it's not really um, who is right or wrong, but doing justice to both of your children because these issues, EIR, no EIR, do have specific needs and requirements. So I would say in view of that a environmental organization saved some trees by just walking with staff through that area indicates that there is value that an EIR 
happens because just imagine how good this can be. It's not a question of building the trail, it's a question how well it is built. We have sacrificed the environment over and over in the name of profit or you know, the future or whatever we wanted to name it. We can't do it anymore. The kids are out in the streets. They're demonstrating because we as adults aren't able to get it together to you know, protect the environment. We gotta stop that. We gotta come together and we need the right kind of form to make sure the environment is you know, considered. It's time and we can do it. So thank you. Hi, uh, Jared Boggs, uh, public school teacher in Wattsville for 11 years. Um, I, walk, I walked this segment here about five hours ago. I hope you all get a chance to do that <clears throat> also. Um, appellants are, I just want to make a point I haven't heard today, that appellants are speaking, as I understand it, contrary to the National Sierra Club's policies. Uh, the National Sierra Club rightly makes action on climate change its highest environmental priority. Therefore, it has extensive policies on transportation issues, primarily a strong position on encouraging no and low carbon transportation activities, especially biking, walking, and rail transit, which is exactly what you're looking at. Uh, so I think that's something to consider. This appeal itself, um, it's something that I have noticed about it is that there's one scientist involved. In this zip code, in this area, it should be so easy to get 10 lined up in a heartbeat around an issue like this. So that means something to me, just as to, right off the bat. Um, and that's something that I hope that you would consider too. We are, we're surrounded with scientific institutions, laboratories, governmental agencies, all engaged in environmental science or related activities. Yet the appeal after so many years, as one scientist involved, in my humble opinion, from what I've seen and heard, it seems overzealous about limited environmental impact and not appreciating the enormous benefits. Um, and that's your job and I, I trust that you're gonna do a good job of that. There's always costs. And that was, that was in their pres the appellant's presentation and I appreciated that, they're absolutely right. And of course your job is to weigh those against the benefits, which are enormous. And I trust that you'll do that. Finally, since I still have some time, social justice, my God. I mean, as a teacher in Watsonville, I know somebody said this isn't close to Route 1. They're not seeing the point. Someone else said it's segment by segment. We want to get to Watsonville. Those people are being punished in traffic. Good afternoon, and it has been a long afternoon. Um, I know you can see from the pile of postcards, from the petitions that have been delivered, from the letters and emails you've received, this is a popular project. Um, I know that a lot of people were coming here at about one o'clock this afternoon because they wanted to speak to this issue and they have not all been able to stay because this is, you know, gone on a long day and um, it'll be even longer for you, I'm so sorry. Um, but I'd like to take a moment to just ask the people in the audience who want to see this segment of the trail built and designed as, and do that soon to please stand up. If you're here to support the project. Thank you. It's, you have a chance to approve a very popular project today. And yeah, there is opposition and I believe they are sincere, but they are small in number and in this case, I believe they are in error. Um, I think that this is a misuse of the environmental review process to delay this, pro this, biz this project and make it more expensive and basically destroy it and move it somewhere else and then it's not a rail trail anymore as Micah pointed out. You know, other people have already pointed out that um, this trail is not adjacent to Neary Lagoon at all. It's adjacent to the sewage treatment plant. There are acres of cement and equipment between the proposed trail and the lagoon and the plant is full of activities and lights all the time. Any additional light or activity along the trail will not be next to the lagoon and will be insignificant compared to the current level of disruption that that area um, has. 
There's been a lot of environmental review already. There's been a lot of accommodation to the concerns. The appellants have really prepared, failed to present any evidence that putting a path on the far side of the sewage plant is going to from is going to have any damage to the biology of the lagoon. No additional substantial evidence has been presented. The mitigated ne negative declaration is sufficient, and I the a new EIR is not required. The appeal should be denied, and I hope you will do that today. Thank you. Okay. And you will be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, here we are, we've got another case of we must destroy the environment in order to save it. Um, the city has sidestepped the environmental impact report process by declaring that there is no unmitigatable uh, things in this project, but they're putting up this ugly retaining wall, which I don't see that it's even necessary, and they have to cut down a bunch of trees in order to do this, to put this wall in. Um, instead of rushing to do this project the way it is, let's take a step back and do the best possible project. We don't need to rush into this and do a lousy project, which will be a blight, and just end up uh, with this huge retaining wall, which will be covered with graffiti in no time. Um, why don't we do a project where we can keep that hillside intact, keep as many trees as possible intact, not upset this uh, wetland that's in there, that area, not cut down all these trees, you know, there's, there, oh, we're, well, we're gonna save a bunch of trees and only cut down one in the, in the grove where the butterflies go. Well, why, not we, why don't we just make fake butterflies and have them fly around, you know? Uh, I'm sure that there's somebody building them somewhere already. So uh, I would encourage you to take a step back here and order an environmental impact report it would have been better if there was an environmental impact report for the entire segment all the way from Davenport to Watsonville so that you wouldn't have to go through this now. But they decided to not do that originally. And uh, so I'm here we are. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, um, we'll go ahead and close public comment. The appellants will now have uh, five minutes to rebut. And at this time, um, no new evidence can be presented. Um, before you start, could I just ask one thing? We will be sharing the time. Could we just pause the clock while we change guard? Thank you. Is, and just a clarification, Mayor uh, Watkins. Um, I know no new information, but is it possible to respond to some of the comments that were raised? That yep, yes? I'm, I'm seeing a, a head nod from our city attorney. That's appropriate. Um, thank you. Okay, yes. Um, I'm ready. Oh, it's started. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, we're not rep, we're not rep talking for the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club though does have a policy of protecting the environment. I fully understand people's strong feelings, and it's pretty easy to get postcards signed when it's. I'm imagining it's the rail trail. People are trying to derail it. We're here because we are speaking on the side of we also have to protect the environment. And in terms of getting this project done as soon as possible, if that is the goal, then it would be better for you in terms of timing to ask for an EIR. The other process will be far longer. I'd just like to take an example of that, um, the idea that the environment has been looked at. Uh, the the uh, biologist has said that the tree mitigation that we'll be planting saplings so that the carbon emissions issue has been mitigated. Surely you don't even have to be a biologist or an expert to know that a mature tree sequesters carbon at a huge amount compared to a sapling, and people have estimated 90 to 1. So we are taking down 42 trees in this area, 16 of them are heritage. Three times 16 does not equal these 16 trees. This is not an urban area if you have walked it. It is an oasis within an urban area. 
The uh, Neary Lagoon is not the project site. The project site is the site you have walked. And having a rail line that goes through an area doesn't mean that the animals stop and butterflies stop on one side. It is contiguous. The, um, we are not saying don't build. We are saying that we can build it right. We can provide a safe alternative that doesn't involve Beach Hill. We've already said that. And uh, I think the last thing I'd say is that I will pass it to my colleague. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I realize I was quite breathless. We um, have a great deal shorter time than the proponents, so I do apologize. Tearing, no, I apologize. It sounded like I thought you were required to tear. You were not. I would recommend that you did. Um, there you are. Um, but it, it was not required. It would have actually substantially improved your analysis had you tiered, but that was not uh, the, the point. The point is that the cumulative impacts were insufficiently examined because you did not tier, you chose not to. Riparian assessment, good to know that you did not do what I had thought you had done. It makes it actually unfortunately worse because that means that you've missed a big section of the riparian impact, which is a shame. 2.5% um, of the Neary Lagoon riparian area because you have a large riparian area, it makes the percentage smaller, but that actually makes the um, the habitat more valuable. It's a bigger patch, and so uh, increasing the edge and reducing the size of an important patch is more damaging than uh, than taking an isolated patch away. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a small amount when you jump when a bird jumps from patch to patch in an urban area, it needs those refuges, it needs those patches that it can get through an urban wasteland. So biologically, ecologically, the theory is out of date. I respect the fellow who was concerned that I'm only one person. I'm one unpaid person. Everyone else around here I think is paid. I am also the only PhD that I'm aware of. I don't know it's possible that others have the experience I do. Um, I, uh, I want us to do an EIR so we can get more analysis, not that mine is adequate at all. Um, similarly, the alternatives. Bay and Westcliff um, is unsafe. If we put our money into the alternative that actually went that direction, in our engineering, in our brain, in our smarts, we could improve the safety. And I actually just rolled it with a friend of mine who's in a wheelchair, and she preferred to go the route that I have, and I'd be very happy to share with the city, that is 100% ADNA compliant the whole way. So. Um, there are alternatives that have not been considered. The alternatives that have been looked at internally have not been done publicly. It's the whole purpose of this is to actually get the input and the disclosure. So um, the last thing, the last two things I wanna say, social justice, we're committed to ADA, easy trail all the way to the beach flats, both directions. I'm very, very, those who know me, very interested in social justice and supporters. Two of my friends said, you know, I, these people want me to sign this card and they wouldn't really tell me what it was about. Now, I'm not saying anything, but it really, a thousand cards multiplied by, by the information that you get about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I wanna thank um, the, everybody who's here today to speak to the item, um, the presentations on behalf of the appellants and on behalf of our staff. At this point, we'll go ahead and return back to our council for deliberation and action. And um, I'll go ahead and see if there's any questions amongst our council members. So we have uh, Council Member Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, just wondering, can I have one of those green postcards? I'm trying to remember what's on them. Just really. I should review that. Do you want to ask any additional questions? Um, yeah, so there's a lot uh, <laughs> uh, of content here, especially hearing from both the city staff, the environmental <coughs> researcher, as well as the uh, appellants with uh, regards to this section. I think there's some very similar values as was mentioned by um, the appellants, but also uh, an interesting conversation around the weight of immediate transportation relief to uh, making sure that we're protecting the environment as uh, sufficiently as we can. Um, the topic of carbon sequestration with trees came up a couple of times, and I was just curious, with that three to one replacement, because I went and 
walk the segment, just so people are, are aware. I went and got a chance to walk through it, look at all the trees and some of the suggested uh, spacing. So I'm just curious, because I noticed that there were trees there that were at least 50, maybe 100 years old that were growing along the rail corridor that were old oaks and stuff like that, I believe. Um, so with the, or, or the heritage tree, so with those suggested replacement trees, are they going to adequately live up to the carbon sequestration of the trees that are slighted or um, slated to be removed? And then if not, how long is it estimated for it to take for them to reach that goal of carbon sequestration to match the existing vegetation that's there right now? Um, the trees are, two for ones are 24 inch box trees, so they're not, you know, the smaller, uh, smaller trees, but I don't know that calculation, I've never seen it. Okay, maybe the environmental researcher? Because it's, it's rather relevant. I mean, if we're talking about removing 42 trees, 16 or whatever, 12 or heritage, and we're replacing them on a three to one or two to one scale in some other location, but they're going to be saplings or box trees, that significantly reduces the amount of carbon that they're able to take in. And has, has there been calculations on that? There has not been calculations on carbon sequestration. Typically, um, in terms of what I've done on environmental documents, it's a qualitative analysis. Um, it's considering all components of the project. The fact that this is going to reduce VMT, uh, this is going to reduce car trips. It's 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 supported by the climate action plan. Um, so that's just one component of of the of our analysis. But it's a qualitative analysis. Okay, um, <clears throat> I appreciate that. It is unfortunate. Um, to not have that data in front of us because I think we could make a really uh, more informed decision if we had calculated that. Um, uh, with the trees, since we're on that topic, uh, when I went there, I noticed that there were a ton of birds in the canopies of those trees, of a big variety of them. Um, so cutting down those larger heritage trees or the willows that are uh, sources of food as well as um, habitats for birds and other kinds of species with the relocation of smaller three to one willow trees, how long are we anticipating to see a rejuvenation of that quality canopy that exists there right now? Um, I could, I would have to check our um, mitigation plan to answer that question so I could, I can try to get to that. Um, I would have to get my computer though and, 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 and pick that up. Okay. Okay. Should I do that? Yes. Okay, um, thank Just you. Just as a point of clarification though, not all trees are being removed. I know, yeah. Okay. No, it's about 40, 46, 42. How many? Um, 42. 42, so a considerable amount. And then uh, 16 are heritage trees? That's right. Yeah, so 42 trees and 16 is heritage trees. That is a huge impact on canopy and wildlife. Um, I also really appreciate the outreach work done by the group that did these green cards. I know I, I'm a community organizer, so I know how much work that takes in collecting signatures and talking with people, um, but I don't notice anywhere on here that it mentions issues of environmental destruction or concerns about uh, environmental safety. So I'm just curious if there's anyone from this group that collected them that could come and explain um, why it's not included on here, if it's a specific issue with the trail and um, also I'm how it's relevant. I'm just gonna go ahead and interrupt here. That, will, uh, that is not the um, proper process for this type of, pro of proceeding. Oh. And mm -hmm. so if you want to ask them offline in terms of any information for further clarification, you're welcome to do so, but at this time we won't be inviting anybody up to do that. Uh, uh, we've heard from the community, we've heard from the appellants, we've heard from the staff, so at this point in the public hearing, it would not be appropriate to invite them up. Okay, well then um, in that case, I will just point out to my colleagues that there's nothing on this uh, letter of endorsement that talks about anything having to do with environment or, or environmental protection. So just something that's something to be thinking about. Um, and. Let's see, um, oh, so the question about the mitigation solutions not being reviewed publicly. Um, can we speak to that and have the mitigation solutions um, and or alternative options been reviewed publicly with public input because the appellant said that it had not? I, I can answer that question. Um, so I think what you're referring to is the alternatives. Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay, so under CEQA, um, an initial study mitigated negative deprivation does not require an alternatives analysis and EIR does. Um, and so what we've referred to as um, the alternatives that have been considered have been documented in the correspondence with um, the Coastal Commission as well as the Sierra Club. So um, in terms of 
it being a public process that isn't it, it isn't in the ISMND, but that's because it isn't a required thing in the ISMND. Okay, and so just to clarify, so I'm on the same page. I just wanted to add oh, yeah. to that is that the alternatives that staff have reviewed as part of the process, moving the trail to the other side of the track, et cetera, all the ones that Mike and I have noted, have been in all the staff reports that have gone to the commissions and the council uh, to date. So they've been part of the public process. Great. Um, uh, my main concern, though, is for people that don't visit or go to planning commission meetings or review agenda packets and that are involved in community that may or may not be aware of the situations that are going on. Um, as you can tell, I'm a big supporter of the environment, but I'm also a big supporter of alternate forms of transportation. So this is a really tough situation uh, to be in. And I was just curious, uh, the appellant also mentioned that if we order the EIR, it will be a shorter process than the alternate. Can you clarify what they're talking about? I think that's based on the assumption that by ordering the EIR, you would foreclose or eliminate the possibility of a, a legal challenge to the adequacy of the EIR or of an appeal to the Coastal Commission, but n neither of those are um, a given. And so uh, if it were to circumvent someone deciding to file an appeal, um, then that might result in a shorter process, but it, but it it's, could still be appealed to the Coastal Commission after you circulated and certified uh, an environmental impact report, or it could still be challenged in a in a CEQA lawsuit. And do you have an estimated timeline or city cost that would be incurred by that process? Or you just had to estimate from your experience? Um, whatever the timeline is, it's longer than what I would estimate. So it's <laughs> several months and in the six figures. Okay, so um, again, just to bring it back to my colleagues, so it's really, I'm, I'm really, in a hard spot with this one because I want to move the rail trail forward as quickly as possible, but I don't want to cost us more money, but I want to protect the environment. So it's, thank you for answering the questions, everyone. Um, really, really hard, hard one. Okay, uh, we have more uh, questions for clarification. I'll just sort of remind and orient our council to where we are in today's agenda. We have a budget item to follow this item in addition to um, some uh, public, uh, uh, consent public hearing uh, items. And then as you know, we have a big item before us in the evening. So if um, your questions are sort of uh, oriented around what it would take in terms of information to make a decision in this regard, um, I think for the purposes of being able to adequately address all the other items, I'd um, go ahead and request that. So we'll go ahead and start with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Myers. So I just want to make a co quick comment, uh, appreciating all of the work that's gone into making this happen from the 1980s forward. Um, and thank you to people who have come out and, and put a lot of time into supporting the tra rail trail and the appellants as well for being really thorough in um, their, rev their review process. And I think that the comments that have been made have made this project a better project um, in terms of the mitigations that we've been able to um, get into the uh, mitigated uh, negative deck that is proposed. Um, so we've heard a lot about support for the rail trails, you know, support support the trail only, so, you know, but that's not really what we're here to consider today. Our primary responsibility is about whether the project, um, the kind of the narrow questions about whether a fair argument can be made that there's um, likely to be significant or substantial impact and whether adequate alternatives are available and have been considered. So um, with respect to that, I have um, a question about the, um, I guess I'm, I'm still not clear w in terms of the mitigations that, and I've read the, the, the document, the RTC's program, uh, environmental impact report, and it sounds like there may be some mitigations in there that haven't been considered here in the negative deck that could be, could make the project a better project. I can't figure out from, I couldn't figure out where to find those because it's a, it's an overall program EIR, and so I couldn't discern, because I'm not an expert, which mitigations might be, um, make this uh, a more, uh, um, environmentally friendly project. Um, so if we could get some clarification about that, I mean, I'm, I know that this is not a time to ask questions of, but the, if the appellants could try to um, 
either answer that here or um, perhaps be willing to, to talk about that with our staff in the future, that would be really great. Um, and then um, I, I would just like to get a little clarification on the grading issue for the <coughs> on street versus the, um, the, the rail corridor, the rail trail corridor, because I seem to, I've been hearing different opinions about the ADA question. So I just wanna get clarification on that. Um, and I think that's all I've got here in terms of questions. Um, in response to those two questions. So we're not, a, we don't understand what the alternative is that um, the appellant was referring to. All the alternatives we've looked at, you know, that are off route require going down the beach hill. There's, it's not accessible. Um, providing, getting enough right away to make an accessible would be buying private property like the Dream Inn or some of the other things like that to make it work with bigger ramps, et cetera, and higher costs. Um, <clears throat> in reviewing the, the master plan EIR, this project, the mitigation measures before you are more site specific than those, and those are bigger picture. So I think we're really addressing them. I don't know what else we could add that are in the master plan EIR. So, well, I guess since there are others who have a perspective on this, are the, is any, anybody here wanting to suggest additional mitigations that might be considered as perhaps a way to move us forward more quickly? I'm just wondering if that's... Uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding. Are you asking this? Well, I, I'm just, the appellants have said that there, addition, there potentially are additional mitigations. And I'm just trying to clarify, is the only mitigation that the appellants um, w want to consider an alternative route? Or might there be mitigations along this corridor that could be considered? Are you asking, are we? Are we yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and maybe if you briefly have a response to that, we'll go ahead and give you, I mean, very brief um, in, ter in terms of clarification. I don't know if you really, if you want to get specific to the question that you have before. I, well, I just, uh, if there, I'm just trying to find a way to, tr make, to address some of the concerns being, um, that have been brought to us without further delaying the project. I'm just tr trying to see if there's a way we can move this forward. And so the that. question before the appellant is, what they're suggesting in terms of addressing those specifically? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, so that's, I'm not clear about that because like um, Mr. Schneider said, the, the master plan EIR speaks to the entire rail trail, not this particular segment, so. Yes. It, so it, we'll have, I'll go ahead and, sorry. maybe just one second, I'll go ahead and have you respond, but I'll just um, maybe just orient us again back to the process. The appellants had, uh, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and orient us back to the process. The appellants had 15 minutes to make their case in that regard, five minutes of rebuttal. And so to invite them back up, I think is not necessarily common practice, but the city attorney says that's possible if you wanna just maybe briefly have one minute to clarify anything very specific, but the, the, the specific has answer in that regard. Sorry. Excuse me, Mayor Watkins. Um, the, 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 the EIR mitigation I was alluding to is mitigation B B-2, parentheses B, wetland and riparian habitat restoration impacts to jurisdictional, sorry, thank you. Impacts to a jurisdictional wetland and riparian habitat shall be mitigated at a ratio of minimum two to one for each segment. And now this is not the same as willows, Will, individual willows. Remember a whole thicket of willows is one tree. So three trees is not a wetland uh, ratio, but wetland uh, mitigation. Um, all restoration compensatory mitigation areas shall be permanently protected through a conservation easement or deed restriction. Um, as, and it shall occur as close to the ha impacted habitat as possible. So that's from the FEIR that wasn't used. So that was answering that question. Okay, thank um, you. And then the other thing is if you turn the screen on, I, um, I did provide a uh, picture of the alternative. Okay, okay, sure, okay. Okay, <coughs> so while that's being turned on, you can review that. We'll go ahead and have Vice Mayor Cummings ask. So my, my next question is, um, what is the current vegetation management along the trail? I would imagine that because we have trains going through there on occasion that there's likely to be some form of vegetation management. Um, yeah, that's the responsibility of the Regional Transportation Commission that owns the right of way. And so they do some brush removal and maintenance. The city's helped with uh, 
trash cleanup and things like that. And then the other question, I know that there was a mention of 42 trees and there's the 16 heritage trees that are gonna be replaced at a two to one ratio. Yes. Is there any potential for the other trees to also be replaced, maybe one for one? Um, there is um, always that if you wanted to require us at a condition, it's not part of the environmental mitigation, but as a condition for the project, that's possible. There's the associated cost in finding the location to put those trees can be tricky because the right of way, the rail right of way is constrained, but there are other areas within the city that's possible to replant. Okay. Um, I'd just like to make a statement. Um, so one of the things that I've seen from this, and I, I, it's a difficult um, topic to make a decision on because on one hand you have the potential um, impacts on the biological species that occur along that trail. In addition to that, you have the benefits, the environmental benefits from getting people out of the cars and getting people onto um, alternative forms of transportation, in this case, um, getting them onto bikes, and it also the benefits, the community benefits that come from, rather than having people bike in the street, or um, you know if they're uh, wheelchair bound, riding in the street, that you have a safe, secure path for um, people to actually use. Um, from a biological perspective, I mean, this is more of a degraded habitat within, our, um, within all the green spaces that we have access to. It's currently very underutilized, and I feel like this trail would be a very good way to access this space. Um, the staff has done a great job with working with community members to increase the mitigations, and um, I feel like it would be great if we can add some other conditions in when we make our decision. So um, I personally think that this is a really great project, and given the um, cost benefits and weighing the costs and benefits to having the trail, I actually would be fine making a motion to accept the staff recommendation to deny the, to deny the appeal at this point in time. I'll go ahead. Okay, well, we have a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, is seconded by Council Member Matthews. Was there any further comments? I, okay. okay. Your comments have been made. Okay. In the interest of time. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, Council Member Glover, any? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, with that motion, you had mentioned, and it was confirmed by the staff, that there would have to be specific direction for one-to-one -one replacement of the trees. So, are you got, would you include that in your motion, that we would make that effort, not, not make the effort, but make the dedication to replace one-for-one for, one for every tree that is outside of the two-for-one and three-for-one designations of willows and heritage trees? Great. Um, and okay. uh, Council Brown? since I think I'm still not entirely clear, but I, I did read um, uh, in, sir, in response mm -hmm. to Dr. O'Malley's uh, response that it, it, there is some uh, reference to that in the appeal on page 11. So, but I'm still not entirely clear what it is. Would you be willing to include, um, I don't know if it would be a condition or exactly what we would call it, but um, that direct our staff to have a continuing conversation with the appellants to try to um, work with them to see if there are other mitigations that um, that might be ac acceptable or, or um, supported. And I'd also say that includes the um, wetland mitigations. And so that's a friendly amendment accepted. Well, uh, if we could phrase it, uh, that there be um, an ongoing discussion as the project moves forward for uh, further improvements. That could be the appellants, it could be community members. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't want to deny. It's not a legal requirement, but it's a sure. Okay, we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and restate that. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings to accept um, the staff recommendation to deny the appeal to condition it with having a, a one for one, uh, or uh, pardon me, what was the specifics of the tree? One for one for all trees that aren't heritage trees. One for one for all trees that or are willows. not heritage. Or willows. Yeah. Or willows. Um, and then to incorporate within the motion a um, opportunity for ongoing conversation between staff as well as the appellants or other community members to continually look for ways uh, to mitigate any environmental impacts. Is that adequately or appropriately? Well, I, I say direction to staff to communicate with the appellants and um, allow the, for other community input. Okay. Is, 
You know, we've now had about four versions of language and this will not be news to anyone. I like to be clear what the language is. Do you want to, as the, sec okay, as the seconder of the uh, motion. Fifth difference. Yeah. Um, that we give direction for uh, staff to uh, continue discussion with appellants and any interested community managers on um, further improvements to the project as the plans move forward. Is that accepted by the yeah. maker of the motion? And, and there's one point of clarification that I just want to say is also with the one-to-one -one replacement that we do not replace any invasive species, period. <laughs> okay. We'll go ahead and, okay, Sorry. Councilmember Matthews. <laughs> you know, I haven't looked at all those trees. Are they acacias? Are they, you know, <laughs> that's my guess is a lot of them are invasive in and of themselves. <laughs> so, you know, I'm being generous. I think the one-to-one -one replacement for uh, non-heritage trees is um, probably overreaching. I'm willing to go along with it. Um, uh, I leave it to our arborist to um, determine appropriate places within our whole city um, limits to, to make good choices on that. So if, you know, if it's 16 heritage and do the math, whatever's left over on one-to-one, -one, that's an acceptable way to move forward to me. Is that acceptable too? Okay. Just leave it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Yeah. We'll go ahead and take a two minute break while we change um, presentations. Bring us back to our city council meeting. I would like to reorder our uh, agenda here. We're gonna go ahead and uh, just temporarily pause the next item, which we'll, uh, we anticipate having a longer conversation on and move forward with our consent public hearing. And our consent public hearing are items uh, 28 through 32 on our agenda. Uh, I, uh, um, my understanding is that there aren't any council members interested in polling any of those items at this time. And so um, in that regard, we'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the community that wanted to address this on any item 28 through 32. Okay, I think seeing none, um, we're gonna go ahead and bring it back to the council for action. Is there a motion to uh, move the uh, consent public hearing? So moved. Okay. I'll second. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I think it was a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Okay. We'll do second by Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. So we're able to um, now go back to item number 27 on our agenda. Item number 27 are in, on our agenda is our budget. And I will go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Marcus and Tracy to uh, give us a staff report. Good afternoon, council members, mayor. We have a brief presentation because this is our uh, third in-depth opportunity. Um, we've received very clear direction on May 8th, um, more direction on May 28th, and we ended the May 28th meeting very close, but still with a small a balance to fully fund our next year's general fund budget. The rest of the city's budget is still doing relatively well. So what we're focused today on is just that small delta for our general fund budget to finish that. And if you'll allow us, we'll go through our presentation and where we really would like to finish up is in your direction on our live model on all the outstanding items. What I handed out in front of you is a two page summary of all the outstanding items to confirm. Uh, page one and page two, and that's where we really want 
to get your direction. And a lot of this was summarized in the staff report and all the attachments, but we try to distill down to two pages that really the, the key outstanding items that we can focus on. So we've seen this slide before, but it's worth repeating. Um, ongoing projected shortfalls exist in the out years. Solving this year's deficit will decrease future, future deficits. Um, deficits are projected into the mid 2020s, and we should plan for surpluses to build up against a, slow, a slowdown. And you've seen these charts before. This, we're just doing a few quick three slides of overview. This is the projection of where our cash balances would end up within our general fund, our available reserves, so that's our 10% general fund reserve and our city public trust and economic development trust. We are projected to fall short when we, when we finish the audit this year, possibly as high as $3.7 million, which might require us, would require us to come back to council and indicate which trusts to defund to cure our 10% deficit or 10% reserve. This will be a conversation we have in the fall. It really is contingent on there's a lot of cost to firm up, especially with regard to unsheltered services and how much we're gonna get reimbursed. So there's still some work to do there to fine tune that number. It's just our order of magnitude is we have some work now to make sure our reserves and trusts are where they need to be. And we have concerns going out ahead with projected deficits that Tracy just recapped. We have challenges coming ahead, much of which again isn't our doing. This is a statewide, countrywide issue with regard to lack of funding for infrastructure, um, loss of revenue and tax bases shrinking for us and many other states, increases in pension payments to the state to backfill their portfolio shortfalls. A lot of those things we don't necessarily have control over. So we're, we're concerned about what's coming ahead and that's where we're taking aggressive action now. And we've continued to take aggressive action to not let that happen, but it is getting closer. We're in a potential model in 2022, all our reserves would be depleted. And that's, we do not want to end up at there and that's where we're desperately and aggressively trying to avoid. So these are the deferred items that uh, were discussed on the May 28th budget hearing. Um, council decided to defer these items and not include them in the budget solution packages. Um, these are still in the budget. Uh, no community group reductions were taken, no open street reductions, and there was an increase in parking permits and meters that I believe you guys saw earlier today. And you just wanna reiterate, there are no proposed community group reductions and uh, there's no reductions currently in the, for open streets. It's, it's funded as it was entering this budget process. There was a, a discussion about it and it was, it was deferred. So there's no changes on that. I know there's been a lot of public concern about that particular item. So where we do need action today and we'll, we'll get to the live model is kind of two budget, those first two items are specific to the budget. Items three and four are house cleaning sort of. Um, item one is approving essentially the budget is schedule changes that you have in front of you. And item two is since a portion of our budget impact will be determined later this evening, is to allow identifying some contingent budget solutions dependent on how much the rental housing task force would be funded from zero to $250,000. We were asking for the direction now so that we can essentially move forward with an adopted budget contingent on what happens later tonight and we'd already have that direction decided. So that's option two. It's a little atypical for us to do this, but it, since it's just a few hours away, it, I think this feels like a reasonable alternative. Option three is just affirming the Water Commission's uh, recommendations regarding the Water Department's budget. And option four is um, an amendment to our risk policy that helps fund $450,000 solutions for this fiscal year. So it's tied to the budget's action. But those are the four motions we're looking for today. And we'd be effectively done with the budget process. I'll allow you to move on with bigger and better things. We don't need you to read, pull out the magnifying glass to read this. It's in front of you on the handout and we'll have the live model up with a clearer view. But essentially the, you've seen the schedule before. This is the about, it was $2.26 million before of the changes since we proposed the budget. And that's created a lot of our necessity to adopt the budget solutions. 
the number, we've decreased the number um, to 2.09 million. That's by starting with the premise of unfunding the council assistance. We recognize that that'll be discussed, but under this model that got us to a budget balance play. So where we're at now is still adding 2.09 million in new additions. Those additions are listed here. They're the same additions you've seen in the past, except for the council assistance and they're on the handout in front of you. Included in our solutions are $711,000 of new solutions that were identified in the staff report. The biggest one is amending our risk policy to essentially create a deductible program in place. So if, if there are, are any claims uh, by the general fund or any other operations, those operations would only be exposed to uh, most cases at 10% of the claim liability. And the rest is picked up by insurance fund. It's really a financing mechanism that the, all the the general fund, the police department, the water the department, the garbage fund, they would all pay it back over time, but essentially in year one, they'd be limited to the only 10% of the claim amount. We have the, take, we took out the $250,000, again, recognizing that that will be discussed later tonight, and we have a contingency for that. Uh, 63,000, you already approved earlier today for the parking permit fee increases. We have a balance to restore the IT help desk of $12,000 to add back to the budget and uh, $30,000 to reduce um, engineering services and restore meter hood replacements. These were on the fringes items that were um, modest in their ability but could have some good impact. So we got to a net $711,000 of solutions. We had to factor in our ASA Joint Powers Authority, our Animal Services Authority, Joint Powers Authority, uh, increase their budget by, for us, $23,300. So we have to reflect that. That just summarizes, this is the delta to get us balanced. Um, with all these actions, we um, would be balanced. The second motion related to the rental housing task force. So we've recommended uh, bringing back some things that were deferred as a contingent option. So to the extent that up to $250,000 might be approved later this evening, these would be the, probably the priority order of how we would fund the $250,000. Um, starting essentially with 30,000 and the 10,000 I just talked about from Public Works. We'd bring back those 40,000 in, in reductions. We'd go back to the parking permit program that you just approved early this morning or this afternoon and possibly consider increases there, but we also have parking meter rates to look at. One of those two could be a $17,000 increase delta. We're also recommending to bring back uh, some items that were deferred. Uh, items related to facility repairs are about $60,000. These are generic repairs, placeholders for city general fund facilities across. And there's 30,000 that was placeholder for vegetation management. That was, we'd have to come back to council if there became a need, we wouldn't ignore it, but we would just eliminate that um, flexibility. We'd bridge any gap by what is ending up right now about $103,000 of extra budget available. So that would get us to 250. This would be motion two to pre-authorize us to implement these actions. Again, kind of dependent on what the number is agreed upon later this evening. And I could pause there if that makes any sense. We haven't done this a lot. I just want to make sure that made some sense. Um, I'll just, maybe I'll just say for clarity, my understanding is that you are sort of presenting before us two budget options, one of which we, if we were to adopt both, this is my understanding, is no matter what happens um, this evening, there will be a, a budget to reflect that. Yep. And so what this, this budget um, option that we would potentially adopt incorporates the uh, 250,000 that could be allocated to the rental housing task force, and these would be the um, uh, elements that would be used to offset that cost. Does that yes. accurately reflect that? Yep. Okay. Okay. Councilman Matthews? My one question, uh, um, what's shown as Alt-E2, increase the residential and guest parking permits. We just did that, so. We would go back for an additional increase or look Got at, the, there's still the parking meters to be considered in the beach okay. area. One of those two could come back. Okay as a change. R further increase is what yes. you're saying. Yep. Oh, well, um, <laughs> our, so 
or is the intention to go through this list? Yeah, so what okay, I just so want to recap is the outstanding motions and then we'll go right to the live model, which is you've got a hard copy of it and we've got the model up. Um, again, we're looking for essentially there's three parts to adopt a balanced budget, approving the $2.09 million in additions, um, the $711,000 of solutions, and the ASA member contribution increase. That would essentially give us a balanced budget. We asked for the authority to give us the contingent authority <coughs> to balance anything that might be done later tonight with the rental housing task force, and that would cover our grounds. So we'd be effectively done with the budget with these actions, and then items three and four are house cleaning to help with the budget process. There's, that's the end of our presentation, and if there, I could pause to just make sure there are any questions on this, otherwise we can be happy to jump right into the model. Okay. I'm wondering if we want to see if there's any questions for clarity at this time, maybe go ahead and open it up to the community if there's any public input and then return back for uh, our work on the model. Does that seem yes. appropriate? Okay. Any questions? Councilman yeah, Matthews? This is just a clarity one. So on the rental housing task force, the way it shows on this form that you've given us, it's C4. So in a motion, we would adopt a C4A, which is sustaining the rental housing task force with additional actions and a C4B without it? Or would we adopt a whole second motion? How do you, just, I'm just, just trying to say. I just, how we it. just thought for clarity we would do it as a second motion. Okay. Um, Got it. Two parts. Okay. Two motions. Okay. Any additional questions for clarification at this time? Council Brooker? <laughs> Just wondering if you're if you have the women's self defense program in there, and yes. where is that? Yeah, it's it's listed in the in there are 2.9 million dollars of additions. Do you or have the, it right I'm there? Sorry, Can you show me or? It's the CPVAW. Yeah, that's, that's in our adopted. That's yeah. yeah there's there was I was confusing well, that with that, the different question. Investment. Is this something that the CPVAW did they already act on that and they approved it or? Their budget is already included in the proposed budget. There was no changes to their funding level, and I don't believe there's been any. Do they not decide how they spend their budget or? We we grant the authority and then they determine how it's spent. Right, but so this is an imposition though. We were what you were telling them to fund this. Or they chose to fund this. What are you pointing to? This I'm, I'm missing the point. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm not. CPVAW. Yes. They they made a decision to fund this women's self defense program. Do you see a women's self defense mm -hmm. program? Is that are you specifically finding something in, in the documents in regards to that? Or are you? No, no. I'm asking this question um, just as a because it's never been clear to me how this, the, it's going to be funded. Um, well, I'll go ahead and maybe just... Uh, Gen generally, it. the way it works is a, a, the council adopts a budget that includes uh, funding for the commission, and then the commission uh, works to develop their programming, and uh, the, the self-defense funding is something they've traditionally funded. Um, although I think they were looking at it, and I, 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 could, I can find out specifically, but, uh, but it is ultimately up to the commission to decide what to do and to uh, recommend to the council. It does come back to you, for example, if they have to be agreements, have to be approved, and that sort of thing. I mean, because originally this was part of our budget here. I'd like to put it back in because it just... It was you know, never removed. The 20,000, uh, there was never a, re a reduction in their funding. But it's not, it's still not clear. <laughs> It's not clear about the CPVAW. They run their own budget. They didn't approve it right now. They didn't, uh, they, and then they've been cutting it back and they've been, you know, doing different things with it. And I, I just want to make sure it gets if funded. I could just, if I could just, for clarification, it's my understanding is that the CPVAW is allocated a certain amount of funding mm -hmm. per year, which we will approve. That isn't changing or going down at this decision. Um, the process has been that they've had the discretion to, um, to allocate their dollars as they like to, uh, you know, as they see appropriate or fit. Um, and so I think um, maybe the, the other question at a future time could be uh, that, a sort of an examination of that process. But in terms of their funding, level, that will maintain the same for them right. to continue to do their work as they see fit. Yep. Correct. Councilmember Brown? I mean, I think what Councilmember Crone is getting at, and if he's not, then I will, that, that I think that 
the count there, I would like to see if there is a council majority support to direct that that $20,000 be used for women's self-defense because I'm concerned um, every year this keeps coming up that the CPVAW may decide they're gonna do something different and I understand there are all kinds of wonderful things that that funding could be used for but this is a priority, it has been a priority of the city for decades and I would like it to continue to be a priority and it's a longer term, longer discussion about how that might, what the term process is for determining who gets it and exactly what it's used for, but I want to clarify and confirm that it is for women's self-defense program. That, that particular portion of the CPVAW budget or bring it back into the city manager's um, department budget. I so, appreciate the clarity and I think that's certainly within the council's uh, authority. You can make that as part of your motion to specify and make that a restricted allocation. We'd be happy to set up a project for it and make sure it's spent in that line. Thank you. The other question I had was Apologies, about- I, I was the, misunderstanding is, though. Is there anybody here to talk about the Heritage Tree Fund um, and whether that money is spent or not? <laughs> yeah, Tony's here from Parks. But my question is, um, we, we allocated doubling it, which is a recommendation on the part of the Parks and Rec Commission and um, uh, does that money get spent and is there a need for more? And if there isn't, why would the Parks and Rec Commission have recommended this? Yeah, that's a good question. So over the, so Tony Elliott, uh, Parks and Recreation uh, Department, over the past three years, um, the first question in terms of what we've expended, um, this year we will spend um, 24,365. Uh, 2017, or I'm sorry, 2017, 2018, uh, we spent just over the budgeted amount, 26,348. The year prior to that, 23,698. Um, I think Parks and Recreation Commission uh, recommended this one, really, I think, um, frankly, in, in kind of a symbolic way, I think to invest in our, in our urban tree canopy to some degree, we have not felt the demand necessarily uh, from the community, in other words, we haven't received uh, a number of applications uh, and people saying we need more funds, we need more uh, more resources. Uh, to be fair though, with that, we've not advertised this program, so we don't really broadly uh, advertise this to the community. So I think in terms of additional funding, we could certainly, uh, certainly use additional funds. Um, we've talked internally that those funds could be used um, as well for, for education um, on urban tree canopy and, and uh, just as well as uh, granting uh, or increasing the grant amount by $25,000. But uh, hopefully to answer your question, um, I shared the numbers that we've spent over the past three years, but we haven't felt that, that demand or heard from the community necessarily that, hey, we need more grant funding. So it really a, a decision for the council on um, uh, to increase that uh, or not, but we're, we would support it certainly. Um, but w just to be very honest, we haven't felt that demand necessarily. Thank you. Uh, when, it, when it's appropriate, I'll, I would make a motion to restore the council assistance and the um, women's self-defense as well as the Heritage Tree Fund or to go to the, the route that Councilmember Brown said that we designate uh, money from the uh, CPVAW before we do that, we'll go ahead and maybe see if there's um, a, any member of the community that wants to address the council on uh, this item. We are now addressing item number 27 on our agenda. That's our uh, fiscal year 2020 proposed budget adoption. If you're interested in speaking to us on this item, please uh, come to my left and come before me and you'll have up to two, uh, two minutes. Is there others that are interested in speaking to us on this item? Okay, okay. Hi, so I've been here all afternoon waiting for the budget. Um, a lot of important issues came up and it was very interesting. Um, what I don't understand is on the, w the resolution on the fiscal year budget, is this just for the general plan or does it also include the capital improvements budget? We'll go ahead and pause the time. We'll take note of your questions during your time and then if we have a response, we'll okay, go ahead answer. and answer that. Okay, yeah. well, um, if it does include the CPI budget, um, we do have some requests for items to be cut. And these are items that, um, I, I sent an email about this, and these are items that would um, encourage more car traffic and more 
um, carbon emissions, and we spent a lot of time talking about um, having more trees, but if we have less cars, you know, it's, it's just, it's all part of the mix, but it's very important that we get the message out that we are a city that wants to start getting people out of their cars, and we don't want to build to accommodate more cars, and there are items very expensive items on this budget that um, will take money from what we really need to be doing to um, expand for cars. So I do, do hope that you will um, make an amendment to this if it has to do with uh, CIPs and s say that they need to come back with some cuts that show that they are aligned with climate emergency, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Alma Molina. I'm with Meals on Wheels. I'm the assistant director of the program, a program of Community Bridges. I'm here with a lovely uh, note from our seniors at the Loudoun Center, um, asking for your support uh, to, to support the program Meals on Wheels. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, some of my recommendations for budget cuts would be to take the uh, garage out of the budget for now, um, because as, as we have heard, it's probably gonna be unnecessary in the future, and why pay for something for 30 years if it's gonna be redundant or unnecessary 10 years from now? Um, take out the funding and support for Highway Bridge over San Lorenzo. Uh, no Highway 1 and Highway 9 expansion. And institute a buy only electric car policy for the city. And a policy to get to zero emissions by 2025. Um, already talked about the Women's Self Defense Project 20K. Project Connect, uh, Meals on Wheels. Uh, these are all things that should be added to the budget, I should say. Uh, Janus, Tenant Legal Services, Heritage Tree Fund, and the Council Member Assistance Fund. Um, so it would be nice if the Council Members had people helping them like they do in the county, probably not at the same level that the county has assistance, but. Uh, Anyway, I, I know this is a tough job and anything we can do to make it better, you know, make it easier on the council members. Um, the library garage project should be uh, put on hold until there's some public hearings after the uh, three uh, council members get done doing their research on this whole thing. Thank you. I can say good evening now, because I've been here through the afternoon. My name is Gina Cole, and I'm representing Bike Santa Cruz County. I'm asking you to consider uh, fully funding our, uh, Cal our Open Street Santa Cruz. Um, it's, a, it's, I think, on our fifth year. Uh, it will be our fifth year in October. Um, it's a very well-attended event. It talks about all of our, and, it, and it reinforces all the things that people have talked about already with, um, in response to climate change. It encourages folks to ride their bikes in a car-free environment. Um, it has become a really great resource fair for local agencies to participate in, and um, it brings an element of fun along with education to the city. Um, we just finished Open Streets Watsonville. We had 96% uh, of folks that came said that they would do it again. Um, we're working so hard to be able to continue that kind of event in in Santa Cruz. Um, other communities have done it. Uh, Santos, or sorry, Salinas has Ciclovia, which is another really, really popular event. Um, if we're looking outside of the U.S., um, there, are, uh, I think it's Quito. Um, that shuts down freeways um, every Sunday for the afternoon so that folks can get out and experience that car-free 
um, kind of pop-up recreation event. So again, I would encourage you to continue funding this event um, as it benefits the whole community. Thank you. Okay, so I, um, I will go ahead and uh, bring it back now to uh, Council uh, Deliberation and Action. Um, Marcus, I'm wondering if we want to go ahead and take care of items three and four, if there's not sure. any further kind of uh, discussion or uh, detailed discussion in regards to those items, mm -hmm. and then we can revisit items uh, one and two. Does that feel okay? Yeah. Okay, I'll look for a motion there. I'll go ahead and move item number three and number four. Okay. Second. Okay, so that's a uh, motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Could you wanna walk us then through um, motion number one or scenario number one? No. So essentially, uh, as the handout shows you on page one, we have $2.09 million of additions. It's the same list you've seen before, except for the council assistance. Four of the items have already been flagged as directions already been provided. So we've already got four of the motions approved. So, able for questions or motions in total. And okay. we've got this all, at this level, it's all factored into our adopted budget. Okay, so maybe um, what would uh, expedite the conversation is if there are any of the subcategories within this proposal that the council wants to address, yes. that we can go ahead and uh, remove those, move the remainder and have to further discussion at that time. Does that feel appropriate? Okay, given the uh, list before us and the list on the hand uh, handout that we received, I can get that out. Um, which uh, items would you like further discussion around in terms of scenario number one? Council Member Brown? Well, I actually have, uh, uh, question because I'm looking at the the list and foster grandparent is not on there. It was on the list that I initially gave uh, my council colleagues and the staff and I believe it went up on the budget solutions into the um, the spreadsheet on that first day. So I'm not sure why it's not there now. That was five thousand um, dollars for foster grandparent. Okay. With a nine to one match, I will remind everybody nine to one match that they get from other funders. I don't I don't think that's a controversial item. I have my understanding is go ahead. Councilor Matthews. Is that already partially funded through was, I think it was a set aside fund is, that is now expired. Okay. No, and so I think if, but I do recall that and um, we'll go ahead and maybe if we could add it as maybe C18, unless anybody wants to pull that, we'll just go ahead and incorporate it into the maybe consent package. Yeah. I, so okay. so my, another a comment, um, it's, um, we're not making real progress here, but um, uh, the I, that was, um, I ha propose, but I, I wasn't going to do it without putting it before my council colleagues, because since we all saw it in the first place, the um, the funding for Janice, which is really um, was kind of a, a symbolic support for them. Um, I think that there's a longer term conversation that we need to have about funding for um, substance abuse programming and Janice in particular, and save that for another time. Okay. So we can trade those and. Again, not much progress, but there we are. Okay, so maybe before. If that's okay with, I mean, again, I wanted to see how that feels for. So maybe colleagues. I think if, if I could, um, since maybe Councilmember Brown, you have the floor and then we'll move over to Councilmember Matthews. Are there any of the subcategories that you are proposing be pulled for further discussion? Are you uh, within this package uh, feeling uh, supportive at this time? Um. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Um, I have a couple that I would like to uh, pull for further discussion, and I would like to add for discussion um, uh, reinstating funding for first alarm for targeted neighborhood um, uh, intervention. We have had a lot of correspondence uh, and distress um, since our initial action, um, and I do think there's significant value to having some funds there, not probably at the level that they've been allocated in the past, but to my mind, there's real value for uh, having uh, some funds available to allocate as needed. So I would like to um, put a line item and come back to what uh, what we might um, allocate to that. So I guess that would be, yeah. I think that that's an add is, are you comfortable with the package then as presented before? No, I would like to um, uh, re-look at the additional 30,000 for tenant legal, servants, legal services. Um, uh, I 
was um, I accepted the increase in our initial initial budget discussion to thirty thousand. To my mind, this is a still a pilot um, program, and I'm not comfortable with that. So I'd like to re-examine C11. Um, I would also like to um, re-examine the heritage tree um, uh, allocation for 25. Um, so I'd like to pull those two for further discussion. Um, I'm a huge lover of trees, but we've heard testimony that um, uh, there's not been a high demand for this, and this is a year when we have to make some tough decisions. So we have um, C11 pulled, C13 pulled, and then we also have the addition as C18, a foster grandparent at 5,000, um, and first alarm as a pending additional uh, and, line item. And then possibly pulling Janice, correct? No, I think it was the state. Oh, did you wanna pull Janice? I was just suggesting that we trade, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to trade, trade foster grandparent for Janice, yeah. but um, because the, the Janice allocation was really a symbolic gesture of I support see. that we are <coughs> most likely gonna be making in other ways. Okay. Um, and that's a longer term funding conversation. And okay. if, I, if I could add to that, in, with previous discussions between the two of us, that's not buying us any services or anything. It was truly symbolic. So okay. I'm comfortable making that switch out. Okay, so now Janice will become, okay, you already did it. Yeah. Oh, no, you didn't do it. That'll be the foster grandparent match. At 5,000. At 5,000. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Okay, are there any additional polls? Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings? Not from this. I, have a, okay. I actually had a question. Um, well, I'll, I'll get through the polls first, and then I'd okay. like to revisit an item around vehicle purchases for the potential of, of um, making back about $66,000. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, see if there's any additional uh, items to be pulled at this time. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Cron. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about C7. I mostly information um, with the note there uh, about long meetings. So I just want to understand if we can contain ourselves and maybe save some money. I don't know. Um, should I ask that now, or you want to come back? Here maybe we'll come back. Yeah, okay. we'll come back. Yeah. Any additional? My other ones have been pulled. The other ones have been pulled. Yes. Councilmember Cohn. Um, it's not, I mean, just well, I guess we'll talk about the heritage tree. Um, I would like to put that the C10 back in there. Um, for is is that what you're asking for? I think right, if you right want now? to pull it, we can have to further discussion about it. So we'll go ahead and pull that, and then we'll move all the other items, and then we'll revisit them one by one and get consensus for the majority of the council on those. That's sort of the process. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the person at the podium brought up the thing about the um, CIP, and uh, we, we never actually did talk about the CIP this year uh, that I can recall. I mean, maybe I missed that one, but we were going to, and then we just kind of kind of dropped off. All, all the, all the uh, departments, the various departments presented, but we never got into the CIP. Yeah, I mean, it was included in their departmental presentations. Um, it is part of the whole budget. We don't end up spending a lot of time in a lot of the operations, uh, but certainly the whole budget includes that. And if there's certain projects you want to talk about or table or... Yeah, I would, I would want to talk about some projects when it's, when okay. it's the right time. Um, maybe we could do that after we go ahead and get through these and see if there's any additionals. Okay, any other items to be pulled? Councilmember Myers. I just have an item to add. I'd like to revisit um, open streets once we've kind of gotten through some of the other items. Okay. Okay. So we um, at this time have C7, which is the community TV contract increase. We have the uh, further discussion on C10, the assistance, uh, the contract with tenant legal services, C11. A C13, further discussion around the heritage tree. We swapped Janice for the foster grandparents, and we will have further conversation around open streets, first alarm potentially, um, the women's self-defense, and I believe uh, any other CIP questions. Is that correct? Councilor um, Matthews? On the women's self-defense, which is really CPBAW budget, um, my understanding it's not about the amount, it's how the, the money division. is spent. Okay. And that to me is a different question than amounts of money. So. Okay, we'll go ahead and table that for that, for this, for at this moment, okay? 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and table that at this moment. Okay, so all those in favor of the other uh, proposed recommendations, please say aye. Oh, wait, no, wait, sorry. Is there a motion? Uh, I'll move I'll move the the remaining items. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead. Okay, we have a vice mayor second. Can you say so what those items Brown. are? So that's items one through six. That's not including a C7. Items eight, uh, a, eight and nine and their various um, sub sections. Um, that's including item C12, item C14 through 17 as well. With 18 and 19 additions. I'm sorry, with 18 and 19 additions. But C16 is um, out, right? C16 is out, yes. Read it out. And this would be the one that includes the rental housing task force, or yes, include? this is this I, the rental housing task force is C four. <coughs> that would be included. In here. That would be included. Okay, okay, Councilmember Glover. Thanks. I just want to say something on the Janus change out because um, while I understand that the fifty four hundred dollars was purely symbolic in nature, some could argue that fifty four hundred dollars is a couple months of pay for someone, or you know, and uh, as we heard from Mr. Escalante. Uh, earlier this afternoon, one of the criticisms that he had of the city was that we haven't given anything to Janice as far as a uh, supportive monetary contribution. So if we're going to be having that conversation on the 25th and we're going to be uh, encouraging Janice to be paying higher wages and we're going to be ideally taking more of a proactive role in figuring out maximizing mental health and substance use disorder services, <clears throat> it seems unfortunate to remove that $5,400 from the budget um, just because, uh, and then, uh, you know, so I would much rather figure out where we can get another $5,000 from somewhere else uh, and include that in the foster grandparents and the Janus uh, monies. I would just hope that we could do that. Okay, well we could, we could revisit that also in terms of an additional line item. So we'll go C16. C16 has been changed, but if we do want to add at a certain point, we can go ahead and relabel that. Yeah, that's I'll, the question. I'll go ahead and pull C16. Okay, uh, Council Member Cohen. With respect to the, Rental Housing Task Force. So, so you're saying that that is going to that, that 250 is going to be included in this right here. It's going to be removed from funding and then contingent on what happens later tonight. Okay. We fund it, More then cuts we have to make here. these cuts over here. So we're sort of adopting two different yes. sort of we're versions of that. Well, there's other revenue we can go for. So but for the purposes of where we're at today, we need to adopt a budget. So we'll adopt two versions of that, and um, there will be impacts based on what yes. that becomes in terms of a financial constraint. Okay, so all those in favor of uh, the items before us, uh, absent the ones that have been pulled, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So uh, Donna, do you wanna, um, Councilmember Myers, do you wanna to touch on the community TV? I'm just curious how this gets calculated. I mean, if I'm, I'm It's just, really the hourly uh, rate and so, if for some reason their council meetings are shorter, then we won't have to pay it because so, you know, you, we fund what we think is uh, gonna be used, but if, if for some reason it doesn't uh, end up being that amount, then it's not fully expended. Okay, that's that was my main if question. If I can just add Thank really you. quick, they actually amended their contract due to the long meeting to account for overtime and missed meals. Okay. So we had to factor those in also. Okay. And is that, um, is that based on an eight, eight hour day primarily? Eight hour days. And anything yeah. after eight hour was a dollar amount. It's appropriate. Okay. okay. Do you want to go ahead and move that then? Yeah, I'll go ahead and move item C7. Okay. Second. So the council member Myers as seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item C10. Um, and uh, council member Crone, did you want to talk to this item? That's the uh, removal of the council member c city council assistance. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> I know council members know what, what kind of work that we're up against right now and or have been. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to keep a calendar, you know, scheduling stuff, note taking. Um, just answering emails is just an amazing, you know, sort of, and, and, I, and I fear that a lot of emails do not get 
you know, responded to that we have. Um, and, I, and, I, and with all due respect, it used to be that the, the mayor would do that, but it's, I think it's just overwhelming right now. I don't, I don't know if we have the, the capacity to do that. And um, also with all the, you know, I, I asked um, Marcus, I don't know if he was able to do it, to bring back like the, uh, what, what are we talking about in the first responder fee? Is there a guesstimate on that along with the increased speech meter fee, the uh, credit card cost recovery, um, and the fuel uh, recovery fee from three to 4%? Um, do you have any of? They're already built into the staff report, so those those estimates are already in the budget. How, how much are they? Uh, 264 for the first responder. That's our projected estimate for the year one. 264k. Yes, 264,000. It'll likely be higher in year two, but year one will be a little bit less. And that's already built in. We're already assuming that's coming. Right. We have to come back to council and set that up, of course. Parking permit you took action on earlier today. That's 63,000. The credit cards is 217000 That's already built into the budget, and that's set to go live July 1st. The fuel, we, we're estimated about 8000 and that's already built in. If I could, um, what I'm, if, I, if I could, for what I'm hearing you say, Councilman Cronin, is you'd like to add that line item back in, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so for the 175000 Yes. Okay. And then I'll just go ahead and say, I think we'll go ahead and break at 6.30 tonight. So whatever um, the process would be, given that we will need a break before oral communications, you know, you can let us know, okay? Okay. Council Member uh, Myers. I just have a process question. So are we gonna go motion by motion uh, for each of these then? Yeah. Or, so is there, are we doing discussion on the council assistance? I think if we want to incorporate it, we should do the discussion. I mean, I will say that, you know, I feels, I completely understand we have a lot on our plates and given the situation that we're in today and the amount of cuts that we're gonna to have to make in terms of services, I personally don't feel comfortable with adding a line item for that for myself. I'm happy to, um, if that's the direction that the council wants to go in to allocate the 25,000 per person um, to go back into uh, potentially a parks and rec program that might have been cut as a result of that. Um, Councilmember uh, Myers. Yeah, I similarly, um, I don't really support the this action either, but if it does pass, um, similarly, I'd like to, to uh, use my amount to um, fully fund open streets. So add seven, seven back into their budget and then um, support a parks and rec uh, or a similar program with mine, uh, with my share of that. Okay, so that would then take it down to 125,000. Well, it's still an ad though, it's still. Sorry. It, it's still adding. Having. It's still adding, yeah. so I think we're just sort of, we're just chipping away if that's the thing. Instead of spending it here, spend it there. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and Open Streets is funded, so. It's fully funded. Oh. Okay, yeah. then, yeah. Okay. Never mind. Um, no, I guess, yeah, <laughs> never mind then. Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Matthews. Well, there's no motion on the floor, but just speaking to the discussion, um, I am not in favor of this. And what I am really not in favor of is saying, well, everyone gets 25,000 to spend. We had this thing of council spending accounts and I believe we trimmed that further from what it was. So um, either we're gonna give everyone a 25,000 discretionary fund or we're gonna be disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe in the interest so, of trying to move us along, do, happy to entertain a motion at this time on this. This would be, specific, excuse me, um, this would be specifically to alleviate, you know, workload and address stuff that, that's not being addressed. I mean, getting back to um, constituents who aren't getting back to currently. Uh, I, I think it's a real, I mean, I don't know if you all don't share that, that but I, I definitely have uh, encountering that and I spent a lot of time on this job. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, if I if I could, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion in this in this way. Oh, I, I would make a motion to um, add restore the one hundred and seventy five for council assistance. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Crone. Is there a second? I mean, I just uh, I support the notion of assistance for council members. I am. Uh, I think, I think that there needs to be a conversation with the revenue subcommittee to figure out how we can generate additional revenue to justify if we're having to make all these other cuts. <clears throat> it's just, it's really, uh, 
it's tough when we're making all the other, other choices. So just wanted to say say that. Okay, so um, so seeing that there's not a second for the motion, then we'll go ahead and have that um, not be incorporated, the 175,000 for the lack of a second. Okay, so that then will take us to the um, tenant legal services. Oh, Councilor Brown. Before we go on, can I? Um, so, I mean, I have really mixed feelings about this too because of the cuts that we're having to make. If we were in better financial shape, I would absolutely support this right now. Um, but I also don't want it to get lost. Um, so uh, Council Member Glover made the comment about um, revisiting this. I mean, I, I would I would provide more um, like explicit direction to revisit this um, either um, in, in conversation with the revenue subcommittee's work and or at, you know, at, at uh, you know, a future, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to just clarify that we're gonna, it's gonna come back and it's not gonna just get lost here. Um, I think if I could, and then I'll go ahead and have uh, Vice Mayor Cummings weigh in. Uh, uh, City Manager Martin Bernal was mentioning with the restructure, there would be uh, sort of this revisiting of how <laughs> the city manager's office is structured in terms of supports. So I do, uh, if my understanding is that's being factored in in this regard, is that correct? Yeah, uh, a couple of thoughts. One is uh, you can certainly also talk about this as part of your strategic planning process. It might be, you know, a forum to sort of prioritize things. Uh, so that's one way to continue the discussion. Uh, but yes, uh, we are, uh, we uh, are changing our office staffing because, you know, recognizing that uh, uh, there is a real need for particularly administrative support and there's other work. I mean, the staff couldn't do the political work, I think that maybe some of the council members might, might, might like, but with respect to admin support, like uh, helping with emails and scheduling and, and that sort of thing, we will have more support to do that. And we have been increasing that certainly for the mayor uh, in, in recent months. And we'll, we plan to continue that as we staff up in our office to be able to do that. We've had vacancies that have prevented us from doing that. So we are looking at that, recognizing that there is a, there is a, a real need because uh, you are overwhelmed with quite a bit of, of uh, correspondence and, and other issues and would be willing to certainly uh, work with the council to try to see how we can meet that given our circumstances and what we have. Sure. Happy to do that. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to express as well that I understand Councilmember Crone's concern with the need for assistance and it's great to hear that, um, that the city manager's office is gonna be providing more assistance for city council members. I'm also, one of the things I wanted to to circle back to, and I think that a number of the other city council members may have concerns around or uh, suggestions for ways for other areas to make cuts. And I'm just um, also wondering whether or not, you know, if we can have discussion around that and maybe then consider whether or not um, some of those funds can be used to fund assistance as well. Because I know we mentioned vehicles and I'd, I have a few questions around vehicle purchases for this year um, that I wanted to raise that could potentially lead to savings around um, purchasing new vehicles. So I just wanted so, to put that out there. Okay, so at this time, um, uh, okay, Council Member Brown. Well, I just have a clarifying question because, um, you know, the restructuring of staffing and, um, you know, how that, how, the, what the, the various uh, staff members in the city manager's department are gonna be doing is um, a, a conversation I'm looking forward to having, but I guess I'm just wondering, um, will that come to us in his agenda item where we can actually have a discussion and maybe make decisions about whether or not we want in the future to reconsider council assistance in light of the restructuring? Maybe it's gonna, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I don't, I'd like to see that be more, there be more, an, a more explicit opportunity, an actual opportunity to have that conversation and not just via an update or what we see happening in the office. I think, I think that's, that's definitely possible. Um, I just wanna keep us, uh, we have uh, about 10 more minutes before we're gonna go ahead and break for our dinner and then return back for our evening item. So um, I get that there's a lot of unknown kind of questions. It's here. just, I'm trying to clarify that so we don't, Otherwise, I feel like I'd want to have the conversation now and I'd prefer that we just have another opportunity to do it in, okay. for the sake of time. Did you have a response, City Manager Martin? I was just gonna say, it's, it's up to council. So if, you, if you'd like to have a process to have a discussion, uh, whether it's a subcommittee or again, whether it's something that you would discuss at the strategic planning session and then there, you know, provide direction, um, it, it's up to you. Um, and then we can delve into the options and pros and cons and that sort of thing. Councilmember Myers, and then Councilmember Myers up first. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, did, okay. You can go, Cynthia. Okay. Um, I think the appropriate uh, venue for this discussion is uh, around the restructuring of your office and, and when it's had time to get up and running. Um, I think support for council members, many activities and assignments is important. Um, but I think it's, it is equally important that we see how the restructuring is functioning because if we're looking at what are we going to do with 175,000? I mean, we have cut a whole lot of really important city services already. I mean, whether it's parks and rec or public works or planning or whatever, I mean, a whole lot of things have already taken a big cut. So um, I don't like to take any one thing necessarily. I, I would like to have this discussion in the context of the functioning of the city manager's office. Right. Yeah, and I'm happy to discuss that. I don't want to give the impression that we're adding a bunch of staff or anything like that. I think the biggest changes, of course, are that, uh, you know, we've had vacancies. We're going to be able to fill one, the one vacancy that we've had uh, vacant for about a year. Um, and so we can, uh, because of that, uh, reallocate to some extent. The other part of it, again, also just relates to workload and our work plan and what you do. That's why I think that's important. So um, to the extent that that is, 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 is addressed, that'll help also with being able to provide their re those resources. That's been a challenge as well. Councilmember Meyer. I think I'll, uh, that discussion sort of hit some of my questions. Okay. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and then move on then to, <coughs> excuse me, C11 for a discussion around tenant legal services. Yeah, I asked for that to be discussed. Um, as I mentioned uh, in pulling it, um, this was originally, the tenant legal services was originally recommended by the Housing Blueprint Committee, and uh, I think 15,000 was allocated for that. When it came to the Council for Action earlier this year, that amount got doubled to 30,000. Um, and still no contract, no, um, uh, no uh, formal arrangement that had been mutually agreed upon. Um, I was willing to accept that. It is a pilot program. There's clearly a need for um, uh, information for tenants, but I am not comfortable adding yet another 30,000. So um, I would like to uh, remove the addition and keep the allocation at 30,000. Okay. And if I could, I, if I recall that one of the thoughts was that if and when we get a sort of a mid-year um, kind of update, then we could revisit allocating the additional 30,000. So do we want to put aside that 30,000 and revisit it then, or was it the 60,000 that was um, voted upon? If my understanding was, was 30,000, well, we can revisit it. To it was a 30. It was 30. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so to increase the total of 60,000. 30 is already there. 30 is in. So this and would be adding closer. another 30, doubling it to 60. Okay. So okay. it would be deferring to 30 well, from year. I mean, or, let's move okay. this along. I'm just going to move that we delete the additional 30,000. Okay, and keep it up. Second that. Uh, okay, so a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember uh, Myers, uh, Councilmember uh, Glover, Brown, and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you. Um, so tenant protections and tenant education is incredibly important. I'm just curious because I'm I, I'm not sure how I've missed it, but uh, where did the additional thirty thousand allocation come from on top of the thirty thousand that we? Someone's suggestion. It was a council request. Council request. Made. Oh, that was one of the. Was that one of the ones in the packet that you suggested, Councilman Brown? Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So it was that was based on a uh, uh, budget that was provided to us to all of the council members um, about what it would take to annually fund with uh, attorneys um, the the tenants legal services program. So sixty thousand is about half of a year. Um, so because we had the 15,000 earmarked, which we two years ago uh, intended to be the uh, pilot project uh, program and then um, funded at a, a more robust um, level, uh, <clears throat> we added the 15. So I suggested adding another 30 to get them through a year at or half, that, that's half of their cost because I don't know that we ought to be funding the entire program right. and certainly not indefinitely. Um, so this was my attempt to provide them with a year of support. Um, and, but given that things have been delayed, I think um, waiting to uh, consider allocating the additional 30,000, I mean, I'm okay with that because they're not gonna spend it right this moment, but I would um, wanna make sure that it gets considered at um, our, our budget, um, midterm budget review. 
Yeah, just uh, so I, I would then ask uh, for there to be an amendment to the motion to direct for the revenue subcommittee to specifically look at the uh, allocations or potential increase to allocations to the rental uh, or tenants education and protections group. Uh, speaking to that, if I may, I don't think that's the function of the revenue subcommittee. The revenue subcommittee is, is, as I understand, it's traditionally been looking at what are big picture sources of additional revenue to support big picture general fund and capital expenditures, not line items. But just in in that, I, I okay. Um, so I understand how things may have worked in the past and totally get that that's how things have been done. What I'm hoping is that with the conversation of revenue generation, that we are looking at the macro large scale version of everything, but also while looking at that large scale view, we're also taking into consideration the smaller needs for uh, incremental increases to the, either the general fund, because that's where this money's got, coming from, uh, or other ways that we can generate revenue to support underfunded things that need specific attention, um, whether or not the money goes directly to them or whether it gets allocated to the general fund for us to be able to decide later on where to go, we need to think ahead of time of, okay, well, if we're going to be increasing funding for tenant protections or tenant education, then we need to be thinking about that with the amount of money that we're focusing on generating in the revenue subcommittee. So I hear what you're saying, but I hope that you can understand that we need to start thinking of things in different ways than we always have, because that has resulted in us being in a $3.9 million deficit. Okay, just maybe for the interest of time, I don't think that this necessarily has to have uh, an outcome this evening in regards to potential um, efforts on behalf of the Revenue Committee, but in, in regards to the specific motion before us, we have the tenant legal services um, maintaining the $30,000 $30, and then revisiting um, based on uh, any kind of input that we receive or outcomes that we receive from their efforts as to whether or not at the mid-year time we'd want to, to increase that to the 60. Is that correct? Just to be clear. What C11 does is add 30,000 to the existing 30,000. And your motion is to remove that additional yes. existing. And that's seconded by Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Brown further um, felt supportive of that, knowing that we could revisit the uh, additional 30,000 mid at mid-year budget. Is that correct? Yeah, if I could just add, I would like to, if it's okay with the maker of the motion and the second, to be explicit that this return to us at midterm budget review. I think that's appropriate. Yeah. And I'll just say, uh, I believe in the action authorizing the 30,000, we asked for a mid-year report. Right. So, right. so it, yeah. uh, I would say at the time we get the mid-year report on the program, we consider Does that continued fill? funding. Sure. Okay, sure. Councilmember. Yeah, Excuse and I, I just would, I would just, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is important work for our community and to support it, I think, um, my main reservation is making sure that we have the performance marks yeah. so that we can yeah. evaluate. And um, also I just want to rem remind our community that we do have about $122,000 um, allocated this year for uh, two rental assistance programs already funded in the budget through economic development. So again, making sure that all of our investments in helping tenants are evaluated and, and, and working well for, for the need is I think my interest. So I'm happy to bring it back mid-year. I think that makes sense. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh. No. Okay, so that passes with Council um, Member Crone voting uh, against. So I will go ahead and uh, suggest that we maybe uh, try to go ahead and cover Heritage Tree. Um, Marcus, in terms of timing today, if we were to get through the heritage tree and, re and have pending a uh, further conversation on first alarm, on uh, any p p potential uh, changes a Vice Mayor Cummings may have in mind in terms of uh, potential revenue increasing um, uh, measures, um, in terms of the women's self-defense, that that could happen at a future time, is that correct, if we get through uh, what absolutely. was? Absolutely, yeah, okay. we can. We can Absolutely. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and finish up the Heritage Tree conversation, and then we'll go ahead and break for dinner and revisit um, the item. So, so, Vice Mayor Cummings. I said one question with regards to this. Is that 25,000, is that the only funding that's available for Heritage Tree? 
additional. And this is an additional 25, 25. on top of, 20, they already have 25. And they've, my understanding from earlier, the conversation was that they've typically used less than $25,000 on heritage trees. No, they use 25 every year, and I think they'd use, they, yeah. they could use, excuse me, they could use another 25. That's, that's why the Parks and Rec Commission uh, asked us. Um, Mr. Elliott already said that they have not like made the program known People don't know, so a lot of times they end up getting a permit to cut the tree down because, you know, we, we they don't have any assistance to take care of the tree. There's like wiring and, you know, different ways of cutting a tree and people feel that they go, go to this fund in order to preserve their heritage tree. So if people knew, more people knew about it, but obviously it's been used up every year, 24, 26, and 23. Uh, we have Tony Elliott here, if you want to provide any clarifications. I, I think that covered it really well, actually. I think, yeah, we spend the 25000 the request before the council is an additional $25,000 um, uh, on top of the budgeted amount. And as I understand it, it's more of, it's a, it's a nice to have, not a need to have, is mm -hmm. sort of the way I understand it. If I could propose maybe a potential solution is that we maintain um, the, uh, the recommendation before us, and then similar to the tenant legal services, revisit the usage at the mid-year budget and then potentially increase it at that time. Because you have it as essentially as a swap to be able to have the IT desk, help desk still Correct. work. Okay. Okay, Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Matthews. I just, um, just being a parks commissioner for three years, um, and we were, uh, I believe, um, the commission that brought back this program at 25, uh, funded at 25,000. Um, my recollection is I believe we only approved one tree removal permit in three years, and, um, but the um, demand for the program was fairly constant, but as Director Elliott has mentioned, um, we never turned anyone away. So um, the way that it's managed is uh, certainly people are um, provided the information. I mean, we had a we had a fairly constant stream of requests, but um, most of our requests were we were able to fully fund uh, the 50% sh cost share. So, in my experience working on these for three years, um, I don't think we. I think, like I said, I think we only approved one removal permit. So I don't think we're losing a lot of trees because we don't have additional funds at this point. I think our community is doing a great job of stewarding their trees right now. So do we want a motion on this on this item at this time? Mm -hmm. Councilor Matthews. Well, um, I'm going to move that we do not uh, double the heritage tree allocation, that we keep it to 25,000 for the coming year. And to use this to restore the IT help desk? As yes. A, as a oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Councilmember Myers. Again, I, I think it's okay to also revisit it at the mid-year budget to see if where the funding is and if we wanted to increase it. We my, my only comment to this is we're, we're looking at things in isolation. We asked all the departments, look at your operations. It's a tough year. You give us your best estimate on how you can preserve services with the least damage to delivery of service take off 4% and they gave us their recommendations. And um, the, the department didn't recommend increasing the heritage tree fund. The parks and rec Depart uh, uh, commission did, that's their prerogative. But I'm not entirely sure that it was driven by uh, an overall picture of the department's needs. And I, I can recall in terms of IT, we recommended a cut of some amount and IT director said, well, we can do that, but I'll tell you, I'd much rather give up that and get this back. So I, it's, it's important to me, if you're gonna get anything restored to Parks and Rec, I'd rather turn back to you and have a deep discussion with your commission. If we're gonna get any extra money, how do we most need to spend it? it I don't get the impression that this is the place. That's a, that's why I'm making the No, motion. I think it's fine. I think, I think, okay. So I think, I mean, just given that we could revisit it at mid-year, maybe that would help move us along this evening for, for tonight's purposes. Is that appropriate for you? Anything can be okay, revisited. Perfect. There you go. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by uh, Councilmember Myers. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, so that fail, that passes with Councilmember Crone voting against and Councilmember Brown voting against. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, break at this time. Um, Marcus, is, is, did you need any additional action? We obviously have some uh, a few further clarification areas, but we don't have time to discuss yeah. those right now. So we'll so, do you need a motion for the for the second potential scenario? We we do. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and entertain mm -hmm. a motion for that. I'll move the second scenario, which I believe the main difference is that the housing task force, the 250,000 would be removed from that, from uh, would not be uh, in the budget, correct? This would give us the option to restore the housing task force. It doesn't authorize it, it depends on what actions happen tonight. So this gives us the ability to restore it. Okay, financially. If motion two is yeah. if it's restored, these things and that these things would be correct would okay. be funded okay yeah. i'll second that motion any further discussion wording, wording wasn't great but okay <laughs> councilmember brown a clarifying question are we just this is just a motion on the authority the contingent authority yes because so we're and we, we need to do that now my understanding we're is we're going to approve the budget later couldn't we just well anyway well, this is the budget approval time yeah. You, you, you could you could at the end of the evening if you wanted to continue this and in the evening close it out the, the only thing is of course that uh, it'll be late in the evening so that you, you could do, you could do that well, um, but my understanding is we're also going to talk about some of these other op other areas right. that and, weren't and, and if you want to talk about those then maybe you can do that but we do we need to do that this evening yes yes yes, yes. okay yeah. okay so we'll just go ahead and continue the item to the evening then I think that makes the most sense correct so we do all of this budget stuff after I, I guess I just didn't want, why would we do contingent authority if we're not actually approving the budget right this moment? We can just do it all later. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so we'll go ahead and break at this time and then we'll uh, return around seven. that motion. It didn't, um, it didn't, it didn't that's fine, yeah. Yeah. Four of us. We'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and call our meeting back to order. Um, at this time, I would like to ask if our city clerk could please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown is currently <laughs> absent. Matthews is currently absent. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Okay, so um, we're going to begin our oral communications. Since we're starting after uh, seven this evening, we'll go ahead and go until 7.35 um, to allow for the full half hour. And so oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. And um, can I get a sense of how many folks are here for oral communications this evening? Okay, you're welcome to line up to my left, and we'll um, go ahead and have that uh, process ensue from that from that in that way. Um, so you'll each what we'll go ahead and do is offer anybody who wants to just briefly address the council in one minute. They're welcome to come forward first, and then we'll go ahead and increase the time to two minutes and um, allow for those that have more to say to uh, use the full two minutes. Um, and so what I would ask is that if you're interested in starting with the one minute time, and I believe um, in the front here, you're, you're just in that and you're welcome to go first. Um, and then we'll go ahead and uh, modify as needed. Okay, go ahead. I hope you can all hear me and see me simultaneously here. So I went to the county supervisor's meeting this afternoon and was happy to see that, um, I'm happy to hear rather, that they have a number of sharks containers available. Um, and I'd love to, on behalf of the Parks and Rec uh, Commission, make the suggestion that we work with them to put those sharks containers around Santa Cruz and specifically in parks with neighborhood approval. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Other member of the community who wants to address this just really briefly in one minute. Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and move it to the two minute time frame and you'll go ahead and go first. Hi, I'm Anna Brooks, uh, City Administrative Assistant and a CIU member.
Although I had testified virtually all previous SCIU contract negotiations in the last 20 years, I decided not to this time. <laughs> I'm here in support of the other bargaining units, particularly those of mid-managers. As an employee, I have few opinions. I don't consider that my function. I do have opinions as a citizen and voter. I saw some previous mid-managers' testimonies about their negotiations, and I read a guest column, a uh, guest editorial in Bruce Bratton's column that wondered about giving managers less so that lower-paid SCIU employees could get more. I had mid-management jobs before I worked for the city. I made a conscious decision to demote myself because although I was good at it, I didn't like being in management. Supervising employees would have been enough of a reason, but I also didn't like some of the other aspects of the complexities and responsibilities of management work. I object to giving mid-managers a lesser deal than that of SCIU employees. I was stunned to learn that at least the OE3 bargaining unit does not have a Me Too clause the way that both union reps and HR have told me SCIU has for financial elements of its contract. I don't know if mid-managers bargaining units other than OE3 have a, a Me Too clause. For mid-managers not to have that clause when SCIU's contract does seems to me at best backwards given managers more complex work and greater responsibilities. I recall Dick Wilson telling me that the fire department once offered to take less during contract negotiations one time so that SCIU could have more. Offering to do that, which I do not suggest, is, to my mind, quite a different thing than the city proposing such an approach. I urge you to recognize the city's mid-managers' contributions and hard work on behalf of our community and negotiate an equitable, equitable contract. I thank you for considering my views. Had I had the information now, I would have said this when SEIU was doing its contract negotiation. Yeah. Okay, next speaker. <clears throat> Hello, I'm nadalex.kennedy at gmail.com, and uh, what I have to say is now marijuana is legal, but you can't smoke it anywhere in public. We need to offer people a better alternative than smoking at their dealer's li living room. Uh, what we need is some cannabis pubs that uh, people can go to just like a bar and have it, but uh, we should have five of them licensed the same way we do the cannabis dispensaries. But uh, I, I just wanna start one of them. I wanna put all my energy into that, a cannabis pub where it would say right on the door, no liquor, no tobacco, no outside cannabis right at the door so that people aren't gonna like bring a 40 into the bar or something. Um, but I want to see this happen and I am talking not only to the whole city council here, I'm talking to the public in general, including those on TV. And I need to find people that will invest in this idea, both investing their time and money, because I alone certainly do not have anywhere close to what would be required to get this going, but I have the enthusiasm. All right, more to say. Uh, everybody's heard about what 5G is, the new upgrade from 4G. We don't need it. It is way too fast, and most importantly, it is far too dangerous to have and around, and we need to ban it in the city of Santa Cruz, in the county of Santa Cruz, maybe even statewide or more. That would be awesome. But we need to get rid of 5G because just one example. Thank you. Your time okay, is up. thank you. Okay. Three, four, Next six, speaker. nine, eight, eight, eight. Okay, thank your time you. Is up. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> My name is Elise Casby. I'm a democracy activist working to inform the public about the erosion of our right to free speech and other already advanced forms of fascism in this city. One form of free speech that used to be protected in our city is the right to address our elected officials in front of other members of the public. Democratic procedures such as the public comment section of our regular city council meetings and a free and truly open discourse among members of the public is foundational to the protection of our civil liberties. Free speech and the right to address our elected 
representatives in front of other members of the public are crucial components of a safe and open society, especially one that strives to be democratic. In turn, democracy is one of the important solutions according to many climate change experts. We will need to meet the many profound challenges that climate, global climate change demands of us now. Many people sitting on city councils may not understand the advanced state that fascistic tendencies have already developed to. We need our public comment time to be inclusive to all members of the public because this is exactly where democracy takes place in our local governments and this force of democracy and free speech fights the authoritarian tendencies and rules from becoming rigidified. A generous public comment time has been historically observed, even by conservative mayors here in Santa Cruz. Everybody who showed up was given at least a minimum of time to address their city representatives. Council members, I urge you to protect our free speech, that is our public comment section of the agenda. We must have, at the very least, a generous allowance of time for public comment every time we have a city council meeting. This is the only place in our local government where the public may freely address our city government in front of other members of the public and therefore with a minimum of transparency. It balances the control by city staff of the governmental process. Thank you. Nicholas uh, Whitehead, I feel I must castigate those members of this council who have failed to uphold our American tradition of free speech often the only resort of us, the people, against tyrannies of property, privilege, and high wealth. I feel I must castigate those on the council who endorsed or permitted the mayor's action in curbing the time allowed to public comment. I particularly excoriate those who stood by, pathetically, as the mayor acted in her arbitrary manner. It should have been their responsibility to advise the mayor to constrain herself, not constrain our thoughts and words. As things stands, we've allowed one individual to set up a new regime on public input, cutting back individual and collective time for free speech. This particular mayor, as well as the last one, have been extremely rude to elders of the community, including highly respected former office holders, disallowing completion of one or two sentences. Even people with speech impediments or tardy in their remarks can be dislodged with the electronic buzzer. We've obviously reached a new low in civility towards the public, especially toward those residents who are out of favor with the council minority. I believe that spurious attacks on Councilman Drew Glover from the very beginning were false and orchestrated, setting up a bogus atmosphere of tension that works against the process of democracy. I feel the necessity to impugn that particular entity which I believe stands behind it, that entity being the once progressive, now bitterly reactionary Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz County. In the past, we were all colleagues in advancing human rights, labor rights, and environmental protections. Sadly, now we are divided along lines of economic status, educational privilege, and property ownership. I wish we could restore goodwill between our political factions and quit all the disrespect. Good evening. My name is Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union. I just wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that I will be traveling to Washington, D.C. from the 17th to the 19th for the Poor People's Moral Action Congress. And we're also going to be trying to reestablish the um, National Homeless Union. And we will be heavily talking about the homeless issues and things that have happened here in Santa Cruz. And so I just wanted to let you know that I, I am hoping to learn a lot, um, establish connections and bring that knowledge back to you. And so the issues that have happened here in Santa Cruz are being talked about <laughs> nationally. And so I just want to take the opportunity to let you guys know that and say, you know, I hope everybody's surviving in this heat and have a good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Rick Longinati. I'm from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, the state of California, a lot like a lot like our city, struggling to match our transportation policy with our climate goals. A uh, piece of legislation that passed in the state requires that there's a change in the way the California Environmental Quality Act 
deals with new development. So the way it's up to, been up to now, if there's a large new development, say, in downtown, uh, that development generates car trips, and there's money set aside in the traffic impact fee to widen intersections or otherwise expedite traffic flow because there's something called level of service, which is a measure of traffic delay that's supposed to be mitigated. Level of service is no longer gonna be a criteria for mitigation. Instead, when there's a new project that generates new traffic, the money to the traffic impact fee needs to go to reduce vehicle miles traveled. So that means it could be a, b a bus improvement, a walking improvement, bicycling improvement. Um, we're required as a city to get on board with that by June of next year. Uh, there are items in your budget already that could conform to that. If you remove the intersection widening items on Highway 1, you'll get a head start on that. Um, and of course, uh, money for the garage library is still in the budget, even though there's been a subcommittee set up to look at alternatives for that. So just in terms of public process and credibility, it would be good to remove that from the budget. Thank you. Pauline Seals, Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. I would like to ask you to take a very serious look at health in all policies that we learned about, I think a week ago. Um, it seemed like an excellent program that allowed a creative way to address all kinds of problems, human problems, climate change problems, and others without greatly expanding the budget. The city of Gonzales, which was one of the presenters, I, don't, I didn't look at the numbers, but I just can't imagine that's a wealthy city. It's not Palo Alto or Las Gatos or someplace like that. And if they can do it, I think Santa Cruz could, and I think it would allow us a fresh look at a way, different way to do business that's already been tried and established in some places and people who are very happy to talk to us and explain what they've done. So I ask you to put some priority onto that, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Susan Worth, SoCal. Um, I, I did read that the um, library project, the bury the library deal under the garage has been, t is being tabled for how long? Three months or does it, anybody have an answer on that? Go ahead. You know, you, you can um, go ahead and address us. If we can answer your questions, we'll do so after your two Okay. Minutes. Okay. Well, anyway, I wanted to speak up once again for those over 200 year old trees that are in that parking lot that um, <clears throat> can't speak up for themselves. And I also would like to have the um, San Lorenzo Park better utilized. I don't know why we do, why we as, as pride, for our beautiful pride parade, why we don't get to end up there anymore, but it used to be a beautiful place and the performers on the duck stage was just fantastic. And I think we should be using that park and have something going every weekend instead of putting fences up and we should restore all of our drinking fountains because we got 140% of our rain and we've got a disabled drinking fountain out here. We've got a dead one in, in, the, in the San Lorenzo Park. The only place adults can go is in the in the playground to get a drink of water. So, you know, why don't we restore some drinking fountains? Okay, thank you. Before we begin your time, are there any other members of the community that would like to address the council at this time during oral communications? Okay, I see two additional folks. Okay. Members of the community and city council, um, Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, the group I'm with, and Conscience in Action do meet tomorrow. Everyone's invited to come to the Sub Rose at 11. This council has been stymied and stalemated in terms of any progressive action for the last six months. The most basic issues have been blocked by agenda manipulation, a campaign of intimidation against public and progressive council members who ran for city council on pretty clear platforms. I mean, it's amazing. For example, there was a, a debate where every single city council member running aspirant 
who were, was trying to get on city council promised to immediately attempt to reopen the Loudon Nelson bathrooms. This council has done nothing to do that. So it is now, we have continued closed bathrooms as well as the ones out here. I continue to mention it because it's just it's sort of the most obvious example of something that ordinary people at home don't have to worry about who have homes, but those who are outside and are crapping in their pants uh, are in fact in the middle of, because this council is too busy writing rather than listening to the public as they speak, and listening, truly listening to the public. I don't just mean nodding and looking up from what they're doing, but actually paying attention to the issues. I mean, you need a restoration of real, uh, of needle exchange in the city, which was done behind closed doors. You need to end the drug war here in Santa Cruz, which is still alive. You need to stop police. And by, by you, I'm of course talking to the council, which is always a mistake and I keep doing it every two weeks. But it's really the community that I am addressing that needs to take action, direct action of different kinds to address uh, a police force that's out of control with Parks and Rec Rangers now backing them up to criminalize homeless people who have no legal place to go. Susie O'Hara's concerns, comments, and so forth exactly. notwithstanding. Okay. Our next speaker. Thank you. Let's go right ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah Manildi, um, Santa Cruz. Um, I had the privilege of going to one of your special meetings. I didn't know what it was about, but it was close to my house and I went. And I really was pleased to see how the woman whose profession this is, is trying to encourage relationship among city council members and ways of speaking to one another because politics is divisive and it is difficult and she wanted the council members to come here and be allowed to be effective and, you know, Govern. <laughs> so anyway, I wasn't here for this, but I did read like <laughs> what happened and that, you know, closing down the city council and da, da 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 I realize people in Santa Cruz get rambunctious. I really have a hard time with it sometimes. The shouting, the yelling, the sloganeering, the fisting, all that. But I, I feel helpless and I'm trying to work my way out of certain helplessness, but I want to feel like the city council is strong enough in itself and its own ideas and its beliefs that got them elected to maintain the meeting and to maintain this place the way you should. You're all intelligent. I don't believe in denigrating the city council. You're all intelligent, gifted, caring, working people. So don't let someone who's fist going Heil Hitler, God only knows what, disrupt the entire meeting. I think it really takes away from democracy. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Susan Cavallari from Santa Cruz. I just wanted to bring up the um, idea of zero waste policies for the city of Santa Cruz. It was just reported that there is a lot of plastic in Monterey Bay. Um, and this is definitely an issue for the fish that are eating it and that we eat the fish. And so plastic is becoming more and more part of human bodies. Um, fossil fuels are used to make plastic and um, more of fossil fuel is being uh, shunted into plastic. And so there is a need to stop uh, the use of plastic. Um, and also the county is working on a zero waste um, policy. So I think it would also be good for the city to work on this too. Thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council on any item that's not on today's agenda during oral communications? Okay. Um, You'll probably be. You can do it. Uh, I respect everybody here and how hard they work, and there's a lot of division, I know. We just got to keep working for harmony and work all together on this harmony that we have here, hopefully that we have, and make our community fun again. People need to get out and start being like on the mall, doing music, going and conversating instead of being hiding in the boxes so much. We need to start moving forward and finding solutions to these problems that we have. I'm disappointed that the council members who didn't show up at Ross camp when they put it down, 
I, I would have liked that they would have showed up. I'm, I'm impressed that the people showed up that were trying to support it. I think that we need to go for, keep finding more solutions to this. You know, once we've closed this camp down, these people have kind of been, their lives have been destroyed, disrupted. And so I know you all care to all the various degrees. So just keep looking for the, for the places to do like little houses, places for people that park <coughs> safely, and keep fighting for not having so much hate and division, you know, and not, not having so much. It's like when I heard take back Santa Cruz, that really was insulting to me. How about give back Santa Cruz? You know, it's not, we're not taking, what does that say, stealing? Removing, right? Let's help each other. Let's start trying to work together more. You know, and, and the thing with the, the global, global action thing, I've, I've been seeing people and I've been seeing how much waste we still have, like these buildings around here at night, there's lights on all over the place, all these lights, lights, lights. I've encountered a man who is in the dump truck at Harvey West Park in a city truck and the, and the vehicle was idling for a long time. He was on the cell phone. Was he doing business or was he talking to his friends? Just wasting energy. Okay, thank you. I said there's a 90 second rule and he, he goes, go walk away. Okay. Okay, are there any other members of the community who wants to address this during oral communications? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close oral commu communications at this time and we'll transition into our evening item. Um, and that is uh, just, we have one item on tonight's agenda and it's our rental, final rental housing situation assessment report. And we have uh, our staff uh, coming forward as well as um, our guest here, Mr. Esepos, nice to see you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, the Planning Director, and <clears throat> this item really needs no introduction. It's something that's been uh, on many people's mind in the community for quite some time. And um, this evening, we're pleased to have Dave Seppos with us. Uh, he's with the Consensus and Collaboration Program out of Sacramento State University, and he'll be presenting the findings of his analysis. Um, before doing so, we'll have Sarah Fleming to uh, provide a brief overview of the uh, uh, the steps that got us to where we are today, um, as well as some of the bills that we have um, pending uh, in the state legislature that affect um, tenants and landlord relationships. And uh, we'll also have Sarah Noisy with us momentarily. Um, <laughs> and um, yep, here she is. I'll let her in. While you do that, I'll go ahead and just um, also uh, just sort of give the community an overview of what sure. to expect this, this evening. We're going to go ahead and hear a staff presentation, and then we'll go ahead and have any council questions for clarity in regards to the presentation, at which time we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment to provide any input they'd like to on this item, and then return back to council for any action and deliberation, just to kind of give a roadmap for the, for the evening ahead. Could you council presentation? Please. Thank you, so I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Sarah and Sarah. Just pulling up our um, PowerPoint presentation. While you, while you do that, I'll just go, I just also want to take an opportunity to clarify sort of the role of the mayor in terms of this evening's proceedings. Um, it's my responsibility, it's the responsibility of any individual who's uh, elected to serve in this position to ensure that decorum maintains as we move forward with our city government business so that any individual who wants to address us on any item has a right to do so without threat or intimidation. Also in regards to allowing us to have um, a process ensue so that we're able to get through the government business. So it's my responsibility to do that, to facilitate and ensure that this uh, can happen, and I will do so in a way as best I can without um, having to do any kind of extreme sort of measures. And I hope that we can all really uh, participate in this evening's discussion, which I was a part of for many, many years, many months and many meetings and many hours of public testimony. Um, and this really honest uh, assessment from a neutral party 
that at times I think was really quite saddening. And so I hope that when we listen, we can listen with uh, understanding we can't undo the past, with uh, a, f a recognition that there's many elements that bring um, all of us into this report and uh, ownership around that. And then how can we move forward as best we can as a community? And so hopefully tonight we can start the tone in that regard. I think it will be a bit of a difficult presentation to hear considering how it was a difficult presentation to read. Um, and so I, I uh, ask our community to um, rise to the occasion and I will do my best to ensure that, that we're all allowed a process to uh, participate in this uh, evening's discussion without uh, disruption. Okay, so we'll go ahead and ask uh, staff to take it away. Now your PowerPoint is open. Good evening, my name is Sarah Noisy. I'm a senior planner in the advanced planning section. And um, I've been working with um, Sarah Fleming, Lee Butler, and um, our consultant Dave Seppos from the Consensus and Collaboration uh, Program out of Sacramento State University on um, bringing this forward to your council this evening. So just a little bit of background to um, recall how we came to be before you today. <clears throat> um, beginning on December 11th, we staff was given direction to um, begin a process to report about resources that would be needed to establish a task force. We returned January 8th of this year, um, kind of requesting clarification about exactly what the goals were and the timeline for that work. Um, on January 22nd, we received additional direction um, by motion to return with a specifically with a proposal for a task force and about and more information about the resources that would be needed to do a community poll, to do some data, data collection, and then the publicity that we could, would run around that process. We returned on February 12th and um, recommended to your council that we enter into an agreement with um, a neutral third party who could come in and sort of evaluate the situation for us and provide some guidance about how best to proceed um, on this topic. And at that point, your council did give us direction to enter into an agreement with um, CCP, Center for Consensus and Collaboration, um, to assess the situation, engage with stakeholders to a certain degree, and sort of get their arms around what are the key factors that would affect a task force process on the topic of landlord-tenant relationships. So the assessment process um, that has occurred, uh, uh, Mr. Sepos from CCP will go through this in more detail, but um, in a broad view, there were interviews that occurred with each of the city council members in March of 2019. Um, and then the council members each recommended certain stakeholders that would be interviewed, community stakeholders that would be interviewed on this topic, um, both uh, on both people who represent sort of tenants' interests and tenants' um, needs and those that represent the needs and desires of landlords and property owners. Um, the idea was to have a representative cross-section of the community to sort of talk with and learn about this, the whole situation. So then the investigator conducted those interviews, select, selected a final interview, interview list of about 20 interviewees based on a set of standards, and then completed those interviews in April of this year, and then um, also spoke with city staff in April, just as sort of the, the last step, and then has been working on com compiling the final report analysis and recommendations, which was included with your council packet today that was completed in May of this year. So one of the things that was mentioned in the report and that has bearing on um, all of these discussions about the regulations that cover the relationships between landlords and tenants is some legislation that is currently pending at the state level. So um, I was just, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of six of the bills that were proposed this year. Um, just really briefly, and I don't have a ton of detail on either on any of these, but I can answer some questions in terms of the contents. So AB 36 by Bloom would have made some changes to the way Costa Hawkins um, applies to housing, so that instead of housing, instead of Costa Hawkins um, preventing rent control to, uh, from applying to um, anything built after 1995, it would have pre prevent um, rent control from applying to anything that was simply 20 years old. So it would have created sort of a rolling. Um, deadline. So once a uh, building, multifamily building had been in existence um, for 20 years, it would be eligible to be under a local um, rent control ordinance. That bill failed in the assembly, didn't make it out. Um, AB 1188 from um, assembly member Gabriel allows tenants to provide housing for people who are at risk of homelessness for up to 12 months. The landlord is permitted to increase the rent based on that um, occupancy, but the tenants would have the right to provide that housing for a year. 
Um, AB 1399 by Bloom changes the, the Ellis Act, which governs um, rent stabilized units and evictions from rent stabilized units and clarifies how, and changes a little bit how units can be removed from the market and then re-enter the market and, and provides some, um, limits the ability of an owner of a rent stabilized unit to um, pay a fee to avoid offering the unit back to the prior occupant should it leave the market and then re-enter the rental market. So that has passed the assembly and is now in Senate in subcommittees. Um, AB 1481 is one that um, lots of people had been following. That's the one that would have um, created the requirement for a just cause to evict a tenant. Um, that bill <coughs> was withdrawn by the author and um, did not pass out of this assembly. Its companion bill, 1482, by Assemblymember Chu, um, was going to establish some, um, a limited amount of caps on the rent increases that could take place. When it was first introduced, this bill was um, pretty different than how it is now. And at this point, it it's, uh, lasts for about three years, as opposed to, I think, when it was introduced, it was going to be at least 10 years of um, caps on rent and rental increases. So it allows rent to increase by 7% um, plus inflation, not to exceed 10% per year. Um, doesn't apply to housing that's had gotten an, a certificate of occupancy in the last 10 years. Um, is, and, but in this form, it did manage to pass the assembly and is now in the Senate in the subcommittees. Um, lastly, SB 18, Skinner deletes the sunset on a requirement that, um, to provide notice to renters during a foreclosure. This one's a kind of minor. This is existing law and it's sort of, so this just deletes the date that it would have ended this practice. So um, the, so, property will continue to be bound by this existing requirement that um, tenants need notice if a rental property is going through a foreclosure process and it provides um, legislative timelines for that. So um, in terms of this legislation, by the end of May, any bill had to um, pass out of its uh, house of origin and um, sort of cross the hall to the other side. So these are the bills that, the bills that remain have done that. They've passed one house and moved on to the other. <clears throat> the assembly has until the end of August to pass these bills from the remaining house, houses. And then um, the governor has one month to sign them during the month of September. If he does not sign them, they go into effect anyway. But if he, so he essentially has that month to veto any bills that he chooses to veto. So one thing that we're not discussing here is um, the governor's budget, which has um, a stated agenda to affect the housing market and how the provision of housing in California. And all of this is very much um, underway. There is nothing here that I would say we can absolutely count on. This, the way that these legislative cycles work, it's not finished until it's really finished, which is sometime in October. So we will know more at that point. This is where we stand today. So at this point, um, I'm going to hand it over to um, Dave Seppos from the Consensus and Collaboration Project at Sacramento State University, and he's going to take you through his um, situation assessment report. <coughs> Good evening. <clears throat> nice to see you all again. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to thank you all. Ooh, did I just advance that? Wait. There was a cover slip, <coughs> cover page. It's not there. Right. Um, I hope we don't have, we'll see. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is uh, thank some folks. I want to thank all of you as council members for having taken the time back in February to meet with me. And I'll go through that in a minute, uh, sort of recounting the process that, that was used. Uh, I also want to thank um, members of the community that were willing to be stakeholders to be interviewed. Um, it's time consuming. It, it was time consuming for your staff to coordinate and organize uh, a series of interviews. I want to thank both those stakeholders and yourselves for being candid and open. Um, that's the necessity of a process like this is for me to come in as a neutral and it always amazes me honestly the, the willingness that people have to sort of, or at least by as best as I can tell, to be very candid and open. And with that comes a huge responsibility that I have to both protect that in terms of not attributing things to people, which I'm very, very um, 
uh, focused on not doing. Um, it also comes with the inherent responsibility and something like this that I therefore want to apologize for, which is um, this is a candid report. Uh, anybody that has read it knows that now. Um, it's not easy to know the things that, in my professional opinion, need to be said and nonetheless put them in black and white that I then know are going to be part of the public discourse and that people are going to need to read, whether it's about you as council members or the community. So I likewise apologize. That's, that kind of comes to the territory. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to cover, there seems to be some slides missing, but I'll just kind of tell you what my presentation outline is going to be. I'm going to cover the assessment process a little bit more in detail than what uh, Sarah had just discussed, and then I'm going to talk about the conclusions. I'm not going to address uh, the recommendations that I made because at this time they're premature. I, I wanted to build recommendations in because of the way in which I handled the conclusion. I'll describe that in a bit more, but I'm not going to go over that in detail. So uh, going into the, the process, uh, as I've already alluded to and as, as you all know, um, Foundational to this was for CCP, the Consensus and Collaboration Program, and myself as the principal investigator to be neutral. So in that regard, uh, both for you as council members to affirm this and for members of the public, um, the city, no member of the city, not a member of the council, staff, nobody had any editorial oversight on decisions that I made as to who to interview um, or uh, in the report. They had no, no oversight in that regard. The questions that I asked, all of that was neutral determination. To remind folks, um, and this is a very key distinction, and I, and I should say that, you know, since the report is out and even before then, I have the latitude to be privy to certain social media communications and conversations that are going on, whether it is responses to an article that is written in the paper and seeing how members of the community respond to that, whether it is letters that have been provided to you, um, the council itself, or other venues. So for better or for worse, I see some of that conversation. So I'm gonna to try to dispel a couple of things that I've seen perpetually coming up that I, that I wanna frankly go on the record and, and say. So it's important to note in that regard that we were, not, we were scoped to assess the task force feasibility, notwithstanding that you as a council within your responsibilities had already directed staff to proceed. Uh, when I was asked to put a scope together, I made it very clear. When I came to you last time, I made it very clear that I was going to assess feasibility, and it had to be in that regard, regardless of the fact that you had actually directed that, because absent that, then I would already be pre-decisional, and, uh, and I can't do that in my role. Um, I did not assess membership. There was absolutely nothing in the report that assesses, you know, who should be a member, and I did not assess, nor was it the responsibility to assess the appropriateness of the topic, and I say that because some people have said the very fact that this is even being discussed is inappropriate. Other people say the very fact that this is being discussed is completely appropriate. That wasn't my role. My role was to assess a variety of conditions and to come back to you with a recommendation about the feasibility of creating a task force, not the appropriateness of whether it makes sense or not. Uh, so. We began with city council interviews. I was very determined to do that, and I therefore did in February interview all of y'all, as you'll recall, and that was to see where your alignment or lack thereof was as a city council and to see what you all had to say. Because if, by virtue of that conversation, I had concluded that there was a lack of alignment of even what a task force would be about, I needed to report that first. And while there were some differences of opinions about how broad or constrained, if you will, the topic of a task force might be. By and large, you all were focused on the idea of it being a rental housing task force. So that, that was important. And then also, as is stated here, I was assessing to see where your levels of alignment on some other things were, what your interests were, um, what you perceived as the role of the council going forward if there were to be a task force, your concerns, and then your recommendations on who should be interviewed. <clears throat> so. That then translated to, so I want to thank you all again for providing me your recommendations. Your recommendations, and we talked about this, and I had advised you to think about people that you felt were, in some cases, maybe on the extremes of a particular um, topic, and then were centrist. Give me a broad perspective. Uh, we talked, and I worked with all of you about giving you some further advice about, you know, who are some people that might have collaborative capacity. And then lastly, I asked you to give me your recommendations of who your priority was. I've received those back from you. I should say that again, I've seen some communications in social media, people who were saying I was supposed to have been interviewed. Uh, I, I, I've been told that I was supposed to have been interviewed. I'm gonna say publicly that's not accurate. 
I know who the lists are. I know what you all gave me as council members. I know the communications that I had back and forth with you, and I know how that played out. Um, if there was a person that you had identified as a priority, I felt completely comfortable deferring and being deferential in that regard, and I went with that priority individual that you identified. <laughs> After that, I went with if there was overlap. So if two or more of you identified the same individual, I went ahead and, and proceeded with that. <clears throat> that overlap was very sparse. There really wasn't, I was surprised, frankly. There was not that much overlap from the seven of you as to who should be interviewed, but there was a little bit, and I went with that. Uh, I asked staff then subsequently for their recommendations, and I then cross-referenced, and their recommendations were completely independent from yours, but I then cross-referenced, so if there was not overlap, I went to see who has been identified by you as a council member, and is there overlap with staff recommendations, and then I went to, to pursue that. And then lastly, I used my own recognizance and did my own research and filled the list out. And of course, the list and the number, and something that I said in the report and said the last time I was here, is that the goal was to be representative but not exhaustive, and that was, frankly, to limit the budget. So on that note, I want to dispel one little other item, which is budget. Um, there's been communication in social media that this project and the, the contract or the agreement with, with the Sacramento State was $400,000. And this has even been from people who I have had email communications with and have made it very clear to them that that is not accurate. So I want to again on the record say that the agreement between the city and Sacramento State was for $40,000. $40,000, that's what the number was, okay, not $400,000. So uh, stakeholder interviews expanded a little bit and those are included both the interview list for the what I worked with you and the interview <laughs> list of what I, what I then walked, met with the 20 some odd stakeholders. Um, their interests and aspirations, aspirations, again alignment. Uh, we talked about are there people in the community who have collaborative capacity or lack thereof, people who could be involved and could serve in a task force effectively. Um, the risks and threats that were out there that people perceived about doing or not doing a task force. Uh, the use of data and what that meant to people, um, membership selection and how people would recommend a membership selection process be done if they had any recommendations. And then we talked about what I recall referred to as a no action alternative. What if the city did nothing? What would play out? So that was the general gist of the, the 15 questions that uh, we covered. So again, uh, I interviewed the uh, council in the latter part of February and then got your recommendations, began the process to work with other local stakeholders, and then the interviews took place for the other stakeholders between the 15th and 18th here in person, and there were some follow-up phone calls I had to do with each where just some of the interviews weren't finished. So I'm gonna move on to uh, conclusions, and I'm gonna start with the sort of the end or the, the overarching statement, which some of you, many of you have seen. Under current circumstances and using the council's current goals as a target, it is very unlikely that a task force will be successful. Now, there are mitigating factors to this, and I'm gonna cover some of these this evening, but that is my recommendation. And those mitigating factors are what I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about here today. One of the things that I'm gonna speak to you right now is that throughout both the report, and this is stated in the report, and then in this presentation is I refer to side, other side, every side, both sides. And in the report, I always do that with quotation marks. And I wanna reiterate what I say in the report that this is not that simple, it's not that binary. Uh, many people that I interviewed, they nonetheless refer to themselves in terms of sides one way or another. But at the same time, it is very clear that this is a highly complex situation in your community and does not get distilled down quite that easily to binary conditions, but for efficiency, I continue to use the term sides, but I'm just putting that framing out there that it doesn't mean I believe they're in fact are quite that simple. So in the conclusion section, I identified 10 what I call dichotomies, and this is really the gist of what I discovered. And uh, it's telling in its own way. So a very significant number of participants independently and confidentially believe that there are reasonable middle ground solutions that might be mutually acceptable. There were many people on both sides who frankly said, if Measure M had been written differently, we might have had a different outcome. There were people who were involved in the Measure M campaign who said if I had to do all over again, I would have written Measure M or I would have asked for us to write Measure M differently. And there were people on the No on M campaign who said if Measure M had been written differently, I might have been more inclined to consider it or perhaps vote for it. I think that's very telling. That indicates that there potentially is some middle ground. And then subsequently in the discussions I had with people, it came out. But nonetheless, however, as is stated here, 
A similar number of participants expressed a significant last of lack of truck, trust that people on the other side and any significant lack of confidence they could achieve any agreements. And I think what that really comes down to is you have a community of people that in my professional opinion has spent an increasing amount of time talking past each other. That is completely common. Hardly any case of a conflict nature like this that I've worked in doesn't have that dynamic, so that's not unusual. I think another factor that's going on though is that there appears to be a number of conversations going on in vacuums, as I call it. There's a sort of self-perpetuating echo chamber of people talking, and so when I come in as a neutral and I ask questions and people say, you know, if only such and such or so and so, or I think this or that, but I don't think those folks would ever agree to it. Well, maybe they wouldn't, maybe they wouldn't, but when I talk to the other side, people would express some similar little nuggets, little somethings that might just might work, but they have no belief that the other side could see it that same way at all. Uh, and there's been no space to build faith. And that, and that lack of space is perpetuating because of both communal and, to be blunt, council behavior. Almost all participants expressed dismay, frustration, and so on about how stakeholders have behaved in city council meetings. Now, that's not universal, and as said in the report, there are some people who are very nonplussed about it. There are some people who say, look, council meetings are the, the location for social theater. That's a good thing. That's people being and expressing themselves. So, so that was not universal. It was a small minority of people that said that. Most people did say things have devolved, and they've devolved beyond what we would prefer to see, and also <coughs> behavior external to the council meetings. So many of these participants acknowledge that a minority of stakeholders on their own side have behaved inappropriately. But I must say, to be very honest and confounding, almost all the participants, in fact, not a single participant that I interviewed, openly said, yeah, it's us. We, we shouldn't have done X, Y, or Z. There was a consistent theme of, despite the fact that there was a dissatisfaction with behavior, it and every single conversation I had then resulted to, but those guys started it. Which, to be honest, I think that's unfortunate for a community to be dealing with a policy issue of this magnitude where this many lives are depending on it in various ways. And I will say that I'm gonna deviate, go back and forth a little bit from findings to the other part of my role, which is to provide you my professional opinion as a neutral and a person that mediates conflicts. So I will say that on a regular basis when I'm working with stakeholders, I have a saying, and it's one that I try to apply to my own life, to be honest, which is there's a difference between being right and doing the right thing. We all want to be right as humans. There's not a single person in this room that doesn't get into some kind of conversation and expresses their feelings and would love for the person they're talking to to go, you're right. I see it completely your way now. It doesn't normally happen that way. And then we have to all make decisions of what we deal with that. And do we escalate? So do we opt to continue to be right? Or do we choose to do the right thing? And sometimes the right thing is let the pitch sail by. And unfortunately, that hasn't been happening in this community a lot. Landlords and private property advocates claim to have an unassailable mandate reflected in the Measure M outcome because of what happened. Renters and tenants' rights advocates claim to have an unassailable mandate reflected in a progressive majority recently seated on the council. I don't think necessarily either is wrong. But this is a set of countervailing political forces that your community faces, and beyond that, as is stated in the report, and to be honest, under the current circumstances that a recall has now been initiated, in the report, I refer to, for those of you that are students of politics and geopolitical politics, the MAD doctrine, which was a doctrine back in the 1950s when we were escalating for the first time in nuclear superiority. And the MAD doctrine, with an escalation of nuclear power, was based upon the fact that you were never really going to win a nuclear war. It was mutually assured destruction was going to happen. I'm giving you my professional opinion, whether you choose to accept it or not, that I believe in this community, because of this dynamic, because of these countervailing conditions, you have the makings for mutually assured destruction. There appears to be a reasonable rationale to claim that there is a progressive majority on the council. The votes have been counted and people are seated on this council as we speak. The progressive majority does not seem inclined to take a unilateral approach on some form of rent control and has identified a desire to try to delegate this to a proposed task force. That's not wrong, that's not bad. 
the history of how this played out, going back to January, where there was a second reading of just cause eviction, and it was tabled, and this moved ahead, indicated that a progressive majority was not at that time prepared to operationalize on that. And again, I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying that it's a dichotomy between what is expressed, that a majority exists, and whether or not that has been politically activated or not. And again, I'm being blunt, <laughs> and I apologize for that. Many participants in the council expressed a need for rental housing policies, so this is moving on to data, to be supported by defensible, mutually acceptable data. However, many of the very same participants expressed uncertainty about and an unwillingness to consider data if it was offered from the other side. So what do we do about that? Data is out there, people exist that there's meaningful data that can be supporting it. And likewise, a number, most people said, you know, this is such a significant policy condition to make decisions without data would be untenable. And yet, we have this dichotomy. So how do you balance that out? Now there are ways, there are methods. There's totally methods, and I describe those a bit in the recommendations. One methodology that's commonly used is what's called joint fact finding where you're mutually working on defining the tools and the methodologies and the data quality objectives, if you will, rather than, as I call it, having my PhD can beat up your PhD, or what we sometimes call combat science. But to do that has to have an atmosphere of trust, or at least a commitment of people <coughs> to be willing to work in that regard. You can't just take a conflicted set of people and go, all right, let's get some data and expect the outcomes to be any different than the rhetoric and behavior that has been expressed. <coughs> Several participants, oops. Most participants are reluctant to support convening a task force. So again, that many people were very reluctant. It wasn't like when I asked this question, so how do you feel about a task force? It wasn't like people go, heck yeah, let's do it. That didn't happen. And are skeptical about a task force chances. However, most participants see, participants see little likelihood that current conditions are going to improve, and frankly, that was before the recall effort. On its own terms, in terms of civic relationships and mutually agreed on solutions. And most people said something has, different has to be done, something different has to play out. But their confidence, and again, some of that lack of confidence was a lack of confidence in this council as to whether this council could convene or be willing to convene a task force and then take their hands off the stealing wheel, stealing, steering wheel, <laughs> stealing, sorry, or something to that effect. So it wasn't just a lack of confidence among stakeholders, it was a lack of confidence as to how this council would work in that regard. Several participants feel that time is of the essence and that the solutions protecting their interests be acted on rapidly or in the case of landlord advocates, that the outcomes of Measure M be left alone. Because Measure M is what Measure M is, and the outcomes are the outcomes. But there's definitely a pressing feeling from the tenant community that left unresolved people are at risk. And the landlords feel that they're at risk. However, several participants feel that the city should wait to see how the legislation that we just heard of plays out and that would be premature. So we're starting to see how that's playing out and that's one of several externalities that's, that I'll talk to in a little bit. Any participants express a lack of trust in the other side to provide rational participants and engage in a thoughtful dialogue. However, when I asked the question of are there people on the other side, almost completely opposite answer. Almost everybody said yes, there are, there is, there are somebody, there is somebody, there are a few people. And those people, their names are repeated several times. It's not necessarily the usual suspects. Sometimes it was. So there are people out there that on either side, people think, you know, I could still work with that person. But there's no faith. <clears throat> Which, again, comes back to the whole talking past each other, working in a vacuum, things like that. Um, I had asked a series of questions beginning with, perspectives on behavior in city council meetings and both of the council and in stakeholders, members of the public that participate. And I then followed on with that with a set of questions about 
how a task force might work in that. And I did that because, to be honest, professionally, having watched videos of the council meetings from going several months back to most recently, I had reservations as a person that does this and has been doing this for 30 years. I have reservations to expect that a group of people, if there was going to be a task force, would be able to do that and withstand and really, frankly, be willing to put up with the behavior that you as a council have to and that is expressed here. Now again, that's not good or bad. Public discourse takes all forms, centrist, extreme, and everything in between, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But to ask a group of people in a task force to do all that work in the public and not have an opportunity to do some of their work behind closed doors, I can tell you categorically is untenable. Now I will tell you that almost every single person I interviewed, including this council, both said that they felt that there had to be a way, if there was gonna be a task force, for that task force to do some of its work behind closed doors with absolute non-negotiable methods for accountability in the public and engagement with the public and reporting on the activities that are going on behind those closed doors when the time is right. So it wasn't a one-way street there, but everybody, almost everybody I spoke to and on this, on this council, almost everybody, actually everybody <coughs> said they understood the need to do some work behind closed doors. Some folks described that the challenges and solutions as being unique uniquely local and not well served by looking at other examples to other places because of the unique conditions, be it social, economic, even geographic nature of Santa Cruz. And other people describe this as being fundamentally a regional problem because of the current and anticipated pressures from the Bay Area. So that's an interesting, are, are we, do we look to other sources to find solutions for our problems or are those other sources irrelevant? So I come back to this conclusion. Now I wanna be very clear in advance of the next couple slides that I cover. I'm gonna talk about what I refer to as internalities and externalities, these sort of overarching pressures. And internalities are the things that I discovered, so I'll just go on to it. This compelling desire for change, a hope of a better tomorrow, this dissatisfaction, frustration, things like that. The fact that there are some possible items for agreement. Had this not been communicated to the large number of people that I spoke to, so had all other behavioral conditions stayed the same, had the legislative conditions in work stayed the same, had frankly the behavior going on within the council been the same, had behavior of the way stakeholders were working or not working with each other in the community, both prior to Measure M and after Measure M, had those all been staying the same, but these kinds of desires not been expressed routinely, I would have categorically come to you and said, do not pursue a task order or a task force. No, that would have been my answer. Not a, you know, is unlikely. I would have flat out said no. And the externalities, externalities will be destructive to a task force. And these are things I've already talked to a little bit, but council behavior, council and potentially external intervention with a task force, or I should say the fear of it. Stakeholder behavior in the meetings to each other in public settings, these kinds of conditions, and the legislative solutions, and now the recall. So go back to what I just said about the internalities. Now let's, for argument's sake, say that these had all been in place, these same kinds of sentiments had been expressed, a desire for change, a hope for a better tomorrow, all these kinds of things, and these externalities were not in place. If your council was functioning differently, if behavior within the stakeholder community was different, I would have categorically, without any hesitation, said, yes, you should pursue a task force. So I hope that's clear what I'm saying, that it's these countervailing conditions. That's not what played out. But I can tell you that notwithstanding these, the internalities, and at the end of the day, the reason why I grappled with, and it took me quite a while to continue <coughs> pouring over the notes, but the reason why I came forward with the conclusion that I did is to have come forward to you with an absolute blanket no would have been dishonoring, dishonorable too, the candor that was expressed to me many, many times by several people, many people, majority people, expressing this. If I'd said no, if he said, I couldn't do that in good conscience. This was expressed, it is there, but, and I felt compelled to honor that. However, it is these 
that are the mitigating factors. These are the things, in my professional opinion, that have to be addressed. Not uncommon in conflict, in any form of conflict, interpersonal conflict, doesn't matter whether it's spouse, significant others to each other, any way you slice it, is the retaliatory cycle. I'll describe that. There's some sort of initiating circumstance, something happens, there's an internal emotional reaction, all humans go through this. There's an emotional reaction that takes place, that reaction turns into an external exhibiting or external acting on that, and you're in a cycle. And it doesn't matter whether you're with a significant other or you're ar and you're arguing about where the car keys are, or you're a city council in a community arguing about rental control. It escalates and you find yourself going to DEFCON 4 before you know it. And there's nothing new to this. So all relationships, if you're trying to solve things, have got to try to find a way to go from a retaliatory cycle to a conciliatory cycle, which is, is there a way to be conciliatory to each other? That doesn't mean apologize, can. Can you acknowledge your own part? Things like that. So conciliatory examples are listen and validate. These are basic things that anybody that's ever been in therapy, to be quite honest, has probably gone through. Honor and not challenge each other's stories. There's a significant number of stories, legitimate, powerful, painful, in some cases, stories in this community on both sides. But both sides have gotten into a, my story is more painful than your story, rather than let's try to find a way to listen to each other's stories. Be accountable for self and organizational behavior. Again, at the risk of sounding overly like a therapist, anybody that's ever been in a 12-step program knows that self-accountability and a making amends for things is a foundational aspect of that. That's a conciliatory gesture. You have to do things like try to define your shared beliefs. You have to try to move to the center and away from the extremes. There will always be people that are on the extremes. You have to embrace compromise as a means to an end, knowing that compromise will be distasteful to certain people and they will hammer you for the compromise. But that's the kinds of things that happen under conciliatory examples in order to make it work. So when I come back to this for the third time, I submit to you that think about any dispute that you or anybody in this room has been in, any conflict or dispute gets solved by one of two ways. And I'm oversimplifying, but it's really pretty much like this. A conflict or dispute either gets solved by a power disparity that a person can employ and then they can be as moderate or extreme as they choose to be because they have a power differential that allows them to operationalize what they want or people have got to move towards the center and move from the extremes. That is how conflict gets resolved. It is either resolved by force or it is resolved by moving to the center. Under current circumstances that I've talked about, these externalities, I am not optimistic. It pains me to say that. I wish I could tell you otherwise. I do believe, as I've said several times here now, that the seeds exist within your community to do the right thing. And the desire, notwithstanding most recent political conditions, that the desire is there to try to find a different way of doing things. But it's a big hill to climb. Thank you. I sang at a friend's uh, wedding once, and after I got done singing at the wedding, everybody started applauding. I was like, don't, no. <laughs> so, do I stand here or do I go back for what? How do You're you welcome want? to stay, Mr. Seppos. I just, um, let's go ahead and, uh, I'll just go ahead and, um, Take a moment. Did you have additions? We to have we have just two more slides, sort of um, summarizing Please. the okay. um, options for council motions as we've written them in the staff report. So, um, just really briefly, um, we wanted to come up with at least a few ways that your council might choose to proceed tonight, just to sort of offer you a path. Um, 
First, you could direct staff to continue our, basically our current work, which is largely defined by the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee Report, which was completed last year, the housing element, the 2030 general plan. Um, this is essentially our current work plan. So you could give us direction to simply carry on doing the work that we are currently doing and sort of set aside this issue of a rental housing task force for the time being. Option two, uh, your council could choose to initiate an ad hoc committee subcommittee to address some of these key, key dichotomies and see if some resolution can be raised around these, these questions that are raised in the report um, within some kind of a stated timeline and then once that time frame is concluded and those dichotomies are resolved to some extent then launch into a task force process. Um, number three, you could direct staff to return as soon as possible with a process design to initiate a rental housing task force. Um, despite the findings of the situation assessment report, there will be some opportunity cost in terms of the work plan for the advanced planning section and those items that are in the housing blueprint subcommittee report and the housing element in the general plan. So keeping in mind priorities and that your council hasn't yet had a chance to set a set of joint priorities, that's something to keep in mind. So obviously option four is to direct staff to take some other course of action as defined by your council by motion this evening. So. At this point, we can accept any questions you have. Thank you. Um, maybe before we jump into questions, I just really want to acknowledge and thank you, Mr. Sethos, for uh, spending so much time in Santa Cruz and for uh, diving deep into our community for the thoroughness of the report, the interviews, and the excellent presentation, as difficult as it was to hear at times. Um, I um, not only enjoyed our conversations, but uh, truly admire the work that you do, and I appreciate your honesty. And I'll just say that I, to my colleagues in the community, that I take your feedback very seriously. I think that we as leaders do set the tone here in our community and um, really honor what was said in that report by a number of people that I know and respect and others that I don't, but also shared uh, similar concerns from those that I do know in that report. Um, and in terms of the characteristics that you uh, spoke to in terms of listening um, to honor uh, what's heard, uh, self-accountability, uh, to find areas of shared belief, and to uh, look for the center and compromise. Uh, I'll just make that uh, uh, a public that I will approach this evening's conversation with those in mind. So that said, we'll go ahead and see if there's any questions from council members of your report. And um, at which time, once we conclude the questions, we'll <coughs> go ahead and open it up to uh, members of the community who want to address us in this regard. And then we'll return back to revisit some of the potential policy options that we have before us. So I'll go ahead and look to my colleagues on the dais here to see if there's any questions of Mr. Seppos or the staff in terms of his presentation or report. Any questions at this time? Okay, Vice Mayor Cumming. I just have one question for staff um, with regards to the third op, uh, uh, or maybe it was the first option with moving forward with the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee recommendations. What are currently or at the last time you all were working on those recommendations, um, what were the priorities? Because I know that within that report there are some priorities based around recommendations around um, rent control and tenant protections, and but there's a lot of other components to that report. And so I was just kind of wondering where staff was at in terms of um, the different, of what parts of that report were prioritized. Sure. Um, so Sarah Fleming, principal planner over the long range planning team. Uh, so most currently we were uh, planning to launch at the beginning of this year uh, a renewed discussion on the rezoning of Ocean Street um, that has temporarily been pushed back um, to have these rental housing task force conversations and with some of the homelessness items that have uh, come forward as well. Uh, we also have some outstanding ADU items on our plate right now. If you'll remember in January, um, we did bring some ADU items back. Some of those items were um, uh, kind of put on hold while we did some research into um, tying some of them with affordability. We'll be working on that. There's also some additional ADU items that hadn't come forward yet related to lowering of fees, um, creating uh, prototype or similar types of plans to help make the process easier. 
Um, and I think there's one other ADU item that I'm not remembering. Uh, we are also going to be looking at a range of housing types, so um, potentially amending our SRO and SOU ordinance, um, creating a new language for, to allow junior ADUs in the community, um, working on some land use policy issues related to legalizing illegal dwelling units, um, and then we have a, uh, which, not, which is not a part of the uh, housing blueprint subcommittee work, but we have a long outstanding LCP, local coastal program update that we've been working on for a long time that we'd really like to be able to get across the finish line. Uh, we also received a grant, um, which you heard about from Tiffany uh, Wise West earlier today. Um, huh? Yeah, I'll get there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, earlier today regarding um, the grant that we received, so we're working on some uh, adding a hazards element to our local coastal program as well that would address sea level rises, rise and potentially wildfires and things of that nature. And then um, we have a citywide parking update, uh, review and potential update that we're looking at. And many of those things were slated to be done in this um, uh, current fiscal year, but have been pushed back and now they're kind of compounding on the other items. Um, additionally, we also have about 350 implementation items from the general plan 2030 that um, have been on hold through the housing blueprint process that, um, you know, should be should be looked at and, and worked on, and um, that includes about 10 um, either updates or new area plans that are in there, and about 10 um, ordinance and policy updates that are in there as well that were visioned as a part of that general plan that um, haven't even been looked at yet, very candidly. And then finally, we have our housing element, which also has a um, pretty broad uh, array of implementation efforts, that some of which are being addressed through the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee uh, recommendations items, but some of them aren't. Oh, and I'll add one more thing. <laughs> I just remembered. Um, the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee recommendations that came through were only 44 of the 99 that were recommended. So while it's not on our current workload, um, I would expect at some point, potentially, Council would end up revisiting those balance of recommendations and potentially um, directing staff to look at those as well. And most of those would fall to this team. And just out of curiosity, how is it so Tenant protections is, has been a big thing that, you know, for years has been um, an interest in the community. And I'm just curious because there were recommendations around that within the Blueprint Subcommittee report. And I just want to get a better sense, and I'm sure people in the community want to probably get a better sense of how that didn't make it on to that list of priorities. Sure, so the um, primary item that was in there was the large rent increase item that we brought back uh, last year. And so we had um, drafted a large rent increase ordinance that we initially brought in uh, mid-September. Uh, that was um, originally, Incre um, limiting increases to 10% um, and 15% over two years. And you may recall there had been some back and forth on that and the council finally adopted that ordinance on January 8th and that had made it 5% over one year or 7% over two consecutive years. Um, so that's been adopted as of right now, that's everything that we have on our workload related directly to I, I shouldn't say workload, but out of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee related to that. And so we, that was one of the first ones we addressed, that and the community outreach policy were the first two things that we tackled. And then obviously as the ADU legislative cycle was moving forward, that was the next kind of low hanging fruit. And then here we are. Thank yeah. you. Well, clearly you have time for a lot more work to do. <laughs> I'm teasing you. That was an impressive list. Uh, Council Member Myers, any questions? Um, I just want to thank you for the report, uh, Mr. Seffo. It was great. It was, uh, it was uh, very sobering, but I thought very well done. And I think, um, I think you got into the psyche of our community. And so um, I appreciate you being honest with us. Um, it's never uh, easy to hear criticism or critical critical uh, feedback, but I think, uh, I think your, your honesty, I think was, um, I just respect it. So thank you. Um, I'm just curious if you guys, CCP is, I'm just curious if, if you're finding this in other communities, obviously housing is a huge topic, um, poverty, um, people here in California not being able to make it anymore is is in the paper every day. I'm just curious, uh, sometimes it's nice, even though we're not, we don't have the same pay possible situation per se for our specific issues with maybe our market or the way our housing is working right now, but I'm just curious if you guys are doing any other work um, with any other communities in California with regards to sort of, you know, this kind of, this kind of, uh, 
divide in, in approach in a community? There are, um, there's a couple of cases that I'm working on right now, not, to be honest, not as conflicted as this, but there, the circumstances and those conditions are, aren't exactly the same. There's some RENA, uh, RENA inventory issues that I'm working on and affordable housing issues that I'm working on. Um, to be honest, I, I'm getting more inquiries um, from communities. I, I can categorically tell you as a student of public policy, which is I am, um, it, it, w prior to even the governor bringing forth um, his agenda and the legislature then acting on what they're currently working on right now, y you could see the groundswell beginning to happen. You could see the, and I'm gonna be very clear this, I'm giving you a professional, albeit personal opinion. You could see the untenable nature um, in California uh, of, of the economics of, of housing, um, the unsustainable nature. Again, I, I'm not, I, I do not say that in the context of advocacy for or against rental control or rental how any, any of those things. I'm just saying that, that it, there is an unsustainable nature in many communities around the state of California. They are seeing it, they are recognizing it. Um, it ties to a number of broader conditions in terms of tax revenues and all, all the about it, to subsidization in order to sort of, you know, vote with your pocketbook and, and live by certain codes or values in certain communities if you choose to do that. All these things are, are playing out with the unsustainable nature that certainly in, in some major urban areas, particularly the LA basin, the San Francisco region, the Bay Area, such as you'd want to define it, um, the, quite literally, the amount of distance that people have got to move to live in one place and work in another is creating a socioeconomic instability. And that's seen. And so we are seeing that in terms of inquiry to me and some of my colleagues, yes. I, yeah, I just appreciate your reflection on that because I, I think with some of the other issues that we're dealing with as a council, um, they're big issues. You know, this is not a Santa Cruz city issue. This is, and so I think as we we think through what we could do as a community, I think it's always nice to reflect um, a little bit in the shared, mm -hmm. the shared um, uh, humility of what's happening around the state. Um, uh, and 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 you could say this similarly about homelessness. It's it's difficult. It's hard. There's not a lot of clarity, and it's going to take some time. It's going to take time to uh, not only come up with the policy, but also to trust, you know, to trust each other with ideas and to try to try to move forward without with sort of an unknown ahead. So um, I, I appreciated your report, though, and I and I, I just wanted to kind of provide a little bit of um, context, I think, for our community because um, sometimes it can feel very, uh, very. Uh, uh, local in terms of the issues in the grocery store or as you're looking at people across the room. Um, and so I think um, we're just living in a time of, of difficult um, policy issues in, in California and, and we can all take a deep breath knowing that we're not alone. Um, but uh, thank you for the report and for the presentation tonight. Sure. Right, are there any other questions for Mr. Seppos or the staff um, before we go ahead and open it up? Councilmember Brown? I was gonna say, I'd, just, I'd rather wait and hear from the public and I possibly will have questions afterwards but and comments, but I'd like to hear from people who are showed up. Okay. So we'll go ahead and take a pause. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully you'll be able to stick around for any further questions of clarity. Okay. So at this point, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment on this item. Um, I wanna see, is, is Foz still here? He had to leave, okay. I was just going to honor his request to go first, but I don't think he's here, so no problem. We'll go ahead and open it up. Um, I will, unless there's anybody who wants to speak for one minute, it seems like I, we were anticipating, we weren't quite sure what to anticipate this evening, so if folks wanna speak briefly, they're welcome to. If not, we'll go ahead and open it up for two minutes. So there anybody who wants to just briefly speak for one minute on this item? If not, you're welcome to, Miss. Just a question, so are we still where, Minute you go to the front of the line, yeah. You speak for more, you're at the end of the line. That's right, yeah. So, if you're anybody who just really wants to briefly address the council before we go into uh, the two minute public comment, we'll go ahead and allow for you to do, the, do that at this time. No problem. Seeing them, we'll go ahead and open it up for the two minutes, and we'll, we'll start with the folks on my left. 
Hi, natealex.kennedy at gmail.com. Uh, what I think is one of the biggest priorities for housing right now, we need to have mandatory invest inspections of all rentals, whether it's a house or a single room. We need to have people come in, building inspectors, making sure there's no asbestos. We need the fire department to come in at all rentals to make sure there are not any fire hazards. And I have lived in situations where I was with my mom and she had actually done certain things, I'm not gonna name any specifics, but that were serious fire hazards. And when she finally came home and the friend of mine that helped look at all this, uh, she was shocked at all the stuff she had to do to make it fire safe. I mean, it, pretty simple stuff, but stuff like a uh, long, uh, cables for for uh, stereo system speakers, stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, we need mandatory, and I've been through this before in housing that was anything but standard. We need building inspectors and the fire department to come into absolutely all rentals before they can go on the market. Um, well, that was pretty intense for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm got 30 seconds here and I'll, I'll give myself 10 to think of what to say in 20. <sighs> give three people you love a hug, pay it forward. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Reggie Meisler. Uh, I think it's helpful at this point to like go back and figure out why we even tried to establish a task force in the first place. We were in a housing crisis. It was identified by the previous council so much so that they did a rent freeze with eviction protections. They were not threatened of recall. Everything was fine. Um, and then those against Measure M, when that sort of came up, said that they just had problems with little pieces of it. And so, and then the majority in Santa Cruz, the city voted for Proposition 10, which expanded rent control in cities where it already existed. So it was very logical uh, earlier this year when Sandy and Justin tried to just take M and take pieces out of it. That was just a totally rational thing to do based off of the current conditions. But uh, the goalposts started to move. It wasn't just that people didn't like parts of M, it was that they didn't like eviction protections at all, they didn't like rent control at all, they didn't like rent regulation, they didn't like any sort of government action in any way. And so, you know, we, we need to act somehow. And what the staff has proposed really does not address the same things that uh, rent stabilization and eviction protections address. And that's why I think we should do uh, go ahead with the task force, but, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> but uh, make sure that um, those on the task force are willing to compromise on, um, you know, just regulation in general, just basic, you know, government action. Uh, and I think if we can get just some like very basic uh, level of moderation from people who are on the task force, we can find something that people will agree to because that was the point of the task force, was that they didn't want city council to just sort of, in one meeting, pull apart M and then just pass something. They wanted to take their time and figure something out. Right, next speaker. Hello, my name is Elise Casby, and I am really, um, really happy that we, I think, made the excellent decision, and I applaud council for getting this consultant, um, because I do feel that this consultant is exceedingly neutral. And to that extent, I think there are some failures in the report, and I just wanna say this as somebody who, over time, developed a political philosophy that I never thought that I would ever develop into. <laughs> um, I thought I'd be more like one of you up there, a little bit more mainstream and somebody who is like a Democrat or a progressive Democrat, and that just didn't happen. And so what I want to do here is to bring in a concept that I really learned recently through a group called 
Santa Cruz County Community Coalition to Overcome Racism. And the reason this is so relevant is one of the things that these people educated me about was that when you're addressing racism, society is not like a blanket thing that everybody can approach in the same way. A lot of times in our merit meritorious culture, we have this idea that, you know, more or less, even if you have some handicaps, you can make up for it, right? Because society is a kind of even thing and that everybody has more or less the same opportunity. Sure, some people have to work a little harder. What I'm saying is the flaw that I see in this report is it comes within a context of neoliberalism, of a completely beleaguered and failing democracy because money rules everything. And I think that although Mr. Seppis, what he did, was a job well done. He did it fully and completely within the bounds of his professionalism. We still can ha are going to have to address the culprit here, and that is we are in a horribly authoritarian, extremely unfair system. Sarah, could you pull up the slide that had the externalities on it? I just want to think out loud with you about what your next steps might be. I thank Mr. Seppos for this uh, call to action or call to transformation. Um, so I, I think on this slide were the, the factors that, that uh, if we don't change them, then Mr. Seppos is suggesting we don't move forward. So let's see what we can change. Um, council behavior, council and external intervention. So I, I think we'd like to hear from you tonight about those two things. Stakeholder behavior um, in meetings and to each other. Um, let's figure that out. I mean, apparently there, you know, of the sides that uh, Mr. Seppos interviewed, uh, each side thought there were members of the other side that were reasonable enough people that they could deal with. Um, so will the tenant groups and the landlord groups support this process? Can they, can they, um, can you find that out if, if they will support this process? Uh, legislative solutions, we don't have a lot of uh, power over that. The recall, well, you all can say something about the recall. Is that something that you support? Um, so I, I would look forward to hearing you tonight. This is really a call for all of us. What, what, what can we do? Um, and uh, at least three of the items up there about you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Barbara Riverwoman. <clears throat> um, to me, the answer is looking at our empty chambers tonight, and it both argues against moving ahead with the task. We'll go, well, I'm going to go ahead and pause your time here for just a second. I asked him if he could take it outside. He told me to shut up. Okay, okay. Uh, so, okay, well, I see this person is being um, asked outside at this time. We'll go ahead and just remind each other that we have and all have want to hear, we want to be heard and we want to allow everybody to be heard. So um, if we can move forward with that intention, that would be great. We'll go ahead and start your time and uh, we'll give our undivided attention to you at this moment. Okay. Um, so I was saying that I, I feel that, that there's a strong message from the empty chambers tonight. I think we live in a culture of conflict. We identify with one group or another group and we tend to do what Mr. Seppos said, which is to think they're wrong and we're right. We don't really have faith in the peace process. It's easy enough to want countries abroad to sit down at the peace table together, but it's really, really hard <clears throat> for us to sit down with our enemies and have any faith that we can reach some kind of um, agreement and even respect and an agreement that might work better for all of us. I'm a preschool teacher, I'm a developmentalist. I don't think we can create the ideal overnight, but I think we can move ahead as much as we can. So the fact that this is an empty chambers pretty much tonight, I expected it to be packed. I thought everybody would want peace. <laughs> this is our big chance. This is, this is what we've been waiting for. Somebody with the leadership quality of somebody like Mr. Seppos who can handle um, acrimonious situation who can handle people who are really, really angry at each other. Um, we're looking for that kind of leadership. We're looking for that kind of faith, that kind of model in our own minds. 
but we don't have faith in it. Most people don't have faith in it. They don't think it's gonna work. And so we're stuck with the fact that um, we don't have it. Um, um, I do think that what Mayor Watkins said um, is true, that the council sets the tone. Believe in each other, find peace with each other, and then we'll follow. We'll try to do our best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Hi, Darius Mosinine here. Um, one thing, um, I'm kind of a Johnny come lately to Facebook. Um, find out you could actually waste about 20% of your day on it. But anyway, one thing I've learned about being on Facebook a little bit more is when people, the folks in Santa Cruz have a problem and don't like something, they immediately go to Facebook and complain about it. And it's been, what, two years since the rent freeze? Well, it was February 7, 2017. I see no Facebook pages, no post about, oh, my landlord did this, oh, he's kicking me out, oh, he raised my rent. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of folks, the uh, tenants, they say, oh, I really like my landlord, he's great, but I heard about this other guy. So again, this idea of having real data is very important, and I don't think, I think um, landlords like myself and others have been quite uh, self-governing in the past two years despite all this. There hasn't been a mass exodus, mass, mass evictions, um, massive rent increases and so forth. So <clears throat> that's one point. Second point, um, different is one thing I noticed in the, uh, the report was this common theme about with this animosity towards a rental inspection program. And it seemed to be coming from not just landlords, but the tenants themselves, which I find really ironic. You hear about these stories of substandard conditions, which Mr. Three Hugs here had talked about, yet he want, and wants rental inspections, yet there's folks, I think, in the report, I'd like to hear more about that, frankly, um, if there's a way to get what, what exactly is wrong. <clears throat> People object to the rental inspection program, which I find, which I also find a slap to Joe and Oscar, does he go? and the other folks that are really um, great bedside manner and good representatives of, of the city when it comes to the um, inspecting rentals. Thank you. <clears throat> I expect you're getting a little weary of seeing some of our faces uh, at every meeting. We likewise are getting a little weary, but uh, I think we've seen Santa Cruz in a very different light from the way we uh, see Santa Cruz in our hearts. Uh, I want to say as a person on this side of the dais that what we just heard was a willingness to work together. And I want, I want to second what uh, we heard from Rick Langinati, and that is that we really need you to work together. If the recall goes through, and is successful. We're going to have no end of uh, bifurcated uh, enmity in this community. We can't, I've said this over and over again, I'll say it one more time, we can do better. And I really do trust each one of you. You're bright, you're caring, you love Santa Cruz, you can do it. We're here. We're willing to say yes. I was a participant in the process. I'm willing to be a, par a participant in the ongoing process. We can do it together. Good evening, I'm Nora Hockman. Uh, I was a stakeholder and interviewed in this process. So for those of the one, two, or however many of you put my name on that list, I thank you for that. I was very honored to be uh, part of this process in the city. Having said that, uh, you know, I really hope that there is no intention to put together a task force as a result of this, because I fear that we will spend six to eight months arguing 
about how those appointments are to be done. And those are really boring discussions on this side of the dais. The endless horse trading and you know, how many people got how many appointments by who and how many people there will be and will it be two people per council member or will the campaigns submit names and I don't care. Because every day that goes by, there are challenges for tenants and if there are challenges for tenants, there are challenges for landlords. It's just the nature of the relationship. So if we don't have a task force, we gotta figure out then by what means we manage to approach each other, I'm talking about the two sides now, to figure out whether we can pull some sort of rabbit out of this hat uh, and you know, make this a go and bring a legitimate recommendation then uh, to council if we can knock out some sort of compromise agreement. I'm very committed to that because I don't think the crying need for some kind. Hi, Carol Paul Hamas. So I was also um, a stakeholder in the interview process. I really appreciate that. I thought it was a great process. I really enjoyed meeting Mr. Seppos and, and going through the process and actually sitting in the hallway and seeing people coming and going and talking to them. Um, I think that there is a way to have a task force. I think that the only way to come up with any kind of recommendations is by getting people on the opposite sides to speak to one another. I really believe that people want the same things. They want stability, they want predictability, they don't want overregulation. they want to be honored and respected for their opinions. I think that's a very doable thing. Um, and again, you set the tone for that. So I would encourage you to think about having a task force. I think it's important. Um, I don't know how else we're gonna figure it out. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, well, after his presentation there, it's, he kind of, the report made things seem kind of hopeless as far as getting going, moving forward. But I think as a community, we can rise above all this, this fray and sit down and make something happen. You know, start with Measure M and Pull the piece, pull it apart, put it back together. Maybe look at other communities, what their rent control ordinances are. Pull them apart, put them back together. Come, you know, take multiple uh, situations, put them all together. And I think, you know, if the right group of people sits down together and they have the backing of their particular uh, whatever groups they represent that maybe we can get somewhere. Um, and I was glad to see that several times in this report, the whole idea of the rental inspection thing came up because that's something that landlords don't like and it's something that tenants don't like. Tenants don't like being invaded by the city. Hi, we're the government, we're here to help you. And then they kick you out of your, out of the, out of your house, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, when that, when that ordinance first came forward, I made up t-shirts with pictures of Joseph Stalin on it and said, hi, I wanna search your house. I don't know if any of you remember that, but uh, anyways, so maybe the first step that everybody can agree on as far as tenants and landlords is get rid of the damn inspection program and then move forward and find other common ground. Thank you. I spoke earlier, my name's Sarah Minildi. I am a section eight tenant and I have just been through an awful lot with someone whose name I will not mention, is, but is publicly known as a wonderful helping the kind of a landlord. And we went through hell together and he sold the house and I thought I was gonna be homeless. And it didn't work out that way, 
but I had a rent increase of about 40%, not 5%, and other lovely things. And um, I'm a senior, I've had cancer, I had a broken leg, a broken knee, this, that, and the other thing. The complexity um, in this stuff requires that everyone listen more carefully. There's power. We were talking about stories. I think as my landlord just wanted to get rid of the whole problem, he escalated stories against me. And I'm not gonna escalate stories back, but it wasn't good. You know, it wasn't good. And you do need to understand that. A person needs to justify if they feel like they're using their power. And um, I don't know what to do about it, but I think that, I mean, it's like my grandparents lived in Santa Cruz County. My grandmother talked to Teddy Roosevelt at the old St. George Hotel in 1903, okay? So when you say it's, you know, it's all of California, well, maybe it is, but I think there are extraordinarily unique things here. And there, I really did work hard. I really did work at Oak Tree Villa. I really did do a lot of things. I wish I could have done more or worked in San Jose. And then, but that is part of the reason my income is so low as Santa Cruz used to pay nothing because the rents were nothing. And now that I'm old and retired, the rents are enormous. My personal experience is irrelevant probably to the larger process, but I do want to remind you that there, are respons there have been responsible working people and you don't get to denigrate them and turn them into irresponsible people who are suffering terribly here. Thank you. <clears throat> are there any additional members of the community that would like to address this on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back to the council um, for action, uh, deliberation, and comments or questions at this time. Councilmember Matthews. I'll go ahead with a comment since I didn't have a question. <laughs> um, and Mr. Sepos, I want to thank you for the report, the process, both the individual um, interview was very frank and comfortable and honest. And um, I have to um, assume from comments that uh, others had similar experiences. And um, your report sounded um, um, very, um, it rang true uh, to my own experience and, and um, in the community and observing the community as a whole. Um, I would say um, I am not inclined to um, go for a task force at this point. Um, exactly, I, and I understand all the good things that are operating uh, in our community in terms of a desire to do better and um, be nicer to one another and so forth. Um, when I looked at that first option that the, the staff showed, which was to uh, refocus on the current work plan, the huge pile of recommendations from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee, the housing element, et cetera, I think there's so much work that where we can get doable result, results um, <clears throat> in a, <laughs> on a satisfying time scale. Uh, um, I, I am not hopeful that the, uh, a task force will deliver different results, um, particularly if the burden for running it um, falls onto our, our staff. Um, I really am eager to, to make progress on some of the things that have been put off for a half year, a year, a year and a half, two years and, and see some results. So that's, I'm just putting it out there. That's where my preference lies. I'll just um, maybe take a moment while I don't see any other hands at this time, and then we'll go ahead and, and kick it over to Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, but I, I can't make a motion, but I was part of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and really enjoyed that process. Um, I know it came from a really robust listening tour, and um, within the three areas is housing protection. and. Um, um, I'll just say that I think part of why I don't think that was um, prioritized to the level I think it could have been is because we knew there was a conversation happening in our community around Measure M. And so we wanted to allow that process to play out. Um, but within that, within that report are a number of suggestions around how do we uh, support the uh, rental housing in our community, how do we support uh, protecting those uh, rental units, as well as other recommendations. So um, for me, knowing that, you know, maybe at this time, given really just an honest report from an uh, um, unbiased outsider, 
to not pursue a, a task force, that, that could be a start to really look at what are, as I know was referenced in, in the report, are the, some of the lower hanging um, fruit items that we could find agreement on and build on those relationships I, potentially and see movement, but ultimately see um, community benefit, which is the center of what is behind that effort and within the report, and I know is really what uh, I think every single one of us in this room and on the dais really cares about. Um, so perhaps maybe it's sort of a, a blend of the two options of really saying, look, we wanna keep working on housing in all forms, because it was identified that it's now one solution to address the housing challenges in our community. Um, and we wanna say, maybe we'll take a real, a real look at the rental protection components of the, of the blueprint because that was sort of uh, sort of cast aside at the time, um, and that could come up in the context of an ad hoc council subcommittee. But <laughs> instead of maybe having it being sort of narrowly focused on um, the the topic before us, that it maybe be more inclusive of um, housing protection as well as how it complements some of the other efforts. I also just want to speak to what I think was brought forward by the community in regards to the council behavior. I feel that. Um, I, 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 as I said, I take that that feedback really seriously. And I um, recognize that within the report, there were aspects of passive and more active elements of how council members behaved within the context of um, not only Measure M, but in general. And so I will reflect on my own personal behaviors and I will also uh, be mindful moving forward in terms of how we as a council can really start to move forward in uh, seeking compromise and uh, bringing our community together. Um, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Glover and then uh, kick it over to you, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so first one, I appreciate Mr. Seppos, as has others, but uh, definitely a positive experience in the interview process as well as the questions and the clarity as well as the candid nature of his report back because I think it really provides a important perspective and view of Santa Cruz. Uh, to some, it might be really surprising. To others, not so much, especially if you look at the discourse and the conversations going on in the community, both in real life, but especially uh, online with the way that people communicate. So I'm hoping and looking forward to moving closer together. I also appreciate some of the statements from the public. Um, something that stuck out to me well, first, there was, uh, I believe, our last speaker that mentioned that uh, they thought that their personal experience was potentially irrelevant for other people, and I just want to let you know that your opinion matters if you're still here, it looks like you may have left. Um, but every story matters, whether they be uh, rich, poor, renter, or landlord. Um, something else that stuck out to me was we live in a culture of conflict, which I think is uh, important to acknowledge, uh, both uh, for the fact that I know that for a lot of people, conflict it used to be that way for me too, something that we try to avoid. <clears throat> and I would encourage all of us within the community uh, to not be afraid of conflict and to embrace it and engage with it because if we come at it from the perspective that conflict is neutral, it doesn't carry any good or bad attributes to it, it just has to do with how we manage conflict. When something happens, how we address it and move through it because ideally we can use conflict as a tool to bring ourselves closer together because after we deal with that conflict, we have a better understanding of each other and a more clear understanding of our shared values and goals. So I uh, look forward to implementing those philosophies and ideologies both in the community and on this body, uh, and I will be uh, excited to be a part of that process. Also, um, when, with regards to the motions, uh, the, it's difficult, and I think that, you know, just looking at the calendar and knowing that we have our uh, strategic planning session on the 22nd, that may be a good opportunity for council members to really dive deeper into the conversation around rent, renters' protections, the structuring of an ad hoc committee. So I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, maybe it's good if we set an intention with the motion to do it, but do we think that it's maybe premature to do it before our strategic planning session? So just a, a question I pose to my colleagues. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Brown. I had a question actually for um, Mr. Seppos. And I want, first I wanna also thank you for the report you were able to provide to the city of Santa Cruz for all the work you did around interviews and um, just the honesty of the report that you brought forward. I thought it was really helpful. And um, 
and I, th I think it was pretty spot on for where we're at. Um, I also, you know, want to acknowledge the fact that you didn't say absolutely not, and you didn't say yes, and you, you know, you, you focused on it being unsuccessful at this time, and for the variety of reasons that you brought forward, it, it makes sense, um, just given the, uh, the climate that we currently are facing in Santa Cruz. In the absence of bringing forward a task force, I'm just curious from your professional perspective, um, I just envision, you know, you address the fact that there is a recall happening right now, and um, and I think one of my concerns is that that's going to continue to divide the community. Um, and additionally, I feel like a, a lot of tenants in Santa Cruz and um, tenant supporters also, you know, if we don't do anything, are going to feel. I think it's going to continue to um, drive this rift because we continue to see more. Um, market rate housing get built and more tenants getting um, either asked to, you know, leave their homes or face high rental increases. And so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts around um, where we go from here and, and um, yeah, just any professional perspective on this. Million dollar question. <laughs> Love your pay grade. <laughs> um, where to go from here? Um, well, um, you know, I, I feel um, it's an interesting experience doing any time I do an assessment because there, there necessarily has to be a disassociation, you know, from the conflicts or the challenges that folks are going through. And yet at the same time, however cliche this sounds, I care about the people that I meet and work with and talk to. It's, you know, it's hard to not be engaged in these kinds of candid discussions and not do that. In that context, I feel badly for this community. Um, I'm not taking sides. I want to be very clear. I, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the legitimacy or the effectiveness or appropriateness of a recall. I'm going to say that you're, this community is about to go on a war footing for the next two years. That's my assessment. Um, right, wrong, good, bad, needed, not needed. I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to say that. The dynamic of the compellingly expressed need for something to be done about the topic, let alone the relationships, but just the topic. And that sequentially more than likely having to now take a, a seat to the immediacy presumed of a recall means you're going to be in these successive dynamics. It's going to be a lot of time. It's going to be a lot of emotion. It's going to be a lot of money. There's already been frayed relationships, or at least it's been expressed to me. So I feel badly for this community in terms of where you go next. I think some of your members of the community have really stated it, I, I, but I, I think it, it's they have to, people have to look in a mirror too. I think um, whether or not you engage a task force, um, the externalities that I spoke to and Mr. Longinati called back up, I, I think that those remain fundamental. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you a very blunt answer to something. You can't, this is a progressive community by and large, and, and I, you can't point to certain conditions at a national scale and say that the words and behavior of a particular leader have impact and emboldened behavior, but then disassociate it when it happens at a local level. So if you're going to presume that the behavior and actions of other leaders embolden certain behavior, then so too does that kind of dynamic in this community. Yeah. Um, that's a blunt answer. Um, but so too then is a requirement of people taking a disciplined way on how they behave amongst themselves too. So whether or not you engage a task force, I think that those things are things that probably for the better of this community it's my recommendation is you'd want to be trying to deal with the things that you can deal with. I don't know if I'm really, I don't know if that gets to the heart of your question, but I don't really know what, I mean, what else to say other than that, really. Okay. Hopefully that <laughs> touched on it somewhat. Okay. Thanks, I appreciate it. Um, I just want to say that moving forward, um, I have an alternative uh, motion to make that's in, in addition to the ones currently posted. But uh, one thing that I've been trying to do since getting elected is really find ways to engage with members of the community and 
engage with other members of the city council who maybe haven't always shared the same opinions with because I think that we need to, as has been mentioned, um, really try to work together as a community. I've met with folks who were very much no on M. I've met with my other colleagues who were on the rent control campaign and um, have maybe not voted the way that everyone's always wanted me to see. And I think part of that's been trying to actually get the community to work together and figure out ways we can collaborate. So I'm very much interested moving forward, trying to work with members of the community in any way possible. If the task force isn't gonna go forward and if the ad hoc committee doesn't go forward, I'm gonna be really reaching out to community members to figure out ways that we can pass um, policy that's gonna be um, very inclusive of the folks in our community. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Suppos, for your candid, honest um, uh, reflection on what's going on in our community. I'm having a, I mean, I don't want to repeat what's already been said, so I'll just, I'll leave it there. I really appreciate it and um, wish that we, I mean, one of the reasons that I wish we could do a task force right now, we could actually vote to proceed on a task force is that I think working with you, that it would be really great for our community to have somebody who's honest and, and really capable to come in here and help whip us into shape <laughs> um, when it comes to you know working on what I believe is the most vital issue that we face in this community. Um, the thing, the kind of talking past each other. I mean, all of the dynamics that you um, have have raised in this report, um, for me, were precisely the reasons. I mean, I, it, it didn't really come as a surprise. Um, it's, I mean, it's obviously hard to see it in the, these stark terms, you know, staring back at you when you're reading, um, but it, it didn't surprise me much. Um, and those dynamics are kind of precisely why I thought genuinely it would be a good idea to have a task force to kind of bring people together who say they're willing to negotiate in good faith to have those conversations because they don't happen otherwise. They don't happen um, on their own or they, ha they haven't been. Um, so it makes me sad to, you know, but I, you know, I can only recommend doing a task force if um, at this point, given what we've seen and kind of what we've all been through, if that was a unanimous decision by all of my colleagues, and I'm sad that that's not happening here, that, that others um, aren't inclined to, um, to move ahead and, and give this a try um, and make those commitments to, to stay out of the way and, um, and see if the community could come together and we could help facilitate that. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing um, what Council Member Cumming, or Vice Mayor Cummings, excuse me, um, is thinking about as a way forward because I don't think it's acceptable to do nothing right now. Um, if we do nothing, um, if we do not at least um, step up and demonstrate that we can provide some leadership and that we can work together, um, the community is gonna go duke it out again. And, um, or maybe the community will come together. But um, you know, as, as I think some of the members, the people, folks who spoke tonight, they're looking to us for leadership. And walking away and doing nothing is not leadership. Um, so, like I said, I'm looking forward to what Vice Mayor Cummings has come up with. I have a few thoughts of my own and I hopefully they'll, um, I think they are likely to align. Um, so I think I'll leave it at there for now. Okay. Well, um, I'm not seeing any not seeing any other hands being raised at this time. So, if I could just in maybe in summary, uh, try to see how we can uh, move forward as a council unanimously. I think you know one of the things that I think I can say that I hear is that there's not really this sort of let's go let's not do the task force. But I think but it could maybe happen eventually, but maybe not tonight is sort of my um, feeling at this moment. Um, but in terms of what I believe Councilmember Glover suggested, and, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I am in agreement with if that's the direction we wanna go, is we wanna continue to work on uh, bringing our community together, showing leadership, and actually making a difference in regards to housing in our community. And so if that comes out of our uh, strategic planning session, then that, it's fine if we wanna have that conversation there. 
there um, if, if we don't wanna move forward on forming an ad hoc in any way to kind of dive deeper into what I think is already, and actually I will just give a shout out to our planning department too. They received award of excellence for their work around our housing blue, blueprint subcommittee um, from the uh, Northern California Association of Planning. See. Northern California American Planning Association. You were very close. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Anyhow, um, it's a it's a it's a document that's been. Um, it's been acknowledged by their peers in terms of excellence. And I think it's also the foundation for uh, what we can really do together in terms of supporting our community and bringing us together. So I'd be happy to say uh, if it's at the will of the council that we uh, continue the conversation to really think about that in terms of our strategic planning, if that's the approach and or look at a sort of a merged uh, motion or direction in regards to uh, some sort of ad hoc of council members coming together to really dive deeper into that report, particularly around the um, housing protection components and looking at some of the low hanging fruits as was identified in the, um, in this, in the summary report. Okay, I think I saw council member Glover, vice mayor Cummings and then council member Myers. Thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, also curious about Vice Mayor Cummings' alternate motion, but something that I could see uh, to respect what Councilmember Brown had um, uh, brought up was the way to move forward and take action tonight, maybe not a task force, but doing something to show that we're able to take some steps and at least still have the gears turning and the ball moving forward or moving the needle. So I could see a fusion of one and two. Um, I could just see one with the uh, establishment or the kind of statement of intention that we will be addressing this at the strategic planning meeting. Uh, so those are all things that I could be totally open to supporting. Can you go to number three again, please? Citizens, oh yeah. Um, so uh, either one or two, I mean we could do one and include parts of two. So it could be something like direct staff to uh, continue on the current work plan and initiate <laughs> an ad hoc subcommittee that would spend some special time talking about it at the strategic meeting if we were to break into groups. I'm not sure how that's gonna be structured. So if we're gonna do small group work, then there could be a group specifically focused on the issue of renters protections and or task force formations. So just some suggestions um, for conversation, but I don't wanna make a motion until I hear Vice Mayor Cummings. Okay, the million dollar motion. Let's go ahead right. here. <laughs> um, my motion was something um, a little bit different, but uh, there have been a number of folks in the community, I mean, pro M and against M and pro rent control and not, who really want more data. And so um, taking some recommendations brought forward by community members, <clears throat> I wanted to um, direct staff, make the motion to direct staff to bring back recommendations to pursue an online rental lease, rental increase, notice to quit, and eviction submission and tracking program for the purposes of gathering fine scale data on the frequency and magnitude of rental increases, notices to quit, and evictions in the city of Santa Cruz. And in addition to that, that we um, review the blueprint subcommittee report and bring this back at the planning session on June 22nd. Okay, so uh, Councilmember Glover. Uh, so I'll second that for conversation so that we can have a conversation about it. Um, and the question then I guess is uh, with the online database survey structure, is it a mandatory thing for all landlords to participate in? Is it an optional thing? Cause that could mess with the data. Well, th this is for staff to bring back the recommendations. Oh, I'm sorry, and to, to bring back the recommendations at the next city council meeting. For how to implement it? Yes. So that we can take all the considerations of mandatory, how would the structure of the um, process be, timelines, costs, all those kinds of considerations. I, I, yep, all right, yep, second. Okay, I'll just um, have a little bit of hesitation here because we have a full meeting, we have one more meeting prior to our uh, council break and um, 
that seems uh, sort of detailed and um, and uh, potentially time consuming to have that type of turnaround. Um, not to say that that isn't something that could be forthcoming, nor nor to um, sort of dismiss it as not even a potential option. I think I think that could actually really help um, fuel potentially maybe what would be a conversation around this ad hoc. Mm -hmm. But I think it might. Um, evolve into that, but not necessarily start with that, would be my sort of just instinctual response to that. But I'd like to see what the staff says in regards to um, sort of the timeline, the different information that was suggested or requested in terms of the data. Do you have a response to that? <laughs> Before you Sorry, I was seat? talking to him. <laughs> That's okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? It's essentially your take on, on sort of approach timeline. Sure. Uh, so Lee Butler, planning director, and yes, um, I, I certainly think that that is doable in terms of it being something required. We would need to do um, ordinance updates. Getting ordinance updates in front of the council um, by the next meeting certainly would not uh, be something we could put together. But um, you know, the the reports are due uh, to the city manager's office in two days uh, for the next meeting. Um, so that draft, you know, I, I understand there has been some community work uh, surrounding this. And so building on that community work and um, at least agendizing it as a discussion for the council, you could provide some direction so that during the council break um, uh, over July, uh, we could be working on uh, an ordinance and bring that back. Um, early after the council recess with an ordinance that could mandate the uh, requirements and um, that could dovetail with some of the other things that we're doing in terms of um, moving uh, some of our rental inspection service uh, uh, information online. And so the, the timing is nice in terms of uh, complementary efforts that we're doing in that respect. Um, but. We would need an ordinance um, for it to be required. Um, that would be a council decision. That would be sometime, you know, August at the earliest. Um, if you wanted significant outreach um, in the interim, it may be longer than that. Um, or if you wanted some of that uh, public uh, discourse to occur at the um, the council meetings, then it could be it could be sooner. I do think this could land outside of the zoning ordinance, and as a result, um, wouldn't need to go to the planning commission for recommendations. Um, it could nest within some of the rental inspection service uh, um, provisions that we have, which are um, in. Um, on Title 20, I believe, Chapter 20 of the Municipal Code. Um, so given... Do you have a second? I yeah, a there's, a, there's a motion on the floor. There's a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Cummins, Cummings. There's a second by Councilmember Glover. We're in uh, uh, conversation and deliberation at this time. Um, I guess I would just say that, you know, I think to the earlier point made by uh, Councilmember Glover, mm -hmm. that we will be having a strategic planning session in terms of short-term work plan goals. And I think this could easily be uh, identified as something we as a council could find um, support for, um, as well as some other elements that might uh, have shared interests amongst our council. So my instinct, again, would be to sort of uh, pause that at this time and, and wait to have that conversation when we have actually our um, planning session. Okay, uh, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Myers. A couple things. So you just mentioned you have a full schedule planned for the strategic planning uh, session, but it does seem to me like um, uh, more focus on the, the whole cluster of what do we do next on housing issues is appropriate for that um, strategic planning session. It's kind of in everyone's mind. I wasn't clear from your motion if you intended this to be something that happened right now, what are individual people's experiences, in which case you get what's a statistically valid accounting or were you looking at a mandatory ordinance that would be landlord-based? It just wasn't clear for me where you were going with your motion, <laughs> which is, let me just say, another reason to put it off and have a little bit further discussion. The point of the motion was mainly to get this on the agenda so that we can um, begin to have a discussion around what this kind of program would look like. And so um, the idea being that um, one of the things that's been expressed in the community is um, 
how often are rent increases happening? Mm -hmm. How often are we having people ask to leave their homes and there not being any mechanism for actually tracking that? Mm -hmm. And so the idea being that given the fact that we know this is to be true within our community, bringing this forward as something to put on the agenda that we could discuss in further detail and then um, make recommendations to staff whether or not it's to review the potential for changes in ordinance language that would come back to us in the fall um, and better understand how we can implement this. Um, I think it's just um, a piece of this um, this issue around rental house housing that um, folks have been saying that we need more data on and I think this might be a good mechanism to do so. My own feeling is that dropping it cold without much um, preparation on an agenda just gets us back into this kind of flashpoint of a whole lot of... We'll go ahead and ask that if you uh, go ahead and refrain from making comments. We've had an opportunity to hear from the public at this time. We'll go ahead and return it back to um, the council and we'll go ahead and allow you. I, I, I do like the idea of bringing this up as part of our strategic planning discussion on housing. My own feeling is that some outreach to different um, sta stakeholder categories about how to go about this would be good on this one item. <laughs> so there's some sense, I mean, I think that was in a way part of the difficulty with Measure M. It was, um, it was cooked up and delivered cold. <laughs> and that's, so that, that and that would be my approach. There. That's part of why I wanted to get staff's input and recommendations uh -huh. so that we can have a discussion about how staff feels that we should move forward with implementing this kind of program. And then we can have a discussion about it. And during the summer, um, the steps and recommendations we take to implement it could be taken into account. Okay. All right. And one more question. Yeah. It just, uh, do you feel comfortable deferring this to the strategic planning session? I, th I think that's fine. It's going to be, I mean, it's earlier, so it's sooner, but yeah. I'd be fine with No, I mean, just to get this initial discussion. Go I'd on. be fine. Okay. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I guess I just want to echo, um, I think that the work of the Blueprint, the Blueprint uh, subcommittee report is a really um, workable set of, of priorities for the community. So I, I, I don't want to lose track of right. the intent of the work that you guys did, which is housing protection, housing preservation, and housing production, you know? And so I think we have to balance this need to address immediate needs around tenant protections and tenant, tenant concerns. Um, but I do agree, I think we're starting to hear some consensus here. I think um, taking this to our strategic planning session makes a lot of sense to me right now and, and, and versus making a motion tonight, but maybe we just refer it to our strategic planning session and we come back after the break with additional work or additional action. Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Kevin. Um, I understand the um, the interest in trying to fit f figure out how this fits in with our the workload and in terms of our overall strategic planning. My concern is, well, I guess I'll start by saying I, I believe the intent um, of Vice Mayor Cummings making this motion was to agendize this for discussion and direction to do something so that we could actually be doing something in the fall rather than waiting until the fall to provide direction to do something for the winter. So I feel like if there's a way that we can actually out of our um, strategic planning session, take that action and direct staff at that time on the 22nd, um, then that that's okay, but I if that's not going to happen, then I would vote right now to agendize it for the 25th because I don't think we can wait um, all through the whole summer and then get back around to it after our break. Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings, and I see City Manager Martin Bernal. I don't know if you want to weigh in before we have. The only thing I was just thinking about is with respect to the uh, strategic planning session. The intent is to discuss a whole variety of different issues. So you just kind of be careful to not have one mm -hmm. item uh, take up all your time. So you just have to be really strategic about that. 
um, because it's intended to discuss a whole variety of different issues. But I mean, if I could just add that it's also designed to give some direction of consensus items on behalf of our Correct. council for our staff so that we can move forward in a, a thoughtful way in terms of policy and priorities within a short period of time, correct? That, that's right, so the, the idea is to develop a six month uh, work plan as a starting point and then, then work on the longer term uh, or a process for the longer term uh, two year work plan. Okay, Council Member Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then back to Council. Thank you, I just wanna confirm the structure of the motion because there was something that was suggested before which I don't support and I don't think, it, I didn't accept it so I just wanna make sure we're talking about the same thing is that uh, Vice Mayor Cummings motion which was to have staff come back with their thoughts on it for the next city, or agendizing it, I should say, for the next city council meeting so that we can have discussion and then give instruction, as Director Butler mentioned, over summer to do the work and the groundwork and then come back so we can do it in August and then specifically have a conversation of some length to address it so we can all talk about it at the uh, strategizing meeting on the 22nd. Because I, is that what you're, what? Your Vice Mayor Cummings. Well, I think, I think that the change was, and this is kind of getting to my question, which was going to be, would we be able to take action on this on the 22nd if we bring it earlier? And if the answer is no, then that would be a concern because I think that um, the whole point and having had the, um, the planning director mention that we would be able to bring something because it's a recommendation for discussion on the 25th. Um, <clears throat> I think that if it's to come on the 22nd, if we can take action on it, that'd be fine, it's coming sooner. Um, but I think that if we can't take action on it on the 22nd, I mean, the whole point of this is to have a discussion around this type of program. And so what can come out of that is recommendations for community engagement. It's the potential for, you know, learning more about how much it's gonna cost, getting more input from other members of the city council. But the idea being that um, we've now taken about six months to take a step back from working on anything related, well, most things related to tenant protections. And now the recommendation is that we should not do a task force. And if we're not gonna do a task force, then one of the things that's been brought to me that I've been patiently waiting on is bringing this forward to the council. And I think that this is a good opportunity for us to begin having discussions and starting to think about how we're gonna address these issues. Sorry, could you restate no, it again? I think I was next. So that was my question actually to the, I guess to the city manager, because it's, it's related if we can take action on the 22nd on this, if we put it on our strategic planning or if it needs to go on a regular agenda. Yeah, I, I think I was just thinking, trying to think that through. I, I think the, there's a challenge in the sense that mm -hmm. uh, if you're taking any kind of substantive uh, action and there's public interest, you know, trying to formulate an agenda or around that in, a, in this kind of setting it will be difficult. Um, you can certainly discuss, you know, discuss it and how it uh, uh, fits in with priorities and give us a sense of that it's important and you want us to work on that. Um, I think you can certainly do that. Um, but if there's an interest in the council to actually have potentially some public comment on it and, and sort of your normal decision-making process, that setting would be difficult to be able to sort of give that type of direction. Uh, I believe, I think having an overall discussion, how it all fits in and then bringing it back uh, would be more of the standard process. So then there would be the proper notice and, uh, and, the, and the normal way the council would sort of give direction to staff on a particular item, uh, particularly if there's public interest in weighing in and, and hearing it. Okay, I'll just go ahead and add it, then I'll, I'll kick it over to Councilmember Brown that I think that there's sort of, it's, a, yeah, it's sort of a both and. You can kind of give direction in terms of um, broader uh, strategic alignment in terms of efforts, but it's um, not agendized and it won't be agendized to uh, have us taking any specific policy action and I don't think that would be appropriate in terms of, um, you know, detailed discussion in, in that regard at that in that setting. Um, so I think it's it's sort of that tricky sort of in-between space, but I don't think taking specific policy action, if it's agendized as a council retreat for strategic planning on this type of very specific policy would be appropriate under the Brown Act constraints. Um, Councilmember Brown. Um, thank you. So uh, given that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, say that I will support the motion as it stands to have this agendized for June 25th. It sounds like our staff, um, Director Butler said uh, that at least some kind of 
information could be pulled together to provide a basis for that conversation. We also have some materials that have been given to, to several of the council members. So I'm gonna go ahead and call the question on that motion. Okay, so we have a motion to call the question by Council Member Brown, seconded by uh, Council Member Crone. Um, can we just have a repeat of the motion? If we could go ahead and restate the motion at this time. Sure. <clears throat> so the motion is to direct staff to bring back recommendations to pursue an online rental lease, rental increase, notice to quit, and eviction submission and tracking program for the purposes of gathering fine scale data on the frequency and magnitude of rental increases, notices to quit and evictions in the city of Santa Cruz to come back on the agenda for June 25th and to um, have the city council review <clears throat> housing blueprint subcommittee report recommendations um, for action to be taken at the special planning meeting. So we have a motion to call the question and I'm not gonna support the call the question at this time, but I'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor to call the question, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Oh. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, and Councilmember Glover voting in support of calling a question, which means all discussion on the agenda, uh, I mean, on, on the motion before us, um, will be voted upon without any further discussion at this time. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting in support, and Councilmember Myers, Matthews, and myself voting against. Councilmember Matthews. I just wanna say, since I couldn't say it before, I'm quite sympathetic to the um, desire to gather uh, credible statistics. Um, my concern was the speed of this action, the specificity of what was required, um, and the idea that the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee would be also included in that same discussion it seemed like too much too soon, that I, I fear will um, create some um, backlash right away. I'm, I'm actually very sympathetic to the underlying desire. I actually would be supportive of the underlying desire. As mayor, it's very difficult to agendize this way. And I think just to acknowledge that there's likelihood that we would have to remove some other types of items that we had, um, at, you know, sort of tentatively scheduled for that um, meeting, given the, the depth of um, agenda items we have before us. So um, actually my vote is not in opposition to the content, it's in opposition to the process. Councilmember uh, Myers? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, reflect also, I think um, from the very beginning, I've been really um, interested in making sure we design the policy around the best data that we can get. And um, so I just, uh, yeah, so I, We'll, we'll see how things play out. But yeah, I mean, I, I understand the intent of the motion. Um, it would have been uh, really nice to be able to support it, but it's, it's I'll let it go there. <laughs> Council Deliver. Yeah, so um, I just wanna say that I uh, hear and acknowledge the concerns expressed by both Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Myers with regards to the speed at which we are moving to explore this option. Now, I do, would do want to remind us that it is a, just a conversation at the next meeting and giving instruction for staff. So that could take a very short amount of time in the agenda based off of the conversation that we have at the uh, meeting. <clears throat> but I would call, <clears throat> excuse me, attention to uh, Mr. Seppos and the report um, and w in a in an effort to try and work together and try to figure out some things, we ended up again with another 4-3 vote, which is not a very good look for a community, especially when they're looking to us to engage. And uh, in response to the question, too much, too fast, I'm just a little concerned that we're at this point right now because we've done too little too late. And so now we're at the situation where we have already waited six months because we wanted to see if there was a task force option. We uh, did that. Um, now we're here and we need to decide, are we going to wait another two 
to three months before we even can really start doing it because it's gonna get through uh, summer and then we're gonna get into August and then there's gonna be things like the transitional encampments and the opening of facilities that are gonna take up a lot of meeting time. And so when are we actually going to get to it? Um, I think, uh, I hope that y'all can understand where I'm personally coming from and the vote I think that was reflected by the other three uh, and then really figure out how we can start working together and compromising so that even, and, and, and work together. So I just look forward to that. Okay, so we have another agenda item after this, which is our budget. So um, I'll go ahead and acknowledge City Manager Martin Bernal. I just wanted to, to make a clarification. I was uh, conferring with our planning director just to be clear about uh, what we would be able to bring back because uh, the motion noted recommendations. And I just want to be clear that what we can provide is sort of just initial background information. Uh, it's not necessarily specific recommendations of one, what to do or not to do, just kind of initial thoughts. So it really just background information to at least introduce you to the topic. I think that's more of what we're thinking, not specific recommendations. Um, and you, know, you can add a little bit more to that, but sure, just um, clarify that. Just given the timing of the turnaround, wanted to set some expectations about um, our ability to come forward with well thought out recommendations could be a challenge, but um, certainly would um, welcome the information that's been gathered from the community that we could build into that report, have initial thoughts related to that. The timing implications, um, IT requirements for implementing that program, we'll need to coordinate with our IT staff to understand that and um, we can have a brief um, set of information related to that as well as outreach um, that would dictate the timing as well. In addition, opportunity costs um, with the direction councils previously provided related to bringing back um, the options related to our rental inspection service and um, seeking to get uh, some prioritization from you related so that can relate to your um, strategic planning discussion as well. So uh, just want to set some expectations with the, the staff report actually being due in two days. Reasonable expectations. Okay, so we have count, we'll go ahead and um, remind the community that uh, We'll go ahead and refrain from uh, comments at this time. Before we wrap up, I think there was a comment. Made Just one, I wanna to speak to the 4-3 vote on this. Uh, I think it's worth saying that um, that was based not on the intent and desire of the motion, um, more strictly on the uh, timing and uh, immediate workload. So uh, I think it does not reflect the degree of div division that was implied. Okay. okay. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, then close the item. Thank you, Mr. Seppos. Thank you, staff. Uh, um, appreciate your work on this very much and your, and your trip to, San, uh, to Santa Cruz from Sacramento. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, take maybe a two minute transition break and um, get back to our budget. So sweaty. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, Bonnie. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back. We um, we are not done. We are not done yet for this evening. We have to return to our earlier item, item number 27, Almost which there. is the, uh, we're nearly there in terms of the budget adoption. So um, we'll go ahead and ask that the council and the community um, come back to session and then we'll uh, turn it over to Marcus uh, to uh, bring us up to speed on where we left it and what we need to um, finalize before we end tonight's meeting. Oh, Hi. hello <laughs> again. Marcus Pimentel, your finance director. We are close. So this is just recapping sort of the last motion sets that we were working on. Uh, motions three and four are done. Um, motion two is no longer relevant based on the action that just occurred. So we're focused really on f filling the final questions for motion one, which is adopting a full 
fully balanced city budget. And I do recognize that there were some other questions council members had beyond some of just our, our logistics on getting a balanced budget. So if you wouldn't mind, we'll start with focusing on the balanced budget. And I know there were some other questions and, and areas of concern that we wanted to explore afterwards. So I'll go over to our revised version of our live model. So these are kind of the four items that were dangling when we finished the afternoon session. And I realized one of the first big questions we have after this is the first alarm that seemed to be a, 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 a common concern. Um, Janice was identified as a placeholder. There were, I think, some comments related, related to that. Uh, at the prior afternoon session, council opted to defund that and use that to, to fund the foster grandparent program. Um, first alarm, private patrols, I have a little schedule that we can uh, talk about that one. Uh, we have just, just a, an administrative uh, action that was left out of increasing by 23,300 our contribution to the animal shelter services, the JPA board. That's just an administrative general fund increase. And then there's an administrative water fund um, omitted $20,000 for a water purification project. And they asked to have that uh, added to their budget. It comes out of their operating fund balance. So those are the four remaining budget actions re remaining to go. Uh, I might recommend um, maybe starting with the, them in order and, and seeing what the Janus discussion was, and then we can pop into the first alarm discussion and review the level of interest the council might have to restore or have a discussion around that program. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Or just take the easy ones in seven and eight first. Um, that, that might be the, <laughs> get some rhythm going. Whatever that sounds you like. great. Let's yeah. do that. Is All anybody right. interested in moving items number seven and eight? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. I'll go ahead and second that. Um, we did have public comment earlier on this item, so we're just sort of continuing the item, so there will be no public comment at this point. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So then we'll go back to items uh, one and two, or 16 and 19. And um, if I recall, um, Councilmember Brown, please do um, further elaborate. But if I recall, your intention of having the money was really just to show our support. But what you were suggesting is to have um, a more uh, robust conversation about our relationship with um, Janice, but also just our efforts around op the opioid epidemic and, and those types of services in general. And so you were feeling comfortable with um, waiting for those uh, conversations to take place before uh, doing any funding allocations at this time. Does that feel accurate to you? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, does that uh, feel appropriate to the council, Councilmember Glover? Oh, I just, uh, I was the one that brought back C-16 because we had replaced it, replaced it with uh, the foster grandparents, but I requested to pull it and bring it back because of the statement made by Mr. Escalante about the criticism of the city not providing any content or co compensation or support for Janus, but then talking about labor negotiations and or the relationship between Janus and its workers. So I just w wanted to reopen that conversation because is it worth just $5,400, because that's a really tiny amount compared to all the other stuff that we're talking about, to still maintain that symbolic stance of wanting to support um, substance use disorder and the workers and that kind of treatment, so. Okay. Councilor Matthews? Yeah, I actually thought that was a kind of weirdly spurious comment on his part. Um, I don't believe we currently uh, provide any kind of funding for Janus. Um, obviously, they are really important um, treatment facility in our community. There are many, many others. Some of them are supported in part through um, our community programs, grants. Um, uh, other others are supported through CDBG in some form. So I think um, the time to have that much larger discussion is uh, when we come up for the uh, core funding programs with the county. Um, the county is really the main consumer of their services. Um, so in my mind, I'm, I totally support uh, putting foster grandparents in here at the $5,000 level and deferring the whole issue of 
how and at what level the city may support Janice in the context of all the other support for other agencies who also have probably many of the same issues. Thank so you. That, that's how I'd like to, so that's how I'd like to approach it. I share that, Councilmember Brown. So I, yeah, yeah I, I concur uh, with Councilmember Matthews' uh, comments there, and I would just add um, the, in response to Mr. Mr. Escalante's point, just so we all are kind of clear about this, um, the the city does not fund Janus in part because of the core process that was established and the discussions that were had uh, about how the, what the mix of city and county funding would be. So I believe we did used to fund Janus to some extent, a small amount maybe. And um, it all went to the, or so, you know, maybe not Janus in particular, but some of the ones that, that were the county, um, with the county and city split, there was the reconfiguration. So, and the county does provide a significant funding to Janus of Santa Cruz. So um, I think that it really is a conversation for a broader conversation to be had um, at a, a later date and hopefully not too much later. Okay, I completely agree. So it's maybe just not now, but potentially after a, long, a larger conversation. <laughs> and I just wanna uh, express that I hear the statements of all of my colleagues with regards to having the opportunity to have this conversation at a future time and the like. Um, I'm just a little, and while I accept it, uh, I, I can move forward with that. I do just want to go on record and say that the issue of substance use disorder in our city is a huge issue. It's important to a ton of people across the spectrum of political ideologies. Um, and $5,400 to make a symbolic kind of just like, yeah, fist bump to Janice. I don't see the biggest fiscal impact to that right now in this budget right now for just $5,400. But um, it, I hear it. So we'll, can just, uh, we can pull that, I guess. Okay. Do so for, need, for another time. Do you need a motion? I don't think so. I don't, do we need a motion? No. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go to first alarm and see um, if there was any, um, I think how it was left, if I recall, was an interest in supporting particularly the areas that find first alarm incredibly valuable, like those that were expressed from the neighbors in the Ocean Street area, um, and what we could do to continue that support in that regard. Councilmember Matthews. What I'd like to do is take the, um, uh, uh, 30,000 from, oh no, that we funded the community TV. Um, let me see. The um, additional 25,000 for the heritage tree uh, that we did not fund and the additional uh, 30,000 for the tenant legal services, which comes to 55 and allocate that for first alarm services um, to be um, directed at the discretion of the police department according to specific neighborhood needs. So that would be my motion. And um, I'll say that I did talk at some length with the police chief. Um, I think we will not get to the level of designated uh, first alarm service between certain hours on certain days that we have had in the past, but I'm absolutely convinced that the availability of first alarm has made a, uh, a critical difference in certain neighborhoods at certain times, and it has uh, motivated and encouraged um, the residents in those neighborhoods to take an active <laughs> part in um, um, basically creating a sense of community and safety in their neighborhoods. And I wanna say specifically, these are not rich, protected, gated communities. These are working class, low income, heavily impacted communities that have um, uh, really felt over the years uh, the brunt of a, a combination of forces. So uh, for that reason, I think, uh, and I should also say um, in talking with the police chief, Many um, businesses in these communities also hire their own security. Um, in our conversation, we thought there was probably a lot of potential for um, the police um, uh, deploying first alarm in common and in conversation with the businesses that are that are paying their own security to collaborate better and more effectively um, to everybody's increased benefit. So I, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, at this amount of money, we can still do something that's significant for the neighborhoods, not just no, uh, 
upper ocean, but some in Harvey West, some in the beach area, um, as, as determined where the PD is gonna determine it's, it's most effective. So that, that's kind of the backstory of, of the motion. Councilmember Brown? Uh, I'll second that and just for the sake of time, concur with uh, Councilmember Matthews. I do wanna point out though that I believe the heritage tree um, funding was going to be used to restore the IT help That's desk. Right. So we yep. can't yep. use it for right. both purposes, well, but it, but nevertheless, I, yeah. yeah, and yeah. And, yeah. and I'll note we have um, some available budget so that it can draw from there and the 30,000 would also draw mm -hmm. from the available budget. Great, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman Berglover? Yeah, absolutely. So Marcus, just c confirm with me that number at the top, the 134 is the excess? I wouldn't classify it that way when we're facing a three seven million shortfall in some reserves, but right, it's yes. the wiggle room, right? That we have more or less. I know you're you're a fiscally responsible guy, and you're just like no. But um, <laughs> this is a example of the paradigm shift that I hope to see change in Santa Cruz. We're not going to fund fifty four hundred dollars in substance use services or support, but we're going to spend fifty five thousand dollars on patrol and enforcement, like. That's dumbfounding to me because that makes no sense from the data. If you look at data, you are much more effective at preventative care than reactionary enforcement. So why in God's green earth would we cut $5,400 of symbolic money to an organization and spend $55,000 on a first alarm. And I've had, I had a great conversation with Mr. Glynn, who is the one that has written us many emails um, and messages about the situation on uh, Ocean Street. And from his reports, Frank sounds like an amazing person just all around, uh, not to mention the work that he does with First Alarm. But does Frank alone cost $55,000 a year? What's Frank's annual income? All I've gotten are re requests for Frank. Um, so uh, I, <clears throat> I think that there's a values break here and I do not agree with this allocation of money and I do not agree with our approach to d dealing with issues of substance use and enforcement. So I cannot in good conscience support this motion at all. Um, I'll just maybe say that I think what we're also seeing, and I know it's not um, stark in terms of our shifts, but we're not funding them at the level that we had in the oh past, Lord, which no. was 250,000, I recall. So it's just sort of that transition of uh, a service that a community has, or a neighborhood has gotten used to, particularly one that's um, felt impacted uh, and find their uh, services beneficial. So it, it's a step in the right direction and an incremental step that I think um, as government sometimes, that's how we, that's how we work. And so hopefully we can um, maybe move forward and then uh, go from there. Okay, Councilmember Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Glover. I, I think it's important to clarify a little bit, I think about some of the some of the um, feedback I got from, from neighborhoods, which is um, it's it's not, a lot of it is, is also dealing with some of the drug dealing and some other issues that have been identified in that neighborhood in particular. <coughs> It's um, working to make sure that um, uh, businesses and you know are able to you know maintain uh, their properties. Uh, it, it this is not. I, I don't think that we're fund. We're, we're not funding uh, treatment and for um, we're not we're not choosing treatment to uh, for first. Uh, we're not choosing first alarm over treatment. We're choosing first alarm because this neighborhood has um, well-documented um, a variety of issues and they also have worked really hard as neighbors and as individuals to um, bring um, a lot of stability to the neighborhood and they're seeking a way to continue working together with First Alarm in that way. So I'm not sure that comparing the two is, um, is super beneficial in terms of, of recognizing that this is a you know kind of a neighborhood sustainability issue, um, and uh, so I'm going to support the motion after speaking to a lot of the neighbors over there, and um, so I'll support the motion. Your Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Matt. I just wanted to, and then Councilmember. Just in the in the interest of time, I'll just echo the. I just want to echo the same sentiments expressed by um, Councilmember Myers that I think that 
there's been, you know, when we're thinking about an entire neighborhood, um, a lot of folks have come out and expressed that this has been very helpful for them around a lot of issues with theft and um, and drug dealing in the neighborhoods. And I don't want to, and similarly, I think that um, the questions around drug prevention and what we can do about that in a way that's really meaningful, um, I think we should continue those conversations, which will include meeting with management of Janus and also having further discussions with Janus workers and then seeing how we can collaborate. So I'll also be supporting this motion. Councilmember Matthews, did you have additional comments? No. Okay, done. Okay, Councilmember Glover, <laughs> did you have additional comments or should I go ahead and uh, Yeah, just a couple things that were mentioned. Um, so one was that it's a service for the neighborhood and that we've dram dramatically cut the contract. Totally agree. It used to be two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now it's fifty thousand uh, dollars. That's definitely a shift. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that I don't not think that that kind of. I don't not think that that kind of um, feelings of safety for the community are irrelevant. Uh, I had, like I said, I had a good conversation with Mr. Glynn and he expressed just how important it is to have Frank as a part. I'm just looking at this number up here with the 79,000 that is um, in the not extra but their category, uh, which is why I'm just distraught, and this is what I said before, I'm distraught that we're willing to spend this on this but not on drug issues. and. What was also mentioned was that these neighborhoods are dealing with issues of drug dealing, which I think is interesting, that we don't want to support services that will help people not use drugs, but we want to pay for police representatives to enforce people's sale and or use of drugs. So it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and it's not that I don't appreciate a feeling of safety. It's not that I don't appreciate the work that Frank or the impact that it has on the communities. And if it's possible, with that extra, you know, we have that money, let's do this funding for this, but also give some money to uh, address issues of substance use disorder. I don't, I, I don't see why it's uh, either or, but um, if no one, uh, none of my colleagues are willing to uh, work with that and uh, adding stuff, then again, I just won't support the motion, but I just want to express that I really hope that this body, whether it be in the, the strategic planning session or over summer, take a deep look within ourselves and ask ourselves, what kind of policies are we wanting to pass? What kind of message do we want to send to the community? And is this it? Because I just don't agree with it, but that's just me. Okay, Councilman Brown. I just want to make the comment. Yeah, um, I seconded the motion, so I will be supporting it. Um, I absolutely understand the uh, and and agree largely with the comments that Councilmember Glover makes. I mean, I I also hope for a day when we can um, really think more strategically and big picture about how our funding priorities. If we were talking uh, in the case of Janus, if we were talking about a fifty thousand dollar grant for Janus, and um, we were talking about actually. Um, providing them with a significant level of support that could actually expand their services and or provide wage, actual wage increases for a group of, you know, a classificate, job classification or something, then I'd be all for it. That's why I'm saying I think that we ought to have that conversation and I'm very much willing to have the conversation about what more we can do for Janice in the future. Um, so it's not an indication of not wanting to support them. This is just something that you know, I put forward as a gesture, as a symbolic gesture, it wasn't a request from Janice, it wasn't a request from the workers, it was something that I um, thought might be a way to provide that, like you said, symbolic, or like I've said, symbolic support. So that being said, I do want to talk about supporting Janice in the future in larger ways, in, in broader ways, and, and support it, and having a longer term, bigger conversation about substance use disorder in our community. So I don't disagree with anything, um, Council Member Glover, that you've said. I just think we need to do that, not when we're finalizing the budget at 10 o'clock at night, I guess. Okay. I agree, and I appreciate your comments, Council Member Brown, as well as your points raised, Council Member Glover. And I will take advantage of my hand up previously. Okay. The, the place for that discussion to have is when we are talking, and particularly with the county as it relates to health and, and human services, is what what is the big picture of needs, and they are enormous in the county. Who are the providers? 
what are the resources, where can we make a meaningful contribution, what specifically are we getting for that contribution, and we do that collaboratively with the county and with our nonprofit and other funding partners. Okay. You're here. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Myers, and myself voting in support. The motion was made by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Okay. Okay. Um, I would be remiss as a finance director to not remind, in the staff report, we identified four other very likely cost increases coming to this council. We have Harvey West that has a net increase of about $400,000 that is not funded yet. We always have a couple of capital projects failures or needs that come up because we're not funding our capital improvement program. Those are generally 500,000 and upwards. Um, we would likely, we're are trending to higher increased legal services. There's more demand for legal analysis. And finally, we have a likelihood of a poconet environmental cleanup. Some big costs that we know are coming. We just don't know when and what amount, but they're gonna be next year. So you know, that could be a million, million five of new stuff we have to figure out. So that's just my caution of, um, I appreciate your comments about we got to do anything with the bigger picture in mind. Okay. Thank you for that bleak picture. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll... <Any> attraction? <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> and I d just want to re reflect that there were some other comments that came up um, during the afternoon that I just want to flag. Uh, maybe the appropriate, what's appropriate to do is come back when there's more capacity. It's probably been a long night, but it's been hot. We might not have been sleeping so well the last couple nights. Um, but I do want to flag some items that were clearly in the need of coming up um, now or to come back to council with some more information. We have vehicle purchases, and I think Justin, you talked about some ideas there. Um, Chris, you had some, uh, you wanted to put a restriction on CPVAW or, or gener generically. Sorry, I'm just picking who to talk first. I'm not saying that's your only your item. And then we had some capital pro project uh, discussions that looked like there was some interest in delving deeper into those projects. Um, just because we're adopting on June 11th doesn't mean we can't come back to these on June 25th or even postpone some of these items for budget action until, say, August, our first August meeting. So I, I, there is some room um, to deal with some of these now or, or to come back on June 25th or the first meeting in August. I think June 25th is likely to be really full, so I'm not quite sure how to, to build that into the agenda, but if, if the will of the council is to do that, then at the cost of something else. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just simply state that I think some of these items are really big discussion items that I don't feel comfortable taking action on it at this time personally. Um, I don't fully understand what the, without having kind of understanding the context of the 20,000 uh, 20, uh, constraints on, although of course prioritize it, but I just don't, I haven't, I don't have the context there, so I don't feel comfortable making a decision. So I'll just sort of set the stage with that. I'm okay with not necessarily addressing these at this time. Um, I didn't have a chance to hear from Vice Mayor Cummings in terms of the vehicle purchase. Um, and I have my glasses on, but I think it's a staff consideration. Anyhow, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and go to Vice Mayor Cummings, Council Member Brown. Um, so looking at the new vehicles that are supposed to be purchased, I guess this can be information that might be able to come back with potential um, action taken at a later point in time. But looking at the cost of operation, um, there's some vehicles that obviously um, in terms of maintenance are pretty much at the point where they need to be replaced. And there's some where the maintenance costs are below $13,000 um, or $14,000. And so one of the questions I had for staff was, for those vehicles that are below fourteen thousand dollars, whether or not they could they could be used for another year, and um, just looking at the caught the the savings on that, it would be around if we um, held off one more year on all vehicles whose cost of operations were below fourteen thousand dollars, we would have a savings of three hundred eight thousand five hundred dollars. So just thinking about whether or not that might be an, an area of savings. And additionally, um, one of the things I was interested in and have been in correspondence with some of the folks in PD is ensuring that the police patrol vehicles are the new 2020, I think they're either hybrid or fully electric um, Ford Explorers that are um, hybrid. hybrid, yeah. They'd have to be. So you can't run out um, of just making sure that we're going to be focusing on purchasing <laughs> those vehicles as opposed to fully, um, you know, gas combustion engines. Yeah, we, we can look at that. We'll look at the information and bring it back to you. 
Councilmember uh, Brown, and then Councilmember. I'm sorry, did I? Yeah. That, um, so I um, absolutely support uh, the direction that um, Councilmember Cummings just raised uh, in terms of waiting on uh, some vehicle purchases and um, looking at the hybrids for. And I, I believe that as the PD said that they yes, they saw they literally they saw the um, the announcement about it or the advertisement yes. an hour after that we they had told us that they didn't exist. So technologies are just moving so fast that I think it would be great if there are some that we can delay and see what happens um, and then do our best with yeah. what the police department. Yeah, so looking the police at. vehicles, yes. Yeah, so they'll acquire the hybrids and then with respect to that list, we'll go through through it as well. Because uh, the other thing, are those all general fund vehicles? Uh, uh, is it? We, we, but we, you don't have to do it now. This well, is the list provided by Public Works. It's all the vehicles that were proposed for um, recommendation. So some of them could be, no, could, be, could be enterprise funds, and so the savings. Yeah. So we we'll just have to go through it. So we'll be happy to go through it and with you and then bring it back. Okay. Councilmember Myers. And then I Council just have a question regarding the um, <laughs> what's listed here is the downtown mixed-use project. So I think it's probably more accurately called the library project. It says unfund fiscal year 2020 all allocation and time until item returns. Is that, whose note is that? Well, that was I, I was just suggesting since I believe there's no immediate action to do anything with that project and it's got to come back to council. I believe uh, that there's there was some funding in there and I know our subcommittee actually is going to be doing some work on, um, I believe getting some uh, renovation costs on the existing library. So I don't know that we want to take all the money out of there because I think there will be some allocations. Yeah, I think I think right. I think it's an item for the subcommittee to to, to yeah. look at. Right, because right. we have that mini one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So I think we've said all we can on this, and so yeah, thank you very we're much. We're officially adopted. We're, we're officially balanced. Adopted. Okay. We're you, set you, for next year. Do we need a motion? We, I think we've motion by motion did well, motion by motion. Yep. Let's see. Okay. I would like to thank our finance director and department for their meticulous work and patience. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And extend our thanks right. to, to Tracy. I'd say just for clarity purposes, if we can just have a motion approving the resolution that's in the staff report, um, that way we just have clear. Because that's all that'll encompass all the actions that we did tonight. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, right. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Um, if you want to restate the motion for our clerk. It's just a motion approving the resolution as submitted in the staff report. Okay, great, okay. Thank you very much. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. One final agenda item, that is the uh, council uh, calendar. Um, city clerk, any updates there? I have nothing. Okay, okay, great. There we go. Powerful feeling to move. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we have so little control over most of it. Exactly. All right. That, so that will adjourn our meeting this evening. And um, thank you for the remaining community members here. And um, yeah. have a good night.